Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, this is the 27th meeting of the Strategic Priorities and Policy Committee. Uh, we're going to start with the land acknowledgement. The City of London is situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenape Pewak, and Attawandron. We honor and respect the history, languages, and culture of the diverse Indigenous people who call this territory home. The City of London is currently home to many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit today. As representatives of the people of the City of London, we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work in this territory. Further, uh, I wanted to say that the City of London is committed to making every effort to provide alternate formats and communication supports for meetings upon request. To make a request specific to this meeting, please contact SPPC at London.ca or 519-661-2489, extension 2425. I will start with uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest. Okay, seeing none, um, consent items, there are uh, nine of them. Um, I assume that some colleagues will want some of these uh, dealt with separately. And uh, a couple of them have been withdrawn uh, for, uh, uh, for discussion at uh, a subsequent meeting, although the delegations for those organizations will still happen today. Gives you a chance to hear from them before we deal with the, the different granting agreements related to them. Um, so I'll look to see uh, who would like uh, what items dealt with separately on the consent agenda, recognizing that when you pull them, they do go to the end of the items for direction. So if you have a, an adjustment or a motion or substantive questions, I would suggest you might want to pull it. Councillor Ferreira, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to have item for the consent 2.4 pulled, and uh, that would be it for the consent uh, for me. Yep, go ahead. Thank you, I have an amendment for 2.2. Others, oh, Councillor Stevenson. I'd like to pull 2.3, please. Anything else? I, I will just note too, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, it will be a little bit delayed arriving here today. So if you're going to ask questions on any of the items related to his, I would suggest maybe we pull them and put them later. If you don't have questions, that's fine. Go ahead. Thank you. 2.1. So all that's left is 2.8 and 2.9. I will say 2.8 is one that Mr. Mathers would make comments on. So if you've got comments on that, we should deal with it separately. If, no, if nobody does, then that's fine. We can proceed with just those two items. No? Okay. So it looks like we can uh, look for a motion to uh, deal with 2.8 and 2.9. Um, we could do those together as consent. Councillor Cuddy is willing to move, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. Uh, I'll just ask if there's any discussion on either of those items. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna open those two items for voting. Councillor Pelosi. Closing the vote motion carries 15 to 0. 
Okay, so those items will be dealt with at the end of items for direction. Uh, that moves us to scheduled items. The, the, the first scheduled item we have is 3.1, which is um, the public participation meeting on the consolidated uh, fees and charges bylaw. Um, colleagues have that uh, before them. So uh, given this is a public participation meeting, we'd first look to open uh, the PPM, uh, moved by Councilor Rahman, seconded by Councilor Stevenson. Uh, we will open that for voting momentarily. Councilor Ploza votes. Councillor Trossow, Councillor Van Meerbergen. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, so I'm looking to any members of the public who are looking to speak on the uh, 2024 to 2027 consolidated fees and charges bylaw. Going once, going twice. Last chance to speak, either online or in the gallery. Okay, I'm gonna say there's no public speakers to the uh, fees and charges bylaw, so look for a motion to close the public participation meeting. Councillor, our Deputy Mayor Lewis, seconded by Councillor Cuddy. We'll open the closure of the PPM momentarily. Councillor Peloza votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, I'll look to colleagues. Someone might want to put the recommendation in the report on the floor and then we can have any debate. You're willing to put it on the floor, Councillor? Oh, I have a question. Okay, then let me see. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis will put it on the floor, uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Ferreira. Uh, Councillor Trosau, you're up first, and then I'll go to Councillor Stevenson next. I, I wanted to ask if this would be an appropriate time to make suggestions about how to bet, better um, alert the public about uh, some of these items in terms of putting additional things on the portal. Because if it is, I'd like to make a, I'd like to make a, a small friendly amendment to, to um, add some things to the portal. I might need to just clarify exactly what, what, what you're asking to do to the portal I would, uh, online or yeah, like yes, to get I, involved or, yeah. I would like the information about residential um, rent, rental applications and information to be more visible to the public in terms of where it goes. I would leave that to uh, the, portal, the, port, the portal staff. I would also like to see the same thing for the um, for the for the residential Airbnb um, license program, which which does not currently have a, a online component at all, Councillor, I think I, I think I understand what you're saying. So I think what we have before us is the approval of uh, of the fees and charges. Um, if you want to talk about how we display those in different forums, I think that would be something that we could bring forward at a subsequent meeting. I'm just kind of, I'm looking to staff because I. Although I see that you're linking them because we're talking about the fees and charges, the report before us really isn't about how they are displayed and where, but I can ask the clerk which is the relevant, um, which is the relevant uh, committee to bring that forward for consideration because I think I understand that you're looking for uh, some information that in here to be displayed in different ways and publicly available in slightly different ways. So let me find out that information. I'll tell you where you can go. Councillor, so just chatting with the clerk, I think the best course of action is if maybe you want to, um, after the meeting or over the next couple of days, consult with the clerk, identify exactly what you're going for, given the different fees and charges are related to all sorts of parts of the corporation. We can get a sense of where you're going, help you direct you to the committee and, and what the letter might look like. Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you. M my pleasure. I have Councillor Stevenson and then Councillor Frank, I see your hand up, I'll add you to the list. 
Thank you. I think uh, I was dealing with the same thing that Councillor Trust I was dealing with was a letter from a constituent who wrote in and it's attached to this agenda. I was just wondering if staff could comment on their suggestion that we move the residential rental license renewal process to the citizens portal, just like our building license approval process and automate the simple process. If staff had a response, that would be great. Mr. Katolik. Yes, uh, through the chair. We do have a uh, active um, uh, IT uh, project specific to that. We also have uh, active projects uh, specific to short-term rentals and other projects that are focused on uh, better customer service and applications and renewals. And I'd like to uh, uh, refer that to Mr. Paritas if he has any further comments on the corporate approach of approving IT projects. Mr. Parity. Uh, through the chair, yes. So anytime we get uh, projects, new projects uh, coming through, they typically have to go through our technology investment strategy, and that group uh, prioritizes all the new projects that are coming through, and then uh, it goes out uh, for information. And Mr. Parody, I'll just, next time, if you could just tilt your microphone down a little bit, it points at you, we'll just pick up your voice a little better. Go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, that's great. Seeing as it's an active project right now, if I understood you correctly, do you any estimate on to when uh, we would expect to see that or who I could follow up with uh, to have an update on that project? Uh, through the chair, I, I don't have an answer tonight because there are uh, numerous, numerous projects uh, it, as part of the uh, technology investment uh, program. Uh, but we do have active projects and they're focused very much on our portal. So you can make applications online, pay online. Uh, we have numerous uh, business licenses, residential licenses that you still have to come in and, and pay in person. So we, we have those improvements in place, but it all depends on corporate priorities. Thank you. So if I understand, there's no need to bring anything through another committee regarding this. And uh, would you be the one that I would follow up with to check in to see where we're at on this particular one that's been requested by the resident? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. This is an operational matter that we are very much aware of as an improvement. Okay. Good. Okay. Councilor Frank. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, so I've been chatting a bit with some staff. Um, there's a section about the bike lockers. Um, and right now there's two hours that are uh, available for free. Um, and the concept in this uh, report was to shift to one hour free. Um, and I was hoping to make a motion to keep it at two hours free, um, understanding that the lost revenue is about $1,000. Um, but I think that the value for having two hours free secure bike parking downtown um, is probably more than uh, $1,000. But I'm not totally sure, and I didn't have enough time, unfortunately, to chat with the clerks because I don't know if that would be really difficult uh, given that there's a bylaw associated with this. But um, I was hoping to make a motion to keep two hours free bike parking in this fee schedule. Just give me one sec, Councillor Frank. Um, it's certainly that is something that we would do at committee because the direction is bring the bylaw forward to council. And so this would be the place to make the change, even if it is a little bit complex, um, because uh, uh, this is essentially the process by which we recommend the fees and charges bylaw to council for final approval. So just let me, um, just let me get a, a little bit more information for you and, I'll, and I'll, I'll get back to you. Councillor, we're just wording the motion um, for you. It, so you want it to remain at the two hour mark for free and not go to one hour is what you're saying. Correct. Unless staff have a better suggested language. I think 
I think we're okay on that, but I'll- Staff I, I, have no concerns, thank you. That, yes, so we don't have to get this perfect now because we're gonna get the motion so everybody knows what we're doing, and then uh, the magic of the clerks will make that just perfect by the time the bylaw gets to council. So this is the way it's worded. I'm just gonna see if this makes sense for staff and then the council if you're okay with it. Uh, motion to amend the fees and charges bylaw to allow for two, uh, the proposed, I think it's just a proposed fees and charges bylaw, to allow for two hour free bike locker parking. Yes, I see nods from staff. That's good for you, Councillor Frank? Yeah. Okay, I'll look for a seconder for that. Councillor Trosau. Okay, so we'll have debate on Councillor Frank's motion now. Any debate or discussion? Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just can't help but ask the question since uh, I think it's only fair to um, have a better understanding why they, they were reduced from one hour to, to uh, from two hours to one other than just as a cost saving and just a little bit more content to it through you. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. As this program is discussed with previous councils and being established, the intent was for us to try to recoup as much cost as we possibly could, knowing that most of it would not be recouped through user fees. So part of it was that direction. The other part was to attempt to encourage turnover so more people could try that hour for free. But what we're actually seeing is most folks who choose to use it are then paying to extend after the free period is done. Staff have no concerns with extending the two hour free limit through 2024, we can review as the program is reviewed in the future. Okay, I don't see any other speakers, so we're gonna open uh, Councillor Frank's amendment for voting. Councillor Ploza votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, I need a mover and a seconder for the as amended motion, or as amended fees and charges by uh, Councillor Ferrer, seconded by Councillor Cuddy. Any further discussion on the fees and charges by law? Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, just a quick um, a comment and uh, maybe a, a, a question to you. First of all, thanks to staff, it was a big, heavy report. And I didn't go through every fee, so just to let you know, but I do appreciate the work that went into it. And, and just glancing through it, I did um, recognize we we're looking at 420 fees. We've um, discontinued a few, we've added a, a few, and we're mainly increasing most of them. My question through you is to staff, uh, maintaining that 5% uh, that, we, um, that represents the user fees for operating revenue as we go into the multi-year budget. I know that was 2022. Is it fair to say that we're maintaining that 5% operating revenue for um, just going forward? I, I'm not exactly sure um, if it's taking into account the new increases, I guess. Go ahead. Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, I'm trying, I'm going off the top of my head. I don't believe it has materially changed from that number. Um, we're just working through the documents now. So I know I recently looked at it. I just can't recall, but I don't believe it's yeah. a material change from the 5% as a total. Just wanted to um, confirm that. Thank you. Okay. It's uh, moved and seconded. I don't have anybody else on the speakers list. So that's, this is the as amended um, fees and charges. Uh, bylaw, which will go to council, as it says in the report, with uh, the one change that we've made. So I'll open that for voting. Yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, next we have um, a public participation meeting on water and wastewater rates. I'll look for a mover to open the PPM for that. Moved by Councillor Lehman, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. 
uh, we will uh, we'll vote on that uh, momentarily. Councillor Pelosa votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, public participation meeting uh, on uh, water and wastewater rates. I'll look to members of the public who would like to comment on the proposed water and wastewater rates. Anybody online? Okay. There's no one online, so it's just people in the room. Second chance. Okay, I'll look for a motion to close the public participation meeting. Councillor Cuddy, seconded by Councillor Ferreira. That'll open for voting in a moment. Councillor Pelosa votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, I'll look for a mover for the recommendation in the Report, uh, Councillor Layman is willing to move, seconded by Councillor Rahman. Okay, discussion on the water and wastewater rates. Okay, all right, so seeing none, we're gonna open that for voting. Councillor Pelosa votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, now we're on to uh, our delegations um, from uh, a few organizations uh, who are here to uh, share updates with us. Uh, the first that we'll deal with is um, item 3.3, which is a delegation from Tech Alliance, their annual update on their activities. Uh, we'll just get the presentation uh, pulled up and I'll invite uh, Christina Fox to come up and, uh, and present um, to us uh, now. Okay, we've got that up now, um, so uh, we'll let you uh, let you take it away. And uh, I think you've done this before, but just a reminder that uh, we turn on the microphone, and uh, you got to turn it off for anybody else to be able to speak. But you get the you get it for the whole time during your presentation. But when we have question and answer, you'll just have to remember to turn it on and off. So, go ahead. Thank you, and I can be heard. Good. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. At Tech Lines, we've earned a reputation for providing deep value to industry leaders who are driving economic growth and propelling ambitious entrepreneurs and tech talent. Today, we're looking back on the incredible results of our last fiscal year, which ended on March 31st, 2023. Feels like a long time ago. We'll just get you set. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so TechLines empowers world-class ventures and fuels growth in Canada's innovation economy. We champion and coach entrepreneurs, amplify and impact businesses, while fostering an equitable and vibrant technology community of innovators. As the lead voice for 
London's innovation economy and as the centralized resource for London's innovation economy, TechLiance radically eliminates obstacles and increases speed to success for the most promising startups and the highest potential scale-ups generating prosperity right now. The Greater London area has what it takes to be among Canada's top ecosystems. It is a population that's educated, diverse, technical, has ease of mobility to other parts of the country, the US and the globe, and has investable wealth. Here you'll see our three strategic priorities. They're guided by our, our evolution for the past three years and they will direct us towards the next moonshot. Our city boasts high tech employment rate with over 16,100 jobs um, in the technical industry last year. Reported by Techna, Canada welcomed record numbers of tech talent migration to this region, and London was named number eight for largest in migration by city. London was named twice consecutively on CBRE's top 10 emerging tech markets in North America, up from 10 last year to the spot number eight this year. This is not by accident. Built by founders, Tech Alliance is the place for dreamers, innovators, and world-changing ideas, and forging strong connections with city council and city staff. Our board of directors, comprised of passionate industry leaders, alongside an accomplished team, are joining us in the gallery and on YouTube. Go ahead and give a wave, gang. <laughs> for the first time, um, for many of you, I'm presenting to a number of new members of council, and I want to thank you for your curiosity and deep appreciation for London's competitive innovation economy, and for your funding as we continue to build momentum as a vital resource in London. I've been with Tech Alliance for four years, and we've worked side by side with you to strengthen our economy, executing against the city's strategic plan, and partnering on minister visits and advocacy opportunities. The next few slides are glimpses into our active community collaboration, engaging over 5,000 innovators, industry leaders, and entrepreneurs. In the spirit of prioritizing diversity and equity, there are glass ceilings still to shatter for women in tech. So in person, we called more than 125 women and allies to action on International Women's Day. Amplifying London and celebrating groundbreaking innovation, we hosted our third annual Limitless. A slate of incredible award recipients were awarded that evening. On our list of winners, went on to receive investment from Dragon's Den, landed on the Global Mail's top growing companies in Canada, and closed a $2 million seed round. Activating funding and co-creating uh, for ventures led by Equity Denied Founders, Tech Alliance flowed $600,000 in cash to ventures focused on the green economy, resulting in 127 FTE, 23 million in combined revenue, and almost 2 million combined capital raised. Our organization focuses on stimulating strong economic returns, and we've launched genius economic stimulators within the city, like the London Innovation Challenge, to accelerate companies, tech talent, and industry leaders. This past fiscal, with industry forefront runners, we awarded $40,000 each to two companies who bolstered London's creative industries. With Western, we delivered liberal arts and STEM-related work integrated learning placements that impacted local technology industry leaders, and we collaborated with, Fat, with Fanshawe on about a half a dozen different opportunities with their students, alumni, and startups. Fostering an entrepreneurial culture and natural industry collisions, we had almost 9,000 advisory hours delivered, and that's up from 2,700 hours uh, when I first joined the organization. That demonstrates the value of our mandate as the place for entrepreneurs. Across 45 different events, more than 5,000 bums and seats, all in all, we bring people together, we facilitate connections, we deliver education, and we publish and amplify compelling stories right here in London. In putting business first, we saw an excess of $106 million in capital raised by technology companies in the Forest City. In fact, capital raised by innovative ventures has increased almost 5,000% over the last four years. This is one of our competitive advantages. We saw a 10% increase in the number of new startups, exits, mergers, or acquisitions in the tech sector, and we saw a 79% increase over the last three years. In fact, we had a 30% increase, or we had 30% 30, 30 more new startups than Communitech. In collaboration with other folks in the, in the ecosystem, you can see that collaboration truly is in our DNA, and we upped that number to 166 last year. We've made good on our brand promise, and we've made remarkable connections to policymakers at all ranks of government who keep placing bets on made in London unicorns. Prioritizing and widening pathways to critical resources, including talent, we had strong student and professional newcomer interactions and made significant ecosystem referrals. For jobs created, posted, and promoted, we saw 2,600, with 143 unique employers posting on our job board. 
We cultivate and foster a thriving technology community of founders and their teams, industry leaders, capacity builders, ecosystem partners, investors, and tech talent. We are committed to a regional culture anchored in diversity and equity. And in closing, bright minds with big ideas come together physically at Tech Lions headquarters with an unmatched spirit for global challenge, problem solving, and putting London on the map. This indeed is where innovation thrives. Thank you. Okay, I'll look for questions that colleagues might have. Go ahead, Councilor Lehman. Thank you, Ms. Fox, for uh, your presentation today. I just want to ask a couple of questions uh, just to get a gauge of how the tech industry is doing in London right now. Um, approximately how many jobs would you identify that are within that tech industry within London? And how does that compare uh, from last year and five years? Where's the trend going? Thank you. Through the chair. Uh, we reported 16,100 jobs, uh, tech jobs in London. That's up, I'm guesstimating and going on memory from about 13,100 two or three years ago. Um, that indicator of the 16,100 jobs is actually one of the reasons why London landed on the top 10 emerging tech markets in North America. Yeah, so incredible. Thank you. So have you, uh, We've always had an envious eye of Waterloo, obviously, right? And, the, and their uh, tech hub. And what I've always seen as an obstacle is reading, reaching a critical mass because we want to attract tech workers to this region, but they're afraid if they leave Toronto or Waterloo, they'll get out of the loop. Would you have, would you, in your opinion, have we reached the critical threshold right now that we are big enough with this industry within London right now that that concern of prospective um, employees um, might not be as severe as it was a, a few years ago? Or, or is this being a sought out place now that we have so many interesting um, tech companies uh, doing great things? Thank you, through the chair. I would say that, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago that was certainly a concern, or even five years ago that might have been a concern. What we do know in healthy ecosystems around the world, that it does require a couple of anchor firms to draw talent in. And what they need to know is if that place of employment doesn't work out for them, can they bounce to another place in that city? So it's a very good point to make of would people leave Toronto, Waterloo, Silicon Valley, or other places in the world? And I do believe that, um, that, that that's behind us, that we are seeing the critical mass of, of tech talent migrating to this region, and that was reported in Techna, showing it was major um, in-city migration to Canada from the US, and in particular to London, landing at number eight on that list as well. Um, and I think it's one of these things that we certainly should be proud of. One of the things that I, I observed in the last fiscal was um, having a number of London area companies named to um, a true north list, which really is companies that are in excess of 100 million ARR or growing at such a rate that they'll get to that. Um, and it was really easy for us to look at in London companies who should be on that list and superseded the same kind of performance in cities like Saskatoon, Edmonton, Calgary, where it's really their push for technology and innovation has been well invested in and you can see the growth. London is also there. I think we've just been really modest over the last many years about the kind of growth that we've had there. And I'm very confident about the future. Great, because it's important that that message gets out because it, it's a virtuous cycle, right? It attracts uh, people looking to work here and it attracts capital, quite, quite frankly. And I see here 106 million was raised in, in capital. Um, and did I hear you correctly? How did that compare with the previous year? I, I wasn't too sure if I heard that number uh, correctly. Through the chair, thank you. We um, reported a 5,000% increase in capital raised. Um, and that is, we had a 
London area had a really incredible year the fiscal before um, with significant funds raised by a few large companies. And so when we look at the collection over four years, it is a pretty significant amount since we began measuring to what we're seeing now. I mean, when we see the kind of investment that's happening in early stage, and there's that kind of give first mentality, if you receive investment, then you're likely to, when you have an exit or a liquidity event, to reinvest in companies, and we're seeing a lot more of that activity in London. Thank you. And um, yeah, that, that's terrific news, because that's not present, that's future. And those, that, those investments are gonna lead to further job growth, growth in this industry which is terrific news, so thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, other speakers I have, Councillor Stevenson and then uh, Councillor McAllister. Thank you for being here to share with us. Um, my question is, can you just give me a little history on how long the organization's been in existence and if you see uh, that there's been a shift as the city evolves and becomes a bigger player in this space, if you see a, a shift either that's just happened or that's going to happen in the near future? Thank you, through the chair. That's a really great question. The organization has existed for uh, more than 20 years and started in its early days, a bit more like a chamber, if you will, um, bringing together technology, and at, at that time we would say high tech um, technology together and really uh, convening people who were building an ecosystem. Uh, over the course of uh, time, it, the uh, Tech Alliance has attracted other funding sources, including through the Ministry of Economic Job Development and uh, Job Creation and Trade, I'm sorry. Um, and through that investment, about uh, 13 years ago, we became what, what's called a regional innovation center. So there's 17 of us in Ontario. And we don't normally, as a team, lead with that we're a regional innovation center because we are an, an awful lot more than just that funding source, but they do provide stable funding to the organization. And I would say, just in my time over the last four years, we have had a pretty massive evolution. Uh, you know, I came into the, the role about four years ago, and a pandemic started uh, about six months into my, my tenure, and at that point we were at a, a, a a period in time where we were really changing the composition of the team, what we delivered in community, the composition of our board, um, even our location. We're now located across the street uh, from City Hall and we are originally on the campus at Western. And so getting really serious about who our customer is, if you will, founders, tech talent, industry leaders, um, it was really easy to sunset things that were no longer serving those folks and get really serious about the things that were gonna propel London to the next um, you know, high ecosystem in Canada. I do think we're on the way, and of course I, I need to be saying that, but I do have that feeling that we're on that way and the numbers actually show that. So when we think about the way we show up in community and how we work one-to-one -one with companies and how many companies we work with and the value that we bring, I think it's just very different than it might have been even five or six years ago and particularly in the last three years as we've changed the way that we, we uh, go to market and in particular how we collaborate with others. You know, there was a time, I'm gonna really go on memory here, but I remember reporting at one point that we were working with about 71 collaborators and then it was 92 collaborators and this year 166. We're able to do that because we are careful about stewarding those kinds of relationships. And while we are headquartered in London, we do serve communities in five counties in total with a great majority of our work done here in London, which is why we're quite proud of the, um, the outcomes that we're seeing for London in the tech, the tech ecosystem. I hope that answered the question. Okay, thank you. Councillor McAllister. Uh, thank you, through the chair, and thank you for the presentation today. I appreciate this. Um, I'm wondering if you can provide some um, more insight in terms of the employees um, with these uh, tech firms. What are you finding in terms of what's attracting them to London, what maybe is still detracting them? Uh, just from an attractability point of view for your sector, um, what can we do as a city to be um, more accommodating uh, to attract new employees? Thank you. Thank you, through the chair. That's a really good question. I think that part of the reason why London is attractive and why companies in London are attractive is because we cover a multitude of different sectors. I think I reported in um, our PowerPoint that there's 30 different sectors that we support. If you can think of any kind of technology other than forestry and mining, we're pretty much touching them with um, early stage companies through to enterprise and unicorn companies. I think that's part of it, is there is a great variety and no, no specific specialization in London because there are so many 
um, strong sectors. Med tech, ag tech, food and beverage, advanced manufacturing, certainly EV is on, on the horizon, but I think that variety is helpful in attracting talent. I do think that when we, when we look at the types of companies who have grown here and how big they've gotten, those companies, particularly in gaming, um, have been a really strong attractor for talent to the community or a retainer for students who are coming out of Fanshawe and, Univ and uh, Western University. Those, I think, are some of the reasons why we're seeing a different um, attraction of talent. Another thing that I think is really important to highlight is our organization works regularly with newcomer professionals in trying to do matchmaking with companies in London. So when we think of the diverse opportunities and the interest in companies and really having full sum and equitable um, organizations, I think that's also a very um, significant attractor uh, for new Londoners and uh, Londoners who have gone away and come back. The other thing I would say just in technology across the board, it's fairly ubiquitous to see people that are more nomadic in nature or working in hybrid capacities. And I think there are still a lot of London companies that offer um, the benefit of remote work even when we see lots of companies who thrive when they've got their people um, together in the office. So it's a number of different factors, but I would say a lot of those combined make it a really attractive place to be. Um, thank you, through the chair, um, appreciate your answer. Um, and you actually, on the last bit, just touched on the, my follow-up that I wanted to ask in terms of um, how you're counting the numbers, because we have seen that trend towards more remote work are you finding you know, companies that have established themselves in London, are people farther afield? Do you see more remote work? Um, are they directly based in London or are you seeing a lot of um, surrounding areas and people just um, doing their work from remote locations? Thank you. Thank you, through the chair. Um, specifically to companies we work with, uh, there are a lot of companies that might have been in London and started here and have become nomadic, have either you know, move to Toronto or Calgary, or Vancouver, or have some base um, here in London or some connection to London, either through Western's Accelerator or Fanshawe's um, Incubator. There are a number of different um, um, connections to London that make a, make a company a London company. With regards to staff within um, companies, it, it really is, it varies. I mean, there are some companies that have staff in five days a week. They want to be in five days a week. I think there are a lot of companies that have staff in three or four days a week. Some, we have some companies that are in, thriving incredibly that have completely remote first opportunities but still have a headquarter in London. Uh, it really is different. I, I, I feel like I've been saying sort of the same thing over the last couple of years and I think in a couple of years from now I'll probably be saying the same thing. Whatever's working for the company and whatever works for them to be able to retain and attract talent, they'll continue to do that, whether that's a four-day work week, uh, whether or not that's um, you know, paid time off with unlimited. There are a lot of different perks that we see happening in the technology sector that are actually influencing other sectors outside of technology. Um, thank you, and through the chair, uh, once again. Um, the reason why I ask that is just, I know, <clears throat> obviously, with the tech sector, very nomadic, I get that. Um, I think from my point of view, and I'm not sure if my colleagues feel this, but I'm just trying to get more of a real sense for the economic impact, because obviously we have the tech um, companies based here, um, but in terms of where employees are located, you know, are they in our surrounding um, counties or farther afield? Um, and I, I don't know if you have that data, but I just find it interesting for a field that's traditionally nomadic to see what those tangible economic benefits are. Thank you. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, a great question, I would say, uh, when we think about the support that we provide in the counties, uh, certainly our, the bulk of service is to London-based companies. One of the other things maybe to add to um, what I shared earlier is we do see a lot of people who are actually living in, and, um, and operating their day job in London but are working for other companies. So for example, uh, the fellow that is leading Startup London, a volunteer organization, they work for Shopify, but they're located in London. So while they're earning a paycheck from another city in Canada, their spending is happening here. And I think that for that particular story, there's numerous other stories or folks who have the opportunity to be working for a company in the US but are based in London. I feel like I'm hearing more and more of that over the last couple of years than I ever heard in my first six months to a year when I was at Tech Lions. Yeah. Okay, any other speakers? Okay, this is just an update, so I'll need a motion to receive uh, the presentation. Uh, Councillor Cuddy, seconded by Councillor Rahman. Um, 
I think we've already had the discussion, so I'm going to open that for voting. Councillor Plows, the votes yes. Councillor Cuddy votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. And before you go, let me just say on behalf of Council, thank you for coming today and answering all of our questions for the presentation and of course for the work uh, you, your board and uh, your organization does. Um, we, we really appreciate it. Okay, next uh, we have the next delegation, item 3.4, which is um, the uh, the annual update from the Lennon Economic Development Corporation, um, Kapila Kotia. Uh, we'll have you uh, come up and present as soon as we get your presentation up on the screen, and uh, then we'll let you let you go at it. Just one sec. You're, you're, I think your microphone's not on, but you're projecting as if a microphone was on. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, people at home can't hear you, so um, we'll get you to take that. Sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, and I'm delighted to be here to share some uh, highlights of our work this year. As you know, LEDC contributes to the growth of our economy through new investment attraction, retention and growth of local companies, workforce development, and business engagement. And these functions are guided by detailed strategies, such as providing access to capital, talent, space, training, et cetera, and measured by key performance indicators. Our work focuses on developing industry clusters that generate the highest economic activity in the region. These clusters not only create direct jobs and investments, but also drive spin-off economic activity through supply chains, construction, retail, hospitality, and much more. We also have referral mechanisms in place, so companies outside of these core areas are also supported by other local agencies. So far this year, LEDC has facilitated close to $145 million in expansions and attractions. Companies making these investments have reported over 1,600 new jobs added to London's workforce. It's, an, it's also important to point out that these figures do not include the major regional investment with Volkswagen Power Co. in the St. Thomas EV battery plant. While LEDC played a key role in attracting Volkswagen to the region, we only report jobs and investments made in the city. The Invest portfolio seeks to attract new investments while Accelerate portfolio helps establish companies scale and grow. We do this by connecting companies to infrastructure, funding sources, regulatory and permitting processes, research and development, and assistance with talent recruitment and retention. This year we saw major growth in automation, advanced manufacturing and food processing areas. We also keep a pulse on companies that may be at risk of closure due to trade issues, lost contracts, or changes in their industry. Our pipeline of active attraction and expansion files was healthy as companies continue to invest in industrial lands, automation, upskilling, and diversification. Here are some examples of companies that we've worked with this year that are new to London or growing significantly throughout 2023. We're fortunate to have attracted some high-profile investments including WSIB, Andriani, Amazon, Volkswagen, to name a few. New jobs and investments in food processing, life sciences, and advanced manufacturing have helped us further diversify our economy and helped us withstand the economic slowdown and rising interest rates. Access to talent continues to be a major constraint as our region is projecting a need for 40,000 plus workers over the next few years. We continue to help employers with their hiring needs through major job fairs, newcomer attraction campaigns, and post-secondary partnerships. Last year, we integrated London Tech Jobs and London Manufacturing Job Portals with both Western University and Fanshawe College student career pages, so post-secondary students can see far more local job opportunities and have more effective engagement with London companies. This year, we launched London Health Jobs Portal to market opportunities in the fast-growing healthcare and life sciences sectors. In order to raise London's profile for both investment and talent attraction, we ran major marketing campaigns such as Don't Tell Toronto, and choose London, which has, resulted, sorry, which has resulted in thousands of new inquiries over the past few months. We also collaborated with local partners on initiatives such as Happy Hour, 
Forest City Landing Pad, The Grove at Western Fair, Founders Network, Foodpreneur, and more. And just in its third year, Film London has shown great success in attracting significant productions, including Apple TV, NBC, ABC, and more. Recognizable Hollywood stars such as Greg Kinnear, Luke Wilson, and Jay Baruchel have come to London for productions that have generated over a million dollars in local spending and created over 200 jobs. We've also held industry events such as screen creators conferences, training for background performers, emerging producers, and location providers. And with that, that's it for my formal presentation. And thanks again. Um, thank you for that. I think it's the first time I've been in a photo with Luke Wilson in a London Economic Development Corporation um, <laughs> presentation. So that's the first for me. Um, uh, appreciate the, uh, the presentation. We'll move to questions uh, from colleagues here. Go ahead, Councillor Hopkins. Just need, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being here and for the presentation. Uh, I, I, I can see that uh, our city has attracted a number of large industries and uh, thanks to LEDC for playing a vital role in making that happen. Going forward uh, as a city and um, keeping these industries going, what, what do you see uh, is important for us as a city to maintain, or how do you see that future and the need? What can we do as a city uh, to, to keep everyone happy? Thank you. Through the chair. So uh, one thing London has done really well over the last several years, uh, well over 10 years now, is the diversification in our economy. We're not a one-trick pony. So we've attracted companies within automotive, food processing, technology, life sciences, pharmaceuticals, and the list goes on and on. What that does is helps us withstand economic cycles. So when there's a slowdown in the automotive industry for whatever reason, as we saw in uh, 2009, 2010, uh, food processing was still uh, very active. Similarly, um, during the COVID years, food processing was quite active. We were able to attract new investments, have lots of local expansions and whatnot. So in order to continue that diversification play in our economy, we need to continue looking at building industrial assets through the city's industrial land development strategy, which has been quite successful. In addition to that, the investments that the city is already making in public transit, core area, and a lot of other uh, elements throughout the city will continue to help us attract more talent and investments. So I think the bottom line here is that diversification uh, of our economy to continue attracting knowledge-based jobs, innovation economy jobs, uh, and further fuel that uh, diversity. Go ahead, uh, go Councilor Pribble and then Councilor, Councilor Stevenson. Thank you. I have a question regarding uh, uh, LEDC's focus is on the four core industry sectors. Are you exploring to potentially add certain industries currently, or are you looking into in the near future? Thank you. Through the chair, so the, um, within those four industries, advanced manufacturing, for instance, can be broadened into automotive, defense, aviation, and building materials. So those are subsectors within that niche. So when you look at the total package, it ends up being broader than just four because they have subcomponents within that. So I would say those four have served us well in terms of the resources we have to deploy and the successes we've had out of it. Uh, every few years when we redo this strategic plan, we do keep an open mind to looking at other emerging areas, not just locally, but uh, throughout Canada. Uh, we see consultations with the province, the feds, in terms of what are they seeing in uh, economic uh, trends facing the entire province or the country. So we do evaluate that every uh, planning cycle, but uh, for the near foreseeable future, those four have been serving as well. I do have one more follow-up. As you are being successful attracting, honestly, worldwide businesses to London, if you were to come across during these events and abroad and you find an organization that potentially would not fit any of these clusters or wouldn't fit your portfolio, how would you, how would you still attract the business to London cooperating with other organizations so London as a city, we truly maximize our opportunity? 
Thank you, through the chair. Uh, so that happens fairly frequently, not just within the industry clusters, but geographically as well. So we have alliances and relationships set up throughout the region, such as Southern Ontario Marketing Alliance, uh, Woodstock, St. Thomas, uh, uh, this whole Southwestern Ontario region. We have a referral mechanism in place for geographical um, um, uh, prosperity throughout Southwestern Ontario. So that's on, uh, on areas that may not fit within the city. On sectors itself that are outside these four areas, we have, uh, for instance, tourism comes to mind. We have partnerships with other service providers as well that might be better suited to, ad uh, to address those opportunities. So we make sure we are putting London first and uh, within that Team London approach, we can find the right partner to deliver the best service. Thank you, no more questions. Okay, I have Councillor Stevenson and then Councillor Trosau. Thank you, my question is, um, what's the biggest challenge LEDC faces over the next four years and what are your plans to address that? Thank you. Through the chair, uh, hands down workforce. No matter which industry sector we look at and no matter what scale of company, small, medium, large, the number one constraint facing all businesses right now is access to talent, which is why through the slides you saw such heavy emphasis on attracting workforce. And workforce development is not a one-size-fits-all. There's no magic bullet that'll serve uh, all the different uh, needs of the uh, community and the region. So there are different prongs within workforce development. Attracting newcomers is one, retaining post-secondary students, attracting more students to our post-secondary uh, institutions, engaging high school students at an early stage. When my colleague just presented to the Catholic School Board guidance counselors just uh, this week on emerging opportunities so students can be steered accordingly. So across the board, there are so many different prongs on workforce development that we're trying to deploy to ensure that the talent pipeline continues to be stable. And just to follow up to that, is that has that always been a big focus of LEDC or is this a shift to uh, meet that current challenge? Through the chair, um, it has been an evolving portfolio. Uh, LEDC has been doing workforce development for well over 10 years. Um, since inception, it was added, I would say, 12, 14 years. I'm going by memory, but around that time. And it was always a support function when companies are coming in, helping them recruit and retain. But it's grown significantly, I would say, over the last five years uh, to the point where um, our ability to attract more investments and helping local companies grow hinges on our ability to be able to attract talent. I have Councillor Trosau, then Ferreira, then McAllister. Um, thank you. I wanted to um, ask a specific question about the um, Don't Tell Toronto, um, um, I don't know, program, or whatever you call it. Um, could, could you tell me more about what the purpose of that is and how that fits into one of your sectors? Thank you. Through the chair. So it, uh, it, while it's a marketing campaign to, uh, market, to market London position it for new investment and talent attraction, its uh, single goal is to attract new talent. Just like I said earlier, uh, the uh, partners we are working with have highlighted areas within Toronto that might be more, more um, uh, in sync with the type of opportunities we have in London. So through social media, uh, TTC, uh, billboard ads on the Gardner, uh, they are targeting talent that might be looking at options outside the GTA, especially in a post-COVID reality where people can work remotely. Uh, so it's playing off of quality of lifestyle, uh, affordability relative to Toronto, and some of those other uh, features to entice talent to look at London. I can tell you since Labor Day, we've received over 5,000 inquiries that our staff has been personally responding to. There's a lot of families that are reaching out uh, with uh, both partners looking for different employment and entrepreneurial opportunities, and staff is taking the time to uh, connect each of, each of them with personalized uh, approaches to uh, various employers and institutions in London. Go ahead. I'd like to ask a little bit, through the chair, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit more about the, um, the, the program of trying to retain um, our post-secondary education students here, because that's something that's something I'm very concerned about. Could you could you talk a little bit more about how you can develop that and how um, the institutions can help, and especially for those of us who have um, post-secondary institutions in our in our in our wards, how, how we could uh, assist with that? Because I talk to students a lot, and that that that's a real it's a real concern. I want I want students to uh, really consider staying here. If they can, yeah. Go ahead. 
Thank you, through the chair. So we've taken a lot of different steps to engage with post-secondary. Let me highlight a few. Uh, the first piece was integrating uh, the portals, London Tech Jobs, Health Jobs, Manufacturing Jobs, uh, to Western and Fanshawe's student career pages. And while that sounds simple, the technology behind that was incredibly complex because we're working with many different backend technologies and automating the process so that more London-specific job opportunities are shown to students at an early stage. If they're exposed to more internships, co-ops, uh, summer job opportunities with local employers and have um, a flavor for the, not just the job, the company, but also for the community, there's a higher chance of them staying. And some of our employers that have participated with this program have come back and told us more students are interacting with these, uh, with these positions. So that's one. Um, I'll give you examples such as the King's Promise program, which is uh, at King's University College, having more regular job fairs, inviting employer partners to be present there to talk to students about local opportunities. If you also look at the cross-section of where students are coming from, a lot of it is GTA-based. So these Don't Tell Toronto campaigns act as double whammies. They're also hitting them at home as well, talking about London. So throughout their uh, experience in London, we're trying to make sure that they're, they're getting a well-rounded uh, employment prospecting uh, from London uh, companies, whether it's on-campus job fairs, integrating the technology, as well as uh, um, cultural and social elements that might help them create a bond with London. And sorry, one last piece on that front. With Fanshawe College, uh, for instance, there's been regular interaction with uh, their academic units to advise them of what areas of the economy are growing so that more student talent can be channeled in those areas. I'll just, uh, so colleagues know that who I have on list, Councillor Ferreira, Councillor McAllister, and I have you, Councillor Hillier. I see you online there. So Councillor Ferreira, you're next. Uh, thank you, and through you, I, some of the questions have been already raised, but I am still just going to follow up uh, just to get maybe into a little bit more detail. I will start with thank you for the great presentation, both presenters. I didn't get to speak on the last one, but I thought it was a good presentation, very articulate, and you guys definitely have the answers right off the top of your head, so I appreciate that. Um, with, uh, with respect to the future challenges and the issues with attracting uh, more talent, I do hear that you say, um, and, I, and, I, and I see it too, um, it's a matter of getting uh, more individuals, more employees, more workers in, in that. And I just wanted to touch on the, how can the city uh, help with that? So I would believe that you're probably getting feedback that affordability, housing issues, and, and just um, the multitude of issues that we see coming before this chamber again and again. So I wanna know if you could just maybe expand on that and just give us a little bit more detail just so we, as council, uh, are just a little more informed as um, what we can do on, on the city side anyways. Thank you. Through the chair. So every, um, everybody who's looking to make a move has unique variables that they're subscribing to. Employment uh, or intra-company transfer or entrepreneurship is part of the, uh, the mix. But what's also sticky is culture, recreation, arts. And it, it'll be different for everybody. So, I, and I know it sounds like a very motherhood statement, but anytime we have opportunities to invest more in culture, uh, recreation, all of those elements that make it sticky for families when they're moving to London to subscribe to the community, to plant roots here uh, and not miss back home. There's always that comparison when people move, where we had X, Y, and Z back home, what do we have here in London? When we're responding to a lot of these inquiries, we're trying to take that approach and show people the variety of different things London has to offer. So I think uh, from, from that standpoint, ongoing investments in core areas, in uh, recreation, in, in uh, cultural attributes, whether it's dining, uh, entertainment, recreation, all of those elements that make it truly sticky for people when they land here is uh, something that I think will take us far. Uh, thank you for that. I'll just wrap this up really quick. I do want to touch on the Don't Tell Toronto campaign. I have been hearing good buzz on that. It is a controversial statement, but at the same time, that has definitely helped and facilitated with that message going through. So I've, had, I've heard good things on that. So I just want to make a comment on that. Uh, thank you, but shh, don't tell Toronto. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have Councillor McAllister next. Uh, thank you, and through the chair, also appreciate the uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you could speak in terms of the, the quality of the jobs that we've been able to attract. Obviously, cost of living is top of mind for a lot of people. And I'm wondering in terms of, um, you know, salaries, um, are we competitive in that uh, realm? Um, I'm happy to see that the province is finally uh, showing what uh, the job offers, uh, you know, salary ranges. I think that's a good step because 
you don't want that mismatch of people coming and realizing, you know, well, the job is not paying what I thought it did, right? So I was wondering if you could speak a bit more in terms of the quality of the jobs that we've been able to attract. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, um, I can tell you a lot of these um, uh, facilities that are coming to London, even the manufacturing ones, have a significant head office component with them as well. Uh, so while the volume of uh, jobs within manufacturing are production related, we're also getting um, uh, finance, marketing, HR, a bunch of head office uh, functions as well. I don't have uh, salary data, but what I can tell you is uh, companies have not expressed that they're not able to attract talent because of competitive wages. I think, uh, and of course, there's been a lot of inflationary pressures over the last several years, that, that's well known, but London does compete uh, on the national level in terms of attracting uh, skilled labor as it relates to competitive wage rates. Um, Thanks to that diversification that I spoke of earlier, we've been able to attract a wide variety of occupations as well. Um, so that's helped further diversify uh, the uh, NOC codes, the National Occupation Codes. Um, we just recently did four studies uh, with uh, Dr. Mike Moffat uh, from the Smart Prosperity Institute that broke down uh, a list of occupations within manufacturing, construction, health, and um, uh, technology. And they came up with a list of different occupations that uh, London needs to grow. And within all the stakeholder interviews and consultations that uh, Dr. Moffat did, uh, competitive, competitiveness of wages was never identified as a leading uh, criterion. Uh, thank you for that and through the chair. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit more in terms of um, what you hear um, from prospective um, you know, talent or uh, companies in terms of what's a barrier to establishing in London? Is, would it be infrastructure, housing, transit? Like, what are the, the main challenges um, that we as a city need to do to, to attract that? Through the chair, thank you. Um, I think on the industrial infrastructure standpoint, companies uh, uh, have really liked uh, this region in general, especially our industrial uh, parks uh, that the city develops. Uh, Overall, I think the theme comes back to the ability to attract workforce. Uh, companies that have chosen to go elsewhere in Ontario have done that for reasons that they thought they might be able to attract talent from other metropolis, whether it's Toronto or uh, GTA H as it relates to the Hamilton proximity. So I think it all comes back to the confidence they can develop in terms of being able to attract the type of jobs that they're looking for. Uh, Councillor Hillier. Thank you very much. Mr. Lacodia, um, thank you, first of all, for all the work you guys do attracting industry to our area and along the 401 corridor into my, into my ward. What I'm curious about is the innovation park and the gap in the urban growth boundary. And I'm wondering if that lands ca is causing an issue for you attracting industry along the 401 corridor because there is that gap. Thank you. Through the chair, um, there is sufficient inventory in the current um, industrial parks. We have, in addition to Innovation Park right at the 401, we also have uh, the new Huron Industrial Park close to the airport, along with several other parcels that have recently come on board. And there are further plans to develop Innovation Park uh, Phase 5 uh, is... Uh, going to come online uh, in the next little bit as well. So I think, uh, and I, don't, I hesitate to speak on behalf of my city colleagues, uh, but I feel from my standpoint, there's enough existing inventory to suffice the forecasted demand, but maybe I'll look to uh, Mr. Mathers to add some more color. Through the chair, and just to add, there is a land needs study that's being is ongoing for industrial lands to just kind of reconfirm that. So, uh, of course, like there's lands for that short term, and that's uh, for that's what uh, LADC is really focused on as well. And then we're also looking for that long term to make sure that there's enough for that 20, 25 year period. So that is an ongoing work that we're that the city is uh, working on. Councillor Hillier. Yes, uh, one more. Have you uh, received any inquiries about spaces in the urban growth boundary that we should be looking at or possibly getting an exemption for? Um, we do have uh, received uh, not inquiries from end users, but property owners that, uh, that have uh, ambitions to uh, develop those parcels. But that's not an area for us. We, uh, uh, we pass it on to our colleagues at planning. Uh, and I guess, okay, again, I might look to Mr. Mathers. 
Go ahead, Mr. Mathers. Uh, through, through the chair, um, yeah, absolutely. So that's something that we're actively pursuing. We have uh, various partner, partners across the city as part of our, our industrial strategic uh, plan. And uh, we move forward with that as these opportunities come up and uh, uh, work very hard on that on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cuddy. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, I was gonna ask uh, the same question that uh, Councillor Stevenson asked, but, so I'll, I'll just make a comment. Uh, uh, Mr. Lacote, I, I want to tell you that I've known uh, just about every CEO that's uh, that's been with LEDC since its beginning, including Mr. John Kime, and I think you, sir, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with any one of them. Congratulations on the great work. You and I recently spoke about Volkswagen and the new battery plant, and I think we have, really don't have a concept of the, the great downstream effect we're going to see in, in our city from Volkswagen. And I wonder if you could maybe speak to that a little bit about what we're going to see in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, um, throughout this year, there has been a flurry of activity from uh, suppliers that need to supply both Volkswagen as well as Stellantis in uh, Windsor. So we are also seeing some uh, trickle effect uh, for that investment, even though it's uh, significantly further away than Volkswagen. Um, there are a number of irons in the fire. Several companies have, uh, even this week, there are several that are coming to tour uh, again. Uh, there are various different uh, stages of their assessment. Uh, I'm confident that uh, our area will certainly see uh, some uh, supplier activity. It's just a matter of companies doing their due diligence. A lot of these things are often um, uh, at the provincial and federal level in terms of incentive programs and government partnerships as well. So we work hand in glove uh, with those uh, units as well. But based on the volume of uh, interest and activity, as well as our availability uh, of land within Innovation Park and other industrial assets in that corridor, there are good prospects about landing some of these uh, suppliers. Thank you. And just uh, a final comment, uh, and it would be referencing uh, uh, Councillor Hillier's comments. I think that anything close to the 401, including Councillor Hillier's area, is really important as industries look for whatever they can, uh, properties that they can get as close as they can to where they're, where they're building. And I think Councillor Hillier has a point that we will be looking out in his area for more development. I would also mention that um, I would like to, to uh, speak to you in the future about possibly doing some work at Fanshawe as it's in my ward and I'm very actively involved with, uh, with some of the activity going on out there. So we'll chat about that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Oh, Councillor Van Meerbergen, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you, Kapil, uh, for the presentation. Um, I've been involved for quite some time uh, in the automotive-related uh, exporting manufacturing sector. Um, and I've spent a lot of time uh, in Michigan, Ohio, et cetera, uh, speaking with new companies, perhaps to do business with, and quite often, they've never heard of London, Ontario. And when you say it, their eyes kind of glass over and say things like um, London, Ontario. That, that sounds like a far away place to do business. Um, Kapil, I'm wondering, um, given that the United States is still the largest economy and it's just an hour down the road for us to access, are we actually proactively going into some of these border states like Michigan, like Ohio, the nearby states, um, with, with a London plan for them to digest? Thank you. Uh, through the mayor, oh, uh, through the chair, I'm sorry, um, which also is a mayor. Uh, um, uh, we follow the lead of uh, the uh, provincial and uh, federal uh, colleagues, so whether it's trade commissioners or economic officers that are stationed in uh, various areas, including U.S. Uh, to your point, there are some right in Detroit, Ohio, Kentucky, that whole automotive belt. Uh, so a lot of uh, their work involves lead generation and activities such as uh, participation at auto shows and other trade-related uh, events. 
Um, we have that mechanism where leads are being generated throughout this uh, ecosystem. And when companies are looking at uh, this part of the world, for instance, uh, a couple of years ago, we had Arvind Sango that uh, came from uh, that uh, Kentucky area, which is a supplier to Toyota. Um, so we participate in those type of activities to ensure London is on the radar for companies that are looking at Ontario. Uh, all these recent investments, especially in the EV space, from a federal standpoint, has had a lot uh, of emphasis in Europe and Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, especially in Korea and Japan. Uh, the trends from the federal uh, level shows that we can expect more investment active activity from that part of the world, especially because with the Inflation Reduction Act and some other Buy America policies, there's a lot of uh, US investment that's actually staying in the United States. And it's not just uh, with automotive, we've seen that with chip manufacturing and a bunch of other areas as well. So overall, as it relates to deal flow and investment activity, we're getting more interest from Europe and uh, Korea, Japan uh, area. Uh, but to answer the uh, question more directly, we're relying on that referral mechanism within that trade commissioner set up uh, in the U.S. to ensure that London continues to stay on that radar. Okay, thanks very much, Kapil. Okay, I don't have any other speakers. <coughs> Seeing no one else looking to add anything, uh, we need a motion to uh, receive uh, the uh, update. Um, Councilor Rahman seconded by Councilor McAllister. I don't think there's any discussion on that, so we'll open that for voting. Close the votes, yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Sorry for the dramatic pause there, just a little bit of um, technical issues. Um, uh, I just wanna add, like I said uh, to the, 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 previous, um, uh, the previous presenter, um, uh, please let your board know we appreciate the work that's being done. Uh, we appreciate also you coming and answering very thoroughly uh, all of our uh, detailed questions uh, with very detailed and relevant answers. It's, it's greatly appreciated. We look forward to continuing to work with you. With that, we'll move on to our uh, third and final delegation of this section. Um, we have Steve, the Executive Director of the Small Business Center, uh, coming for the annual update for that organization. So once we get your presentation up on the screen, we'll get you up to the podium uh, to present. All right, we'll invite you up now, Mr. Pellerin. Just had to change my mask there, less chance of fogging up. So, <clears throat> so many of you know us as that place that helps people start and grow businesses. That is true, but we play a more significant role than that. We are a public resource for the citizens of London. We work with people from all walks of life, each with their own dream of business ownership. Some are driven to achieve wealth, but most are in pursuit of a better quality of life. They want freedom, they want purpose, and an opportunity to contribute to their community. 
They are not world-changing innovators, nor are they SMEs with 50 employees. They are your hairstylist, your mechanic, your child care provider, your fitness instructor, and the hundreds of other businesses that make us a community. Not everyone we work with will start a business, and that's okay too. We take pride in knowing that we help people make informed decisions that are best for their family. Yes, our goal is economic development, but our passion is people. We want the business community to represent the diversity of our citizens, and we believe everyone should have an opportunity to pursue their goal of business ownership. We have a unique relationship with the city. The city was a founding member of the corporation in 1986. And in 1997, when the province rolled out its network of small business enterprise centers, they, <coughs> they approached the city who in turn contracted us. I mention this because it makes us unique. In most cities, the public service that we provide is delivered directly by the municipality in partnership with the province. This has created both opportunities and challenges for us. As an independent organization, we have been able to create unique partnerships and explore various program delivery models. On the downside, we not have the same access to municipal resources, and we have fallen behind other cities in the support provided. So who do we serve? At first point of contact, 23% are at the investigatory stage, 44% are startups, and 32% are existing businesses. Women continue to be the most active demographic, and the percentage of immigrants is growing. The unemployed also represent a notable percentage. You can see our most active business sectors are food-related and retail. This is a direct result of where we've been able to secure additional funding to invest in programming. I'll skip by slide seven and just encourage you to visit our website to learn more about our services. In slide eight, this is a very high level summary of activity and touch points. Many of the training sessions, and you'll see we did over 170 training sessions last year, are actually designed to triage and redirect consultation requests because we simply are unable to meet one-on-one -on -one with everyone who requests a meeting with us. Now this slide, this is where I start to get really excited. When we are fortunate, we can direct clients into programs. The vast majority of inquiries we receive will never, be, will never qualify for program, but for those that do, we are able to offer an enhanced level of service. And that is where our highest impact and value comes from. I've only got time to talk about a couple. The Foodpreneur Advantage program has completed its second year of a four-year agreement and we are thrilled with the results. We are prospecting for high value food and beverage manufacturing startups. We begin broadly with startup sessions to reach as many as we can, and then we identify candidates to participate in our scale up program, which is designed specifically for, for high potential consumer packaged goods manufacturers. We've had such success that other municipalities have reached out to us. Our Foodpreneur Advantage brand is now carried in eight municipalities. Recently, we had St. Catharines and Brampton reach out to us to see how they could get involved. Slide 11 is the wrap-up report of the My Main Street Local Business Accelerator Program. It officially ended in June. As your worship will remember, you led the motion to secure 57,000 in funding that helped us to leverage 630,000 in provincial federal dollars. A total of 400,000 in grants went to 40 businesses. In this past year, we were asked to speak at the EDCO Annual Conference as well as the OBIA Annual Conference to share our success with that program. That was a notable win for London. Another notable success that came out of the LCRN Fund was a small outreach project to connect newcomers to London's Entrepreneurial Support Network. Over a five-month period, we partnered with six agencies to deliver a short startup workshop more than 500 people registered and 307 attended. One session was actually translated live into seven languages. It was an opportunity for us to better understand the untapped potential and demand from the newcomer population. We were overwhelmed with 19% of attendees engaging our services in the weeks following those activities. Unfortunately, we do not have the capacity to continue that work, 
We are hopeful our experience will lead to new funding opportunities. For the sake of time, I'll skip slide 13 and jump to 14. Our total economic impact. It's important to note that this primarily represents the outcome of our program activity with 374 new jobs reported by clients engaged in programs. It does not include the impact of the thousand of inquiries, seminar attendees, and consultations that we provide to the community as a public service. And finally, the work we do matters, but don't take our word for it. Enjoy these testimonials and many more on our website. As I've said, behind every business, there is a person. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I look for any questions that colleagues might have. Go ahead, Councillor Trosau. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Through the chair, I just, I just want to better understand the relationship between uh, this entity and the Chamber of Commerce and whether there's any um, o o overlap or whether <coughs> there are any joint programs. Go ahead. Through the chair. Well, we kind of consider ourselves to be a farm team for the chamber. Um, as you know, the chamber is a membership driven organization. Uh, most of our clients at the early stages um, are not yet at the point where they would engage in chamber services. And, and the chamber does not engage in that really early startup activity as well. I mean, the people who come to us, they're looking for the basics. They want to know how to register their business. They want to know what the rules and regulations are. They want to know how they can get access to funding. They want to know how to put together a business plan. Those are not activities that the chamber um, engages to their members. Councillor McAllister. Um, thank you through the chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more. Uh, you mentioned in terms of um, um, you know, newcomers trying to start up businesses and that you didn't necessarily have the capacity, but I did notice there were some partnership organizations on there um, in terms of like LUSO, CCLC. Have you been able to uh, maintain any of those partnerships or is it more of a capacity issue uh, on, on your side or have there been the, um, you know, productive conversations about partnering with other organizations? Uh, through the chair, it's definitely a capacity issue. Um, the organizations that were identified there, they have all reached out to us on numerous occasions. They want us to come and speak to their clients. They want us to engage with their clients. We don't have the capacity to do it, which is why we took advantage of the LCRN funding, got a little bit of funding so that we could go out and do that work. Um, it was well received. They would like us to keep doing it, but until we find a new source of revenue, we we're unfortunately unable to do that. Um, there is huge potential there. I, I've, got, I've got to say, I mean, the individuals that, that we meet through those organizations, um, they have so much ambition and desire to make a go of it in this country. Um, we've got to find a way to tap into that. Good. Okay. I have uh, Councillor Pribble and then Councillor Ferreira. Oh, we might just need your microphone there. Okay, thanks. Recent articles state that during the last 20 years, even though Canada, Canada's population grew over $10 million, we are, sorry, 10 million people population-wise, we actually have uh, 100,000 less entrepreneurs. And we know small businesses are tremendously important to local communities, municipalities, receiving the tax dollars locally at uh, incomes as well. What are we doing, you know, if we look at the CBA coming up, uh, if we look at the economies of scale, a lot of things are going kind of currently against the small businesses. What initiatives are we implementing, introducing to make sure that we, in these young people, we kind of uh, open up the spirit to be entrepreneurs and to try to stay in the local municipality and open up their own businesses and become entrepreneurs? Well, the short answer would be that we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough initiatives. Um, the, the fact that the population is growing and the number of businesses is declining um, does not actually surprise me. And, and the reason being, we're losing ground to a lot of big corporations. I mean, Amazon, you know, others. Like, we're, we're losing ground there. But when you also take a look at where 
our population growth is coming from, i.e. the immigrant population, we know that recent immigrants are much more likely than second and third generation immigrants to start new businesses. However, they are even more likely to exit after the first year. Okay? And, that, and that is because it's, it's overwhelming, it's complicated, um, they may lack the financial resources, the knowledge. And to me, that all comes back to having structured programming in place for them. And it's just something that we're not doing enough of. I don't mean London, I mean generally speaking. We put a lot of emphasis on those high growth, high potential sectors, but we don't spend enough time thinking about those local jobs, those local community businesses that also need that kind of support. Things like the SEBA were great, but as you know, the SEBA only came about because suddenly the world paid attention to the fact that these small local businesses were hurting and suffering. But we're not out of the woods yet. These SEBA loans are, are coming due. And many of the businesses that we're talking to are ill-equipped to deal with that, especially at the current interest rates. Um, there's still a long way to go. But if you're going to ask my, <laughs> I'm going to be biased in my answer, but if you ask me what the solution is, it's going to be more structured programs that reach more people. Thank you. Just one follow-up. More structures, and we are not doing enough. Anything else besides resources? Anything else, financial resources and funding? Anything else that come to your mind that would help? Well, not not everything within our control. I mean, clearly things like the interest rates, access to to labor, um, <clears throat> some of the some of the labor requirements that that make it difficult for small employers to compete with larger employers. There's a lot of stuff at, at a provincial and federal level that, you know, I understand is, is not within in the realm of, you know, maybe a municipality, but I do think that people need to start paying attention and municipalities also need to start advocating with the provincial government and the federal government on these issues that are facing small businesses. Which we saw, it might just check your microphone, make sure it's off for me. Um, I got Councillor Frere next. Uh, thank you, through you. Um, I guess my questions are kind of similar to Councillor Pribble. So um, I do understand that, you know, the small businesses of, you know, the city and small business in general are definitely some of the people who've definitely uh, felt the biggest impacts um, during the pandemic. And you and I have had conversations about this before. So I know the Small Business Centre has been right there, front and centre and you've been uh, going through this um, as well. I just wanted to uh, maybe ask, um, I know you kind of answered a little bit, but with the structured programs that you were talking about and what uh, you think um, would help you move forward, especially with respect to the fact that we're still feeling um, the effects of, uh, of the pandemic, we're still feeling the effects of um, the whole economic impact. And I just wanted to know if there's, um, if there's anything that you could uh, add to what you've already said. Through your chair, sorry, if you just clarify, like you're asking specifically what we need, is that what you're, like I'm not sure what the question was. You just need to give them the, your, the microphone back. Um, I basically, I, I understand that, um, like throughout the pandemic, you know, I know that the Small Business Center had challenges everywhere leading up to even people coming into the building, into the door. So I wanted to know if you maybe could give a, a better picture of um, maybe just a summary of where we were to where we are right now, the outlook, and then um, what you think uh, where we'll be, I guess to say it generally, um, in the future. I, I, I just want to know how, um, I, and like I said, it's kind of speaking to Council of Purple just a little bit, how would we be able uh, to assist the Small Business Centre be able to assist small businesses moving forward, particularly speaking to the effects that are still being felt today. So, Councillor, just let me jump in. Um, do you mind if we just focus on the second half of your question? I don't think, given the amount on the agenda, we need the history of where we were, where we come from, where we're going, but maybe this, the end part of that, just saying 
what do you need next, uh, where are we headed, is probably the part that's best. I think um, Mr. Pellin is happy to probably meet with you to talk about kind of the past, but I'm just trying to keep the agenda tight. If you don't mind, uh, we'll focus on the second piece. Uh, yeah, uh, no worries. I was just trying to um, give like a comparative. You don't have to go too much into the history because we yeah. have we've had the com conversation before, but I, I'm just really more interested on uh, just the status, the situation sure. today. Go ahead. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, sorry, through your chair. Um, again, we can break that into two parts. I, I believe you're asking specifically about existing business as opposed to that startup activity. Okay, so, so with regards to the existing businesses, um, yes, we often hear that, that the biggest challenge they're facing is access to capital, access to financing, um, but, but our experience, shows us it's, it's actually the availability of their time. Okay? They, they, they don't have the time to properly work on the business because they're too busy working in the business. And, and it would absolutely you know, amaze you how many business owners out there have really poor even basic financial understanding of, of their situation, let alone their operational situations. There's a lot of businesses that just, you know, they're so busy, they don't have time to actually work on the business. So that's what we do. That, that's the primary role of the Small Business Center. But to do that, to, to get a business to take time away from their business, to take time away from their business, we have to entice them. And, and we entice them with programs, we entice them with financial offerings, we entice them with leveraged offers through, through, through provincial programs, et cetera. Um, that's what it takes. It just it just just takes more time. That's the bottom line. It takes more time to spend one on one coaching with businesses. Okay. Other speakers. Okay. Great. Then I need one of those motions to receive the uh, the update. Uh, I'll have Councilor Pribble and Councilor Raman do this one, and uh, we'll open that for voting as soon as it's ready. Councillor Pulls the votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. And thank you very much for uh, the presentation as well as to you, the board, and uh, all the uh, staff uh, at the Small Business Centre for everything you do to assist, uh, you know, important, uh, growing segment of uh, our business community and uh, and all that you do to help new entrepreneurs navigate the way uh, through uh, the challenges and opportunities of uh, business ownership. So thanks very much, Steve. And thank you for the opportunity tonight. Okay, we're on to committee appointment preferences uh, submitted by council members. So uh, for those of you new to council, it's the time of year where you may have uh, loved the committee you served on. Now you get an opportunity to maybe continue on or try a new committee. I know everybody submitted their preferences. Um, the, the chairs are outlined there. So we're looking to populate uh, the remaining members of the committee. Uh, we'll proceed through this in the order that it's listed on the agenda with the planning committee first. Now I will say, um, much like we did the first time through, uh, the, the clerks have everything kind of preloaded with every member of council in. So you may have ranked it, you know, first, second, third, or fourth. Um, you're not really bound by that. If you've, you know, if you've changed your mind between now and then, you're looking to do something a little bit different than you've written down. You know, just uh, just let us know if you want to be considered for that committee. So, you know, we'll we'll kind of put out an open call to see who would like to be where, um, and if there's more. Than, uh, than four additional members beyond uh, the chairs to fill that committee. Then we'll have a vote. Uh, and uh, you know the, the top vote getters will be on the committee and the other ones will, um, will not. 
Um, but don't be shy about uh, putting your name forward if there's a committee you'd like to serve on. Um, and uh, I think uh, for those of us who've served on council before, all of us have been through this process before. All of us have gotten committees we'd like. All of us have gotten like missed opportunities maybe we wanted to serve on. So I would say just don't take offense to the process. It's uh, There's always opportunities to serve and I think we've all been on uh, multiple sides of those decisions. So. With that, um, I'm going to start with, I think in the, we've got Planning and Environment Committee uh, listed here. So we have um, Councillor Lehman, who's the chair. We have four members who have submitted their first preference, but that doesn't mean others can't add their name to that. Um, and I, I guess if you're on that first preference list and you, and you don't want to be on Planning Committee anymore, now's the time to speak up. So, you know, maybe I'll start with uh, just colleagues to see if they're, who's looking to serve on that committee and we can populate a, a list. So this is where... And everybody's at the meeting, so everybody's able to participate. So if you want to be on planning committee, I know you've listed it, but I'm not going to presume that that's the case. Let me know. So Councilor Rahman's willing to, she wants to be on the list of people serving. If you're online, you're just going to have to let me know if you're interested. And I know Councilor Frank. Councilor Frank, you have your screen on. You're interested in planning? Okay, Councilor Frank's interested. Yes, please. Councilor Deputy Mayor Lewis is interested. Councillor Hillier's got his thumb up online. He's interested. Anyone else interested? Councillor Lehman, you're already on because you're the chair, so you don't have to you'd be on twice. You don't get two votes, though. Um, okay, that means we got Councillor Lehman so far and four other members. This one could be really easy. Okay, given that, I actually don't need to go through a process. I just need someone to move a motion to appoint these members as the planning committee. I see uh, Councillor uh, Pribble, Councillor Cuddy's willing to second. Anyone in want to discuss? No? Okay, so what we're doing is we're having a motion to appoint Councillor Frank, Deputy Mayor Lewis, Councillor Hillier, and Councillor Rahman to the committee with Councillor Lehman as chair. And Councillor Peloza, I saw that you ended up leaving and then ending up having to come back into the, the Zoom meeting there for a moment. I'll just let you know before we open a vote that we're, uh, we're in the process of, uh, we've got a motion to appoint Councillor Frank, Deputy Mary Lewis, Councillor Hillier, Councillor Rahman um, uh, to the planning, uh, and environment or the planning and Environment Committee with Councillor Lehman already serving as the chair there. So that's what's going to open momentarily. Thank okay. you. I did see that. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, next on to Civic uh, Works Committee. Um, Got Councillor Hopkins uh, serving as chair of that. I'll look to others who are looking to serve on the Civic Works Committee. Councillor Trosau, Councillor Pribble, uh, Councillor Ferreira, need at least one more. Anybody online looking to go? I've seen this before in a previous council, and sometimes people are holding out for a committee that they may or may not get. And sometimes if we can't decide on one, we could always flip that one down to the bottom as well. Councillor Trosau. I'm wondering if the deputy city manager involved might want to give just a little bit of a promo for how exciting this committee is. 
I like the idea of putting the deputy city managers on the spot to promo the committees that they serve. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, the don't tell Toronto advertising campaign. Don't tell anyone about how exciting civic works committee is. Um, unless colleagues are looking for a little bit more information on the civic works committee, I, you know, I certainly allowed, I could promote that, but I'm, I, I'm going to, I'm going to assume that most committee members know what the committees are. I'm just looking for some guidance colleagues. Councillor Pelosi, you have your hand up. Sorry, thank you. Just to preface it, I'm not at this time able to take on another committee, but um, I would note that due to our numbers and committee vacancies that some councillors are required to serve on more than one committee. So if you're holding that back, some will need to serve on more than one. Maybe I could just suggest a process here. We could appoint three people. We can come back and fill the last spot at the end. Maybe someone has has a different thought as we go through the process because they they get on a committee that maybe they don't want to serve or they don't. Councillor Stevenson? I'm willing to put that motion forward. Yeah. Yep. I'm just gonna, with everybody's unanimous consent, just do that um, rather than have a motion. Okay, okay, so. Okay, so what I am going to take from you is I don't need the motion to do the rest at the end. I am just going to take the motion for you to uh, move Councillor Pribble, Trosau, and Ferreira to the committee. I'll look for a seconder for that, knowing that we have one more vacancy to fill. Councillor Cuddy's willing to second that. Any discussion on appointing those three members? Okay, we'll open the appointment of those three members for voting, and then we're going to come back to Civic Works Committee at the end of the whole process and get another member. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, next we have Community and Protective Services Committee. Uh, we have Councillor Peloza willing to chair that. I look for members who are interested in serving there. I see Councillor Trosau, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor McAllister, Councillor Pribble, Councillor Ferreira. I'm looking online, anybody? Looking for a Community and Protective Services Committee online? No? Anybody else in the room? Okay, that means we get to, uh, we get to do a vote on that one. So we will have uh, Councillor Stevenson, Ferreira, McAllister, Pribble, and Trosau uh, on that ballot, and um, we'll open it up and then, okay, we'll just, yeah, we'll, oh yeah, we'll let people speak to it for sure. Um, let me just, While they're loading that up, um, I'll let anybody uh, speak to it who'd like to speak to it. If you'd like to go, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead. Yes, I would just like to request that I get back on this committee for one more year. It's in line with my police board, paramedic, and the social services in Old East Village. So one more year on this one, please. Anybody else want to speak? Go ahead, Councillor McAllister. Uh, thank you, and through the chair, um, noting this would be my first time on this committee, um, I, also, I have an interest actually more on the community side of it. I think there's a bunch of issues coming that will affect my ward that I would like to um, sit on this committee for. Thank you. Councillor Chosa, go ahead. Um, well, I, w I was disappointed uh, the first time, and I'm just trying again. Uh, I want to stay on Civic Works, but uh, this is, uh, I'm willing to serve on two committees. This corresponds with a lot of my interests in in the housing and code enforcement um, sector, and um, this really uh, this really corresponds with a lot of the um, requests that I get in my ward. Okay, anyone else? Councilor Ferreira, go ahead. Uh, thank you. This was my first choice. I know I was on it before, but I have uh, still more work to do. A lot of the items that come to this committee are, are directly related to um, things that pop up in my ward. So I do believe that. Um, I hope that I get your support for it. I, you know, I, I, 
I do like this committee. It is a heavy workload committee. It, sometimes the meetings are long, but they're very impactful. So I do hope that I get your support uh, for another year. Okay. And Councillor Pribble, you're the only one left. Do you want to say any words or? Do you truly enjoy the one year? And I do think that there are certain open issues that are actually coming back next year. And I think that continuity would be really important in these issues. And uh, and again, I think I would be a valid uh, voice to this committee, even though if I, even if I will still attend it. So I just want to let you know that I certainly would still attend it, even though I would not be the voting member. Thank you. Okay, that's everybody. I mean, other members of council can weigh in if they want, but probably it's probably not going to happen. Okay, great. Is we have that set up? Okay, so everybody votes for four of the five, right? Okay, got it. So when the vote opens, you're going to pick four people. Got it. Okay, we're going to open that vote. Closing the vote, and the uh, vote is as follows. Co Councillor McAllister, 15. Councillor Stevenson, 8. Councillor Pribble, 13. Councillor Trossow, 9. Councillor Ferreira, 15. So the result is Councillor Ferreira, McAllister, Pribble, and Trossow being appointed to the committee. Well, not appointed yet because someone has to make that motion to do that. Councillor uh, Ferreira is willing to put those names forward, seconded by Councillor McAllister. Um, any discussion on uh, that'll take a second just to get up. Okay, we're gonna open that for voting. Councillor Trossow, Councillor Ferreira. Um. 
closing the vote. Motion carries 15 to zero. Next is Corporate Services Committee uh, requires uh, four members. Councillor McAllister is serving as chair. Uh, I'll look for those who are interested in serving on that committee. Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Cuddy, uh, Councillor Van Meerbergen, All right, we need one more. Councillor Rahman. Anyone else? Okay, so that means I could just take a motion for Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Cuddy, Councillor Van Meerbergen, Councillor uh, Council Rahman with Councillor McAllister serving as chair. Councillor Cuddy is willing to move that, seconded by Councillor Ferreira. Any discussion on that? Okay, we'll pull that up in a sec and then I'll let you know when it's ready for voting. I vote yes. We're not quite there yet. I'll let you know when. Okay, we're opening that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, and now we get to loop back to Civic Works Committee. So after all of that, is there, we need one more person for Civic Works Committee. Councillor Hopkins, you're, uh, you're the chair. Are you gonna make a pitch? I'm okay, gonna make a, make a pitch. I have uh, served on Civic uh, oh, two times in the past. It's an exciting committee. If you like spending money on lots of needed infrastructure projects, please join me. Who's looking to serve on Civic Works Committee? This is the point where you kind of strong arm someone sitting beside you, encourage them along. I see Councillor Frank, are you volunteering? No, put your hands up. No, I have a quick question. Um, I just noticed the last vote, we appointed Councillor McAllister who's the chair and so the four people, and maybe it's just my voting thing, but I just don't think it's correct, so. Uh, that's good, good catch, Councillor um, Frank. It was Councillor Rahman who got missed, so we'll, we're gonna loop back and just appoint Councillor Rahman to the Corporate Services Committee. Um, so, mover to point Council Raman. Moved by Council Cuddy, seconded by Council McAllister. Council McAllister, you tried to do what Council Layman did, and that's get on twice, maybe votes. Like, uh, okay, so that's ready. We're going to open Council Raman to the Corporate Services Committee for approval. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. And now we're back to needing someone for Civic Works Committee. This is, this is the point at which, although I didn't do it before, this is the point where the deputy city manager can pitch the upcoming exciting items maybe coming to Civic Works Committee this year and see if that entices anyone. Do you wanna just highlight a couple of things? 
Thank you, Your Worship. I'm trying not to take this personally, so we take this like a dragon's den opportunity. Uh, so Civic Works will be looking at another record construction year. We'll be continuing work on our rapid transit projects. We've got some massive expansion work planned to um, provide wastewater servicing for growth. We'll be bringing the transportation uh, mobility master plan back through Civic Works. Lots of exciting things. And we tend to run a pretty tight meeting, so usually we're not there for more than 90 minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm looking for a volunteer. Councillor Frank. I have one quick question. Yes. If I may, through you to um, Councillor Hopkins. Um, we, I'm just curious if uh, you've looked at the Upper Thames board meeting schedule and Civic Works, because I'd be willing to send Civic Works, but I'm worried about the conflict with Upper Thames. So I'm just wondering if Councillor Hopkins has already correlated them and identified there is not significant overlap. I'm not sure if you can answer that, Councillor Hopkins, but... I have looked into it. Uh, Upper Thames will be uh, finalizing the upcoming meetings for 2024 and this month. So still haven't seen those meetings and they still need to be confirmed. I know that uh, they do meet in the uh, mornings, Tuesday mornings, but... Um, Nothing has been confirmed yet. Does that help, Councillor Frank, or not? Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to send Civic Works because that pitch from uh, the deputy city manager was just too good to say no to. But um, I just am worried a bit about Upper Thames, but perhaps something that's something Councillor Hopkins and I can speak with Upper Thames about. I, I think that's fair, and I will tell you, I don't think any colleague would take offense, given we really need someone for the committee and getting you on now. And if there's some sort of conflict and we need to strong arm someone else in the future, we can always make a switch, but hopefully it will all work out if you're willing to serve on Civic Works Committee. Councillor Hopkins had something to add? Yeah, there'll be two of us that will have a conflict then, but I'll leave it at that. Sounds to me like you've got to flex the voting power at uh, Upper Thames and make sure their meeting schedule aligns with ours. Uh, okay, so that means, Councillor Frank, you're willing to serve, so I'll look for a mover for Councillor Frank to serve on this. Councillor Ferrer is willing to move, seconded by Councillor Cuddy. Any discussion on that? Okay, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to 0. Okay, um, colleagues, the, I wonder if you want to break before or after the next item, because everything is ready for us to break now, if you would like, but we could also do it after, like, we could do it after. So, if someone wants to break, just move a motion and we'll vote on it. If uh, you want to continue, don't move a motion. It looks like everybody wants to do one more item before the break. Okay. We're going to do um, item... 4.2, which is the cold weather response. Yeah, Councillor Trosa, sorry. Yeah, I think I'm going to change my mind and make the motion. To take a break. <laughs> you don't think that one will be fast? No. no. Okay, how long? So, do you want to do 20 minutes? That's fine. Yeah, okay. Councillor Trosa is moving a 20 minute break. Deputy Mayor Lewis is seconding. We're going to do this by hand. Oh, no, we're not. We're going to do it in the system. Because it, no, we're going to do it by hand. All those in favor of a 20-minute break? Any opposed? <laughs> oh, sorry. Motion carries. Okay, 20 minutes.
So for people participating digitally, if you could just flip your screen on or send a, a hand signal so the clerks can just uh, count uh, you for, count your presence, your valuable presence. I see, I see heart symbols and high fives and a lot of other stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're back, uh, we're back here. I'm, I am gonna circle back. There's one thing we missed on one of the items. I had written a piece of correspondence related to the committee appointments. We just have to receive that. So I'll look for a motion to receive Councillor Rahman, seconded by Councillor McAllister. As soon as that's ready, we'll open it for voting. Mayor Lewis? Yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay, thank you. Um, and although it's a long way off, I, th I well, I hope not, but it may be. Um, when we get to adjournment, I just, someone remind me that I have something to say before adjournment, um, just in case I forget and get caught up in things. Uh, we're on to the next item, which is a cold weather uh, response update. Um, and so I'm just gonna have Mr. Dickens uh, just quickly introduce this item. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you, um, what council has before them today is a uh, culmination of uh, several months of community planning and a lot of work and discussion on trying to find uh, a number of overnight uh, cold weather options for vulnerable individuals. Uh, presented to council and committee uh, for consideration tonight are four options that the community has brought forward. Uh, right now, our um, planned operating budget to support uh, the a combination of these four options is roughly 1.8 million. And while that number uh, may fluctuate as we receive uh, in real time this week, uh, Q2 and Q3 actuals from previous uh, funding arrangements, uh, we don't anticipate that number to increase uh, significantly at this time. Okay, and on this item, um, I know I have Councillor Stevenson down as wanting to speak, but maybe before that, I, there's a, de a request for delegation status. I'd like to deal with that first. So if there's, if uh, Councillor Rahman, you're willing to entertain a five minute delegation, seconded by Councillor Stevenson, um, any discussion before I open that for voting? Okay, so this is to allow the requested delegation for uh, up to five minutes. I will open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 15 to zero. Okay. Uh, Ms. Campbell, you, you'll have the uh, ability to present for uh, up to five minutes, and uh, so you can start whenever you like. Okay. And we'll just maybe just test the mic, I'll make sure it's on. Hello? Yeah, perfect, okay. you're ready to go. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here with other people who are uh, supporting uh, these words. I'm here with Ed Wilson, the chair of our board, uh, David Rather from uh, Werner Place, uh, which is also Bishop Cronin's location. Uh, I have a colleague, Rob, here, as well as Karna Trentman from CMHA uh, STV. Uh, I've met and spoken with Kevin from the Old East Village BIA, as well as our word, um, Councillor uh, Su Susan, um, we've talked about the plans and um, I'm pleased to sort of be here to offer myself really uh, to you, Council. I, I wanted to speak to you today to share our gratitude in uh, our ability to do this work, uh, to build your confidence in the plan due to our experience, community support and learning over the number of years that we've been offering winter beds and to offer accountability and the direct opportunity to respond to any questions you may have about this year's plan. Our community needs these services desperately. Arcade Street Mission has been an active participant in the all of community response, um, health and homelessness effort, and uh, many of our staff, uh, some of our frontline workers, and even some of our community members have had the benefit of sitting in those meetings and rooms we believe in the work that's being done and our board spoke and continues to speak at every board meeting about 
our role as an organization in, in supporting the work of the All of Community Response to homelessness in our community. We uh, understood very early on that as we look for system transformation in our city, that Arcade would need to continue to provide the winter beds that we've been active in, in serving our community and delivering for the last three years. Our board determined not to put a hubs plan forward uh, for this year, knowing that we would need to put all of our resources into supporting a winter plan. Never did we imagine that we may be the only service provider um, adding beds this year. Um, I think it speaks to the capacity issue across our sector that Arcade is the one organization that will be hiring up to 100 new staff to provide the spaces that are necessary. This is not a small challenge. We've been through it, this challenge before and we've learned a lot. But this time, because of the health and homelessness experience, we have more support. We have support from the police services where we have better communication and they've talked to us about this plan and how they'll be able to help us with transition times through the, um, the core area uh, police officers. We've talked with um, LHSC, a partner that we've never worked with directly who's helping us with the HR planning and onboarding. We have the support of CMHA and the work that we're doing together to make their space available uh, for 24 hour service while well, they do the day space and we would operate the night space. And we have the support of our encampment table with all of the folks who have helped us to define the problem and come together with a solution as you see in the report. So we hope that Arcade is demonstrating our community capacity and our desire to support this whole of community response in this way. So I simply just wanted to bring that to you. Um, we believe that the community needs to understand that this is a realistic view of what system transformation may require. That organizations like the ARC that has been here in the community for 40 years, uh, unfunded, uh, sort of a, a sideline organization, will need to step up and add capacity to our system in order for this system transformation to take place, that we're going to need new and more resources to be able to make these changes. We're proud of our colleagues in this work who have opened up supportive housing beds that have put forward hubs proposals. And we hope that this action of adding these beds in a time where the crisis is so dire in our community demonstrates our commitment to this whole of community response. You got about 30 seconds, uh, unless you're done. I'm nope. done. I'm, I'm here for your, any questions you may have. Excellent. So I'll, I'll let you sit down for now and we'll see uh, about that uh, after. Um, and I think Mr. Dickens has already said some words, so I can move to, uh, to colleagues on this. And Councillor Stevenson, you had had your hand up, so I'll go to you first. I did. Thank you. I would like to move this motion uh, as recommended by staff here with one small change in addition to D, which I've provided to the clerk. Um, so at the end of D, it would say with details, including the dates contracts are signed and the dates and amounts that payments are made. And if I have a seconder, I would like to um, speak to that and ask some questions. So I just want to be clear on what you'd like to move. I, I get the uh, addition to D, and I appreciate you sending it to the crews ahead of time. Um, we will have that read out. Our, so Mr. Dickens identified that there was about $1.8 million, um, and, was, and the motion is actually provide direction in B on which of these we'd like to do. So I don't know if you want to be specific in um, which of the components of, of B you're doing, or if you're looking to do all of them, there's probably some Q&A about... Um, where we would get those resources from. So. I am looking to do all of them and then talk about where we can find the resources. Uh, okay. So you want to put all of them on the floor with an addition to D. Uh, and we're going to need some sort of direction on, um, on source of financing. So, But I, I'll look to see if there's a seconder to doing that first. Is it updated? No. No, it's not updated because we're just, it's being crafted now. But what the councillor is asking for, is there a second or four doing all of the components of B and a small addition to D um, at the end of it as was articulated? You're willing to second that? Okay. okay. 
So that's moved and seconded. Um, we're going to have a discussion on that. I'll let Councillor Stevenson start with uh, uh, support for, for your motion. Thank you. Yeah, so I have to start with a huge thank you to Arcade, to the leadership there and to the board, because but for this, you guys offering to do this, we are in a very dire situation in our unsheltered population and all of London. So I have to start with a thank you. And I'm saddened in a sense that it's November 21st that we're talking about this. And so I really do appreciate the board and the leadership's willing to dive in last minute and uh, be willing to do four locations and 120 uh, desperately needed beds. Um, I also appreciate the use of the infrastructure 24-7 at the locations where we had day spaces. So although I dislike the costs because it's over $4,500 a month per mattress on a floor, and although I don't like the locations because they're all in the same places that they've been for a long time, the need is there. And I would like to um, speak to staff about what, has, what options have been explored in terms of funding all of these locations and all of these beds. I know when I quickly looked at it, if we prorate it to the end of March instead of the end of May, we're within 100,000 of the funding that's available. That is not my first choice because I wanna see this running until the end of May. The other thing I noticed on here is that with the CMHA funds, uh, I know we haven't gotten to it yet, but we're looking to um, do a cancellation on that hub plan. And it says at the bottom of page 15, that uh, the funding source for the operating costs of the 556 Dundas Street respite beds at a million four twenty five five sixty two per year for two years was provincial homeless prevention program funding, and I'm wondering if there's any way of making that money available to meet the um, needs we have for winter shelter beds this winter. Okay, so that's just let me. Take care of one thing here. Okay, so that's a that's a question for staff on the ability. I know it's an item later in the agenda, but and council would have to make a decision on that at that time. But any um, ability to reallocate that money in a way um, or any basically, it's a bit of an open-ended question on is that possible and what would that mean? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you, that would. Um those would be prorated funds, so you'd be looking at a, a few months this fiscal year uh, that would be available to be reallocated at this time. Um, certainly, we could look to explore to do that, uh, to put that towards this. I will also note, as I hinted at in the opening remarks, uh, right now we are receiving in real time our Q2 actuals from all of our funded organizations, including shelters and, and other operators, and we're receiving some Q3 actuals from last year's winter response. Uh, those numbers continue to trickle in. It, early indication says there's going to be some unspent funds from those operators uh, across the shelter system. Too early to say definitively what that underspending would look like. It would require us to reallocate funds mid-year to take that underspending uh, and reallocate it to this temporary measure as well. Could certainly look to do that. Um, but it would just be a practice we don't typically do in terms of that taking the Q2s and uh, mid-year and reallocating them to another project so quickly. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. A follow-up through the Chair. Um, can you just explain the proration of the uh, Homeless Prevention Program funding? Because if we had it all to give out for two years, I'm just wondering uh, what's stopping us from committing to the end of May? Thank you, and through the chair, the uh, HPP or Homeless Prevention Program funding uh, does operate from April 1st through to um, March 31st of each fiscal year. So we would be able to prorate the amount from J January, December to March 31st, and then look at um, the, uh, the additional two months in next year's allocation, which has not yet been confirmed by the province. Thank you. Just still help, help me understand how we were able to commit to it for the hub, but not for this. I'm just wondering um, what the difference is. Uh, 
Thank you. And, and I'm not saying through the chair, I'm not saying we, we can't commit it in this regard. It's just that we have an allocation from the province. So there's always a risk that uh, the province may not, you know, um, may not give us the, uh, the actual funding. I don't, I've not ever experienced that before, but um, it, there is always that inherent risk. Is, is it safe to say it's a much smaller risk to extend, like to commit to May versus committing out for two years? Uh, through your worship, yes. The given that's the, uh, the number of months and the, that direct comparison, yes, it would be a smaller risk. Um, so thank you. So I, I just want to speak to the. I think you know we we all know I think how dire the need is, and it is heartbreaking that it is November the twenty first, and people on the streets don't know whether there's going to be shelter beds or not. And I don't want to be part of a city that isn't trying to do everything that we can possibly do to get people inside this winter. And so I want to uh, really ask my colleagues to support fully funding everything that's on the table here um, and also to explore still how we could possibly use that Bob Hayward YMCA um, that is another question I have for staff. You know, we, I hear residents say all the time, what about this building? What about that building? Can't we get people in here? Can't we get people in there? And so we've got a staff report coming forward that says, uh, hey, we've got this building that could do 100 people, but we're saying, no, sorry, you're going to have to sleep in the snowbank this winter because okay, of limitations. Just, that's not what... That's oh, no, no, but, no, but I'm no. just saying, not, I, I just... No, but no one's saying, no, you have to sleep in a snowbank this winter. That's not what's okay. being said. So you, I, we know where you're going. Just All articulate right. it in a way that uh, is respectful to what people are actually um, right. putting forward. That, that's not no, what the staff report says. No, no part of me is saying we probably don't want to house 100 people in that building, but what I'm saying is Londoners are asking me, why are people sleeping outside when we have all these empty buildings? And so I just love staff to help... Uh, me and Londoners understand. So it's details about the Bob Hayward. Um, you articulated in a report, but could you provide more details on that? Uh, through you, Your Worship, as it is articulated in the report, the uh, rate limiting move on uh, accessing that site was the ability to pull together a staffing uh, model and be able to acquire the necessary staffing services to be able to open that site. We get the same emails all the time. Uh, there's an empty building. I drove past it. Why don't you just put people in it? And it always comes down to who is providing the staffing supports. Councilor, you got about 40 seconds left on this. Uh, okay. So my question is, is there a motion needed here or will staff be continuing, uh, continuing to work to find ways to staff that building and to come next month with uh, a solution to that because there's so many people saying I would work it I would volunteer at it uh, is there ways to put calls out to the community and to this whole of community say let's find a way to do this go ahead mr. Dickens or uh, through you mr. Livingston. mayor yeah. I don't believe we need a motion we have been actively working to try and find a solution to staff that location effectively mm -hmm. Uh, and so if there's an organization that's willing to come forward to do that, we are very ready to um, work with them and bring that forward to council. Of course, it would require an additional source of financing to be able to do that, but I don't believe we need a motion. We have been working 24-7 to try and make that location work, uh, and we do not have an operator. Okay, just, to, just to clarify that, so will you continue to work 24-7 between now and next month to see if there's some way we can get that done? The answer was yes, um, that they've been working on it. They need an operator, so people have the ability. If someone knows an operator, like, make a suggestion to them to approach the city on that. So, okay. All right. You got just about 15 seconds left, Councillor. Or, okay. All right, I got a bit of a speaker's list. Uh, I have Councillor Pribble, Deputy Mayor Lewis, Councillor McAllister, Councillor Ferreira, and Councillor Frank. So I'll start with uh, Councillor Pribble. Thank you. I, actually, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Campbell from Arcade a couple of questions. Sorry, the Chair. Of course, sorry, the Chair. Yes, if Ms. Campbell's, uh, she, uh, Ms. Campbell said she was willing to answer some questions, so I'll Perfect, thank you. that, but um, so go ahead. So we have uh, potentially four sites for proposals in front of us, and I just want to ma make sure, let's say, if it was approved, if the funding was uh, uh, found, 
uh, are you able to operate it and what potentially are the biggest challenges that you foresee? Thank you through the chair and uh, this may also answer some of the question about the Bob Hayward and why it's difficult uh, to find an operator. Uh, we are in a difficult position in terms of finding staffing resources. It was uh, great to actually hear earlier with other business sectors saying yes, staffing and finding um, you know equipped people is difficult across uh, employment right now. Um, we believe we will be able to and the reason that we believe we will be able to is because we have in the past. So that's our confidence. Uh, also, we did uh, begin hiring back in September and in fact have opened beds yesterday as part of our training. So we're trying to get a trained and ready workforce and that's why we believe we'll be able to offer the beds for December 1st at the ARC location. Um, and we are continuing to work with our partner at LHSC to do the onboarding. So those are the reasons we have confidence, but I would want to you know, be transparent that onboarding 100 new staff at any time for any organization is a lot of work. That is more than three times our normal size of an organization. And so the onboarding, in fact, it has a huge cost um, each year. Uh, in this budget, it's more than $100,000 for the onboarding costs of these new staff. And so, you know, I do think that from year to year, um, and when looking at these types of short-term projects, we do need to think about the human cost, both to the service user and to the staff that we onboard. Um, the insecurity of those short-term jobs is difficult for people, but we are working at building a system. And in fact, one of the things that we're working at with our colleagues around the table, and again, another benefit of the health and homelessness uh, process, is that we're training to a similar level as of other organizations. And as we train people and get them working in this sector, we hope that there will be job opportunities for those who help us this winter. Councilor Pribble. Thank you, follow-up question. Uh, as was already said, these services certainly are not inexpensive. In the future, is there anything that could be, if you were proactive in certain areas, that these costs could be decreased? Well, I, I highlighted one through the chair, sorry. I uh, highlighted one, which is the onboarding cost of staff. Um, I can speak to our own data, which is that we have laid off or let go of 100 staff each year that we have operated the winter beds. Um, so we know firsthand those costs. Um, and I believe that by supporting things year round that we could both um, secure locations more effectively. Uh, I think that if we want to see things move or have other spaces available, it's very difficult to negotiate space when you don't know what your mandate is or how many spaces or what funding would be available to support those locations. And so those are areas where we could see cost savings. I'm very pleased that this year we're using spaces that already exist in our community and maximizing their usefulness. That is actually a very fiscally responsible way of making sure that known, safe, and welcoming spaces to our community are fully utilized. And so I'm very pleased that that's one of the um, avenues that we're going with. Thank you very much. I have no more questions, but I would like to certainly thank you and the entire team of Arcade for stepping forward and delivering this uh, great service for us. Thank you very much for having the courage and uh, moving forward. Thank you. I don't have many more questions. I do have a couple for staff, though. Uh, through the chair to the staff, I just want to make sure. Um, in July, in the July's report, we had uh, in the HSS uh, account allocated funding of 7.3 million. And is this, uh, the 1.8 million, is this everything that we have left over from that 7.3? Because I do know that we allocated certain amounts to other initiatives, but is that the account it's coming from, the 1.8? Go ahead. Um, through you, Your Worship, uh, what we identified in the July report um, was the unallocated uh, funds through HPP. Uh, since then, there was a report that Council endorsed to increase operator funding for the shelter agencies and other funded agencies, which was uh, a little over $2 million. Um, there were investments made into the first two hubs uh, that have opened. There were um, investments made into the October cold weather report that came forward, again, uh, roughly $2 million. And there have been additional investments made throughout the year that Council has endorsed around community safety and security in the Old East Village and attending to CIR hotspots. So 
Uh, long answer short, short answer long, yes, this is what is remaining out of those funds. Thinking of the last question, I was thinking of if, if I should let someone else talk, but I might as well ask right now to the staff and maybe to Mr. Dickens and also finance. If we were proposing all these four sites, uh, were, were there any conversations potentially where we could, uh, what amounts, funds, accounts we could tap into to finance the complete four sites? Go ahead. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, if we look to, again, uh, get our actuals, uh, the Q2 actuals from our organizations to come in this week as they are uh, trickling in, uh, we could look to reallocate mid-year some of those underspent funds uh, to this initiative. If we do look to, uh, I know it's, it's before committee this evening around the uh, CMHA hubs proposal, um, if we were to reallocate those funds, uh, we would we would bring us roughly to about 3.2 million, which would be enough to cover uh, all four locations. It does, of course, you take money out of what was earmarked for hubs and you put it towards this. It means that if there were proposals coming forward in the new year related to additional hubs, some of those funds would not be available to make those necessary investments as well, which is a strategy this council has endorsed that we pursue uh, as long-term, permanent, sustainable programming as Ms. Campbell has alluded to is, is beneficial. Okay, thank you. And actually last, and it's gonna be more common to my colleagues, just a reminder that last year we did approve, there was a $5 million budget for the winter response and we had 143 beds. This year it will be 150 beds and uh, both what we approved last week, or sorry, a couple of weeks ago and today, it will be 4.9 million. So it will be actually within the kind of the, just so we know, that it's kind of, we are in the same ballpark as we were previous years. So with these amounts, it's not like we are going much higher or actually any higher, higher than we did last year. Thank you very much for answering my questions. I have um, Deputy Mayor Lewis, Councillor McAllister, Councillor Ferreira, and Councillor Frank. So, and Councillor Trasso. Um, Deputy Mayor Lewis, go ahead. Thank you, Worship. So I want to start out by um, saying one thing very, very clearly. Um, this is not last minute. Staff have been working on this since August with community providers. And to characterize it as a last minute, I don't think is fair to our staff or to the community partners who have been trying their best to come up with a solution to this. I wish uh, that there were beds open now that people were housed uh, in November. But I will also say uh, one of the things that uh, makes me less supportive of these asks before us is that May 31st to me is no longer a cold weather response. And I have been consistent in this in prior years. Cold weather response should be ending at the end of the fiscal year. And I said this when we had the Fanshawe and uh, the Atlosa responses with the trailers. I've said this every year since we've done this. These are not meant to be permanent, ongoing, stable sources of funding for long-term contracts. This is meant to be an emergency response only. Uh, I want to indicate to you, Chair, um, I will be asking for all four segments of Part B to be pulled and voted on individually. I served on this council during the Bap First Baptist Church situation across from us in Victoria Park. I will not do that again, and I will not support the 65 beds at William Street. I want to be very clear about that. That is not, to me, an acceptable site or solution to this situation. I will be supportive of the uh, beds at my sister's place. I think that this is an extension um, uh, to keep those beds alive after they were lost by the cancellation of the uh, hub, pro hub proposal. Uh, but I am not prepared, as staff have indicated, to start reallocating funds because I believe there is opportunity still for uh, CMHA or another proponent to still come forward with a revised unsolicited hub proposal. And I do not want to close the door on getting a third or perhaps even a fourth hub stood up uh, in the next six months as the first two start standing up uh, in a couple of weeks. So I'm not going to trade long-term solutions uh, for short-term spending. I will say with the coffee house, uh, I think that this is consistent with uh, moving uh, folks away from now. It's, it's still in an area that has ex experienced its share of challenges. Uh, as we uh, discussed when we were talking about BIA supplementary funding. Uh, but I can generally be supportive of trying this location as a spot uh, that's outside of the OEB and the core 
uh, as an opportunity for a few beds. Um, I'm an East End councillor. I wish that something had been able to be worked out for the Bob Hayward, but it wasn't. Um, and if an operator comes forward still, we will have to consider that. Um, but I don't think at this point uh, we should be counting on that. I, I think that you know, if we're going to see providers come forward, and I do want to say thank you to Arcade for stepping up and saying we will do this, um, because nobody else clearly did. Um, and I think that that does speak to capacity uh, issues out there. Um, but I'm aware of a, another item on the agenda, in a, um, the next item actually, the Salem claimants. Um, and, and I appreciate the letter that we received from Mission Services, highlighting how many of our shelter beds right now are being occupied by asylum claimants. Uh, and I say that because part of this problem is not a problem of uh, our making or of our solution. There are other levels of government who are adding to this challenge right now, and we cannot be expected to backfill that off the property tax rate um, uh, for London taxpayers. Uh, we, we simply can't. We have to look at what level of government does what and who should be carrying the ball for their own choices. So I appreciate that Councillor Rahman's going to let us have a discussion on that on the next item. Um, I know I've only got about a minute left, so I think I've, I've covered off most of this, except that I, I need to emphasize, uh, because I heard people say, well, I'll volunteer, or say that other people have said that they will volunteer. It's great that people are willing to volunteer. Volunteers are not scheduled, paid, trained employees. Um, volunteers often stick up their hand and say, I'll help, but then they don't show up when the shift comes. And we can't run a situation like that based on volunteers. So um, I'm open to hearing what colleagues seconds. think about the ARC uh, aid location on Dundas Street itself, uh, but I will not be supporting the William Street location. Councillor McAllister. Um, <clears throat> thank you, and through the chair. Um, uh, yeah, this is, this is a very tough uh, topic for me. Um, I really do feel for everyone in this situation. Um, I really don't want to see people outside in the winter. Um, in, in terms of what's before us, um, I, I understand in terms of what we're trying to put together. But I do feel like I need to take the opportunity to provide some context. Um, I need to take this opportunity to speak to my ward residents. Um, but by, first, I want to start by uh, thanking uh, Pacific Administration for the work they did in terms of trying to operationalize the Bob, the YMCA for um, stepping forward to, provi uh, to offer a location. Um, I uh, honestly would encourage more people in London to do so. Um, I think location was a bit of an issue in terms of our cold weather response. So to those listening, if you do have locations, um, you know, please step forward. Um, to our community partners, thank you for putting together this plan. Um, in terms of the Bob, I want to start by asking some questions in terms of providing the context around that area. If you're not familiar with it, I just think I need to do this, um, just so my residents understand as well. Um, I think there's a lot of rumors and disinformation that's kind of flying around that location. So my first question uh, to Mr. May Mathers is uh, in terms of we have put an offer in on the Fairmont School, which is adjacent to it, and we will be receiving that report by uh, year end. Is that correct? Okay, go ahead. Through the chair, we've put in an offer. We have not heard back from the school board, so we don't have a timeline on that. Okay, um, thank you. Um, in terms of the Bob itself, is uh, ownership still retained by the YMCA? Just one sec, everyone.
Okay, go ahead. Uh, through you, Your Worship, as it relates to this report, um, the YMCA of Southwestern Ontario still owns the Bob Hayward facility. Okay, and thank you for that. Um, what I'm trying to do is paint a picture and express um, what's coming from my ward in terms of that location. I understand um, it is not currently operationalized for the plan before us, um, but I would like, from my ward's perspective, to see a more longer term per, um, use of that land. Um, the Fairmont is currently, we're, you know, we put an offer, we're waiting to see. Uh, by Councillor, I just... I, I just need to, to just, let me just wrap this up. I will be very concise okay, with just, it. But I'm just... I, 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 just I, I just want you to use your words cautiously about property acquisition. Okay. okay. I am just saying, in terms of a long-term solution, we have always said housing is the solution. It is a large plot of land I do not have a lot of developable land in my ward. Um, maybe you know, Mr. Mathers wants to speak to this more, but that section of East London is the former landfill, not a lot of land. And I hear constantly from my ward, housing, we need the housing. And I understand what's before us in terms of a shelter system, but I just want to make that known and let my residents know that they have been heard in terms of long-term um, use of that land, that that's what they would like to see. In terms of the plan before us, um, I know the coffee house, I've spoken with Karna, you know, you do great work at the coffee house, I appreciate that. I won't speak to the other locations because I'm just speaking to the one on Hamilton Road. And I know uh, the coffee house, um, you know, you serve a vulnerable population, really good reputation. Um, I'm happy to see this. I'm sure you will work well with the ARC. Um, I'm going to save the last bit of my time uh, if I do have any other further questions, but I just wanted to comment on those two things. Okay, just let me pause for a second. Councilman McAllister, could you, I know this is a little unorthodox, could you just join me at the front with the clerks for one sec? Okay, the next speaker I have is Councillor Ferreira. Uh, thank you, and uh, through you. Um, I do appreciate the sentiment uh, here of trying to bring as many beds uh, forward as possible. I, I do know that we need that, and I'm glad to hear that from Council. I also want to look, at our, uh, look to our aid. I appreciate you standing up and being the lead for this, because we do desperately need it. And to staff, I know you guys have been working 24-7, um, right into the early hours in the morning, trying to uh, figure out a plan that actually works. I do want to say, I am also not um, interested in taking funds away from monies that is supposed to be intended for the hubs in our long-term plan. And I do see that we got a $1.8 million budget that we have to work with. So um, I would ideally like to see um, 696 Dundas, 731 Hamilton Road, and 566 Dundas be funded. And I'd like to add some things to that um, as well. Uh, but going to the William Street, uh, my big issue with the William Street is, uh, number one, it won't be open until January 1st, and it could be even later because there's possible delays with, po uh, with possible code enforcement cons or code considerations and other delays that, that are in opening. And I fear that if we were to fund it with 1.472 million, I believe it is, and we have those delays, we'll find ourselves funding a cold weather response and all the money really going there and it opening up maybe midway through um, when the cold, midway through the time frame of the cold weather response. So I, I would like to just um, ask colleagues here just to step a little bit and be a little cautious on that because that is a big risk the way I see it. With the other locations, um, I do see that some of these, lo these locations should be ready to um, start right away. I do understand that uh, the coffee house might have uh, some um, startup um, issues or startup uh, things that they need to do, but I think that it would be wise to uh, fund these three um, 
uh, locations, which would put us under the budget. Because um, as it is right now, if we were to fund everything, it would be over $3 million. And like I said, we only have the $1.8 million. I do want to ask um, to staff for the engagement piece. Um, and I just wanted to know, I do see that there's supposed to be a community engagement from the lead agencies. And I just wanted to know if, what exactly does that entail? What kind of engagement is that? Is that canvassing? Is that um, some type of other format of communication with the community? So uh, I was wondering if staff could uh, give me an update on that. Uh, through the chair, thank you. Through the chair, um, we would be looking to the lead organization, in this case, the ARC, and, and undoubtedly with uh, support from CMHA, uh, to ensure that as part of a funding arrangement that they have a uh, community engagement or neighborhood engagement uh, plan in place. Uh, the more robust or the more the more broad that community engagement becomes, uh, probably becomes an issue of uh, resourcing and staffing for these organizations to be able to do that uh, extensive of work on top of trying to stand up and open the spaces to get folks in out of the cold. So uh, we do not at this point have, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, a detailed engagement plan from uh, these organizations, but they have uh, committed, and the ARC has committed that that would be uh, part of their uh, onboarding and opening is to ensure they're engaging with the neighborhood and also ensuring that they're accessible if, uh, through their operations, the neighbors uh, have questions or concerns. Those are uh, practices that uh, the ARC and CMHA currently also have in place for existing programs. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the time uh, going to May 31st. When I originally read the report, I too uh, also thought that maybe it would go a little bit longer. And I my original thoughts was perhaps maybe opening at 7 rather than 9, so allowing people to get off the street much sooner when we need it to, and maybe uh, shortening um, the end date. So I just wanted to ask on the end date, um, how, um, how much is that end date required from the community side? Uh, through the chair, uh, the encampment uh, table that is part of our whole of community system response, uh, those organizations, those frontline outreach workers um, have made it really clear that uh, that is a, that's a big priority for them is that uh, services do extend into the spring, into the end of May. Uh, that's not a scientific end date, but it is acknowledged that uh, March is fairly unpredictable when it comes to weather. April's often quite wet uh, and usually quite cold. Uh, and as Ms. Campbell alluded to, when you're, when you're recruiting staff, uh, you would want to make sure you have some runway for that onboarding and support pieces. Uh, but primarily, it's around the services to vulnerable people. And that came out of the encampment table is uh, to have an acknowledgement that some services need to remain in place until the end of May. It's not really inconsistent from what we've done in previous cold weather responses. We've uh, been in positions where we extend services because March and April are, are so uh, wet and cold. Um, in the previous year, uh, the money that was allocated, uh, some services were in place uh, 12 months, for example. So, uh, but yes, this came out of the, the community feedback that May was pretty critical. Thank you for that. Uh, with uh, the consideration from the 9 p.m. to the 7 p.m. start time, um, is there any issues that might arise if we were to direct for a 7 p.m. start time rather than the 9 p.m. I do see that if we were to fund the three locations, we'd have an additional, I think, $233,000 uh, left over. So I'm trying to think of, do we have still the funding uh, to do that? Thank you, and, and through the chair, we'd obviously have to go back to the agencies and, and find out if that's even an option, because they do run other programs um, during the day at all of these locations. So um, we would make sure that those don't conflict with, with what you're proposing, but um, I would say it's something we could have a conversation with the organizations on. Okay, thank you for that. Um, is there, I saw that there was a motion on the floor, but has that, is that motion been seconded? It has? Okay. Um, so I guess I gotta wait for that motion to be voted on before I could put one on, or I could make an uh, amendment. Councillor, given some of your comments where you're supportive of some components to the other, I've already been asked by one member of council to divide part B into the segments. So that means some could be approved, some could not be approved, depending on how members of council vote. So um, I, I so far, that seems to delineate it for everybody's decision-making at, at this point, um, but I can certainly divide it further 
if uh, if, you, if if that's not compatible with where you're you're looking to go. No, that's okay. We can keep it that way. But I do want to add an amendment to that, and that would be the amendment for the community engagement part. I would like to see a, a little bit more of a definitive um, area that we that we provide community engagement with, because I do know that um, just from my personal experience. Um, my workload, I don't want to be too biased on this, but my workload will sky, could skyrocket or it will go up. And I, I do have uh, some other areas that I'd like to focus on. So I think just to be prudent and look towards the future and be proactive, I would like to put a little community engagement piece into that. I do have some language that I sent to the clerk. So just the part C of that, and that would be um, to uh, direct uh, the ARC for community engagement um, for a 500 meter radius from the location. And I do hope that um, I would like to see also uh, some type of contact card that uh, the community engagement would give to residents in the area. Um, just contact cards to be able to contact the ARC uh, for anything that may come up and just to know um, what exactly is, is going on within 500 meters of, of the location. Okay, so um, I'm not going to make that a new Part C. Um, and what you said now is a little bit different than what you um, sent to the clerks. The way to do this would be to amend the thing to add a new Part E, because some people may want to vote for C, but not the piece you're adding. So this would allow it to work both ways. And what you had submitted was that civic administration be directed to include in the contracts noted in Part B, a requirement for community engagement and canvassing to be undertaken by uh, the, the Arcade Street Mission with the canvassing to include residents, and at that time you said a 300 meter radius of each service location, and provide a contact card that includes information on cold weather response and contact information for the program. That's what you said before, but I think when you said it just now, you said 500 meters, so. I did say 500 meters. Uh, that was just a reconsideration, just uh, thinking through it and going, um, just trying to capture how far I think uh, would be the best um, use of the community engagement. I am. Um, up for consideration on a different radius. So I, I do want to start okay. with the 500 meter okay. radius right now. So, so first, you can make that amendment, like, because what's on the floor is the councillors put, um, and because the committee has put the staff recommendation, w which has all four of them, um, with the small addition to D, which is fine. So there's only there's no amended motion. The councillor's not amending the motion. That's just the motion on the floor. You can amend that to add this part E, and all you're saying, so what's the only thing different from what you submitted to the clerks is you wanted to say 500 meters. Um, uh, okay, so I need to see if there's a seconder for that piece. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Lewis, there was a couple of seconders there. So, so we're now gonna shift the debate. Although I have a speaker's list, I know, I know Councilor Frank, Trosal, Pribble, and Raman are on it. I'm gonna shift to the, I'm gonna hold that for kind of the main motion, and I'm gonna shift to an amendment list because the amendment is now moved and seconded. Um, we're gonna get that up so people can see it. And we're gonna be just talking now about the addition of E, which is this community engagement piece and the card and that. So for the, are you, so are you good now? Or do you have anything else to add? You got a little bit of time left. I do have a little bit to add, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's with the, con with the contact card. So with this type of community engagement, um, like I don't wanna be too, um, I don't want to direct too much, but I would like um, the community engagement to involve clearly um, the operation and what to expect uh, and um, just being realistic with it. And the contact card, I think, is very important to providing that piece of literature to residents in the area um, so that they know who to contact uh, when they need to, I think would be a good uh, use um, for the community engagement piece. So those two parts are very important. The radius itself, I did say 500. I know I originally said 300. I, like I said, I'm agreeable to find another radius if, if that's the will of council. Um, but uh, that's that's good. That's where I'll st uh, stop for now. Okay, so uh, I'm going to make this easy. It's an amendment. You can amend an amendment. So if someone wants to amend the radius, it's not counter to the purpose here. So I'll leave that up for someone to do sh should they so choose, but I'm gonna continue with the speakers list that started and Councillor Hopkins is first on that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the amendment, I do have a question around the radius, 300, 500. I know we normally do 125 meter radius when it comes to public participation. It's a planning, I just wanna have a better understanding because I would think the radius here is important in terms of expense and, um, the amount of time and effort 
that goes into that. So I, I, I think we need to understand exactly uh, what the councillor would like to see here in, in terms of radius and um, because that will depend on my uh, support or not. Okay, I'll let the councillor answer that. Um, I, and I don't think we need staff to comment. Like the, the yes, there are official radiuses in the planning act. We're not bound by any of that for something like this. So councillor Ferreira. So I did start with the 120 meter radius and then I went to the 300 and then I went to the 500. And my intention just increasing that radius would be to ensure and just kind of hedge our bets, uh, mitigate our risk on make sure, just to make sure that we can cap, we capture everybody, every party who might be interested in knowing and having that knowledge. So that's why I just increased the radius, uh, just to have that bigger net to catch, just so we, so I feel more confident that we've informed um, everybody that should be informed. So it is the 500 that the that you would like to see. Yes, that's what's in the motion. Um, and if someone wants to change that, they can amend it. I have uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis next. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And on the amendment, uh, thank you, Councillor Ferrer, for bringing this forward uh, because I concur. It is important uh, for the neighborhoods in the surrounding area to know who to contact, uh, what numbers those are. Um, and that's not just uh, in terms of the services being offered uh, by the ARC uh, at these locations. Uh, but I think that, that needs to include, you know, the Service London contact number, um, the the non-emergency police number, those sorts of things, um, because when we see these sorts of, of locations established, there are sometimes um, what I'm going to call spillages of issues out into the neighborhood, um, and whether that's people who couldn't get a bed that night, whether that is um, other behavior uh, of individuals. Um, who frankly are seeking to take advantage of people who might be seeking uh, shelter spaces, um, other conditions, some sort of piece where folks know uh, what's happening here and, and what numbers to call for what services. Um, and I know we have uh, some portals on our website as well, but um, I concur with the councillor. Um, the people who suddenly get their inboxes filled with questions are the people around this horseshoe. Um, and we are not 24-7. Uh, and on a Saturday afternoon when somebody has a question, they need to know who to reach out to and contact. Um, and it might be on a Saturday afternoon in an urgent situation. So they need to know who to reach out to and contact. Um, I, um, and I will say I prefer the larger radius in this case because this is not, you know, a planning application where a building is going to be built and then the construction is going to go away. Um, there will be a changing dynamic uh, around these sites uh, for a number of weeks. Um, and what that looks like, you know, quite frankly, I don't think any of us can fairly know. Um, we have some ideas, I'm sure. I'm sure our partners uh, in the gallery have some ideas, but I, I want the public to know because it is important that at the end of the day, they know who to reach out to. Um, and a simple postcard in a mailbox is a great uh, tool sometimes when people don't know where else to turn. I have uh, Councillor Trossau, then Councillor Pribble. I have always, uh, through the chair, I always have difficulty with these numbers, trying to figure out where that arc's going to fall, and if it goes through someone's house, do they get the notice uh, or, or, or not? Why don't we just say what area we wanted to go to? Why don't we just say the area bounded by this street, this street, this street, and this street, and let's err on the side of getting some additional notices out, because if we're doing things like introducing people to Service London, there, there's positive things for doing that. Any, anyway, uh, is there a neighborhood association there who might, who, who might help us with the distribution? Um, and I'd also say that where do we think, if people are not going to be able to get in and they're there, where are they likely to go? And let's, 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 let's just figure that out, too. Are they going to go to Mecklen Park? Are they going to go uh, somewhere down Central? I, I, don't, I don't know. But the, I, I think the important thing I want to add to this discussion is let's decide what neighborhood we want to send it to and just say it's the area bounded by and not worry about the meters. Yeah, that's it. Okay, I have Councillor Pribble. 
I would support this if this if this was kind of a September October one thing and second thing is if this was permanent and not temporary. I actually have a question through the chair to Ms. Campbell. Is this whatever the radius is having all these and again three potentially four locations and now you and your staff canvassing all these homes is it actually feasible? So go ahead. Thank you through the chair. I'm contemplating that. Uh, we do have a robust community engagement strategy that we have employed many times over and have examples of how the community engages. This weekend, we hosted an open house and had many community members come through from in Oldies Village talking about our winter response plan at 696 Dundas Street. We also, um, when operating out of First St. Andrews, have learned from that experience to canvas the neighborhood. It was a one city block radius that we did on all sides. Um, and that was in person, knocking on doors, talking to businesses, offering an outreach card and a meeting. We had a meeting before opening services, explaining what was happening, how we would provide support. Um, we also have included in our budgets a community safety role that involves those transition times when people are coming in and out of space and um, being present and visible outside of the space before people can get in uh, and also um, anticipating some of the challenges that we see typically, the cleanup or in the area, uh, disposal of things, what to do when people can't come in, redirecting people. Those are every year's challenge. Um, that's not new for this response. And so we have developed those strategies. Some of that is anticipated. I am concerned about five, like a full kilometer. I'm just kind of picturing like how many, I don't really know how many houses that is and what that resource would look like. But certainly engaging neighbors is incredibly important to the success of any intervention. Um, and we do already have an outreach card that we give out to our neighbors and do respond in Old East Village. I think the BIA folks could even maybe speak to how we respond to our, our neighbors as best as we can. Um, I am questioning a number of things, like how quick would you want a response? How, what does that response look like? Am I responsible for the neighbors, you know, yards and cleaning up around their yards as well as uh, sort of our own locational uh, responsibility, which I'm very familiar with taking care of our own location and making sure that that is clean and, and maintained, but trying to take care of where any person who may be seeking services or not and all of what may or may not be... Um, thought of as part of the consequence of having services in a neighborhood is, is a little bit out of the scope of what we can do. What we always do and are consistent in doing is responding to a person in distress. And that is something that we can do. Um, if that was needed 24 seven, like even the overnight hours, my understanding is that we don't have any outreach teams that operate all the way through the night. Um, that those are emergency services, but if we needed to establish that for this winter response, that would potentially be an additional cost. Thank you. And based on your answer and being end of November and also this being a temporary measure, I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Okay, I have um, Councilor Rahman next. <laughs> Thank you and through you. Um, thank you for this discussion, Councillor, and uh, I appreciate that you're sharing the concern based on the workload that you experience as well, because I do uh, know that you've shared that before, that how it can be considerable, especially when we're making changes like this uh, that impact your neighborhood, so I understand that. Um, I just want to comment on two things. One is we are talking about this being the responsibility of Arcade due to the overnight spaces, but most of these places are either operating as day spaces or operating in some other capacity. So I think that uh, some of that engagement could maybe be shared a little bit more between a number of organizations, and I'm seeing heads nodding up the top. Um, so I do think that that um, there's a willingness perhaps to, to explore that on some other levels. And, and uh, I, do, I do see the value of providing the direct neighbors and as many neighbors with information, but again, worry about the 500 meters a little bit more, um, just because I wanna make sure that, I, I agree with Councillor Trasso that I think it might be better to define neighborhood blocks or streets, because I do think that we might be uh, un unintendedly, maybe we miss somebody or we miss because of the radius, but we should have gotten to them. So I just want to be a little bit more, um, more specific about that. And I think we have the opportunity to do that since we're at committee, 
we can be more specific before we get to council. So the intention is that we want to over communicate how to get in touch with agencies. Absolutely agree. Give them good information. Absolutely agree. Do we need to get down to the minutia of how many meters and where exactly today? I think we can straighten all that out before council. So I don't know that we have to be that prescriptive. And I think it allows us to have some good dialogue with the people that are doing the good work in these spaces already, because some of this may be some things that they've already engaged in, in terms of the day spaces or in, in the other services that they provide. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, and through the chair, can I ask what the timing expectation is on this? Is this to be done early? This organization has a lot of work to do. Uh, uh, there's no timing in the motion, so um, I'll look, look to Councillor Ferreira to comment on that. Uh, thank you. I had my hand up because I did want to respond to some questions. So the way I was intending for this would be... So I want you just to respond to Councillor Stevenson's question. You're next I, on the list to yep. respond to the other ones. Okay. Yep. Um, I, it, for the timing, it was supposed to be for the first point of contact. Um, so it's not something that I would foresee ongoing continually. It would be something to have a first point of contact. That's why I would think that providing the contact card would help something like that. The timing on... Um, when to get that done, I would believe it would be in the first few weeks, or depending on how long it will take um, to canvas. Um, I think that's as far as your question went. I did want to comment on the other one, but I won't right now. Yeah, you can, you're next on the list, so you can do that then. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. I'm struggling with this for a few reasons. One is it's putting the requirement on an organization that is already taking on quite a task. And I think it takes away from the, the focus, which should be on the people who are in desperate and dire need right now. And uh, as Councillor Rahman said, many of these locations are, already have daytime programs. I, I've not heard this kind of concern when agencies were abruptly put into Old East Village. And, and to even hear people talk about the concerns about spillage, um, I, I'm, I'm finding it a little shocking, honestly, to hear people who have, you know, expressed moral outrage at some of the concerns that have been expressed, and now all of a sudden there's a lot of concern when it's November 21st, it's winter, these people need beds, and um, I would like to make a recommendation that if this is something that we want to do, that city administration, that we take it on, we issue the contact cards out through some kind of mailing, and that we don't ask the organization to do this. So I'd like to put forward an amendment that says whatever it is that Councillor Ferrer is looking for, but that it, we take it on as civic administration and not this organization. So hold on a sec. So that's, with the utmost respect, um, that is not what Councillor Ferreira has suggested. That is a very substantial change in who would bear the cost of it. So what I'm going to suggest is you can do that, but you defeat Councillor Ferreira's motion first, and then you can put that on as the alternative. Um, because uh, the, the fundamental difference I see here is who pays, who does the work. Like It is, it is a very different uh, approach. So I'm going to say it's counter to what uh, Councillor Ferreira, like uh, amending the radius, that's still within it. but changing who pays and who does it, that's fine, but the process is defeat the current amendment, propose a new amendment with a different process. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, then can I add to the, I still would like this one to fail and to have civic administration do it, but otherwise can we put something in here that says we will fund Arcade to do this? So, I don't see that as counter um, because, uh, you know, unless Councillor, it's not what Councillor Ferrer says, but um, adding an additional service to the organization, I think is what you're saying is you would like to add some cost to support them in doing that. Um, I would see, I think I don't see that as counter at this point. So I would see that as, um, as a complimentary amendment to the amendment. So that one's okay. Um, I just, we need to work on some wording on that. Councilor Rahman has a clarification question. Just let me go to that. 
Uh, thank you, and through you. My understanding is this is a procurement and emergency approval. So what's the difference between a procurement and emergency approval, and why can we add dollars to it? That's a fair question. I'll go to Councillor, uh, or um, Councillor, <laughs> Deputy City Manager Barbon. I, I heard the first part about So we're starting to change the terms point. and adding, like, duties and costs, and this is an emergency procurement. So what we need and what the council is asking for, which I, I will think is a, is a good point, is are we out of line with our ability to do this? Or like should we be doing a different process? Should we want to engage in essentially what we're starting to discuss now? And that's with respect to your worship specifically to this motion, right? Well, that and the idea, like basically the concept that there's a proposal submitted with costs we're now changing the responsibilities and potentially the costs of it or adding our own funding to it. Like we're changing some terms. So we just want to make sure that under the uh, under our procurement policy and the, the way that we're, this is coming forward, can we do that is the question. So thank you for the question through your worship. So because we are utilizing the procurement and emergencies um, section of that, what that does is it allows um, specifically the reporting and the work to be able to be done to give staff the utmost flexibility to go now and finalize the contracts. And essentially, we're not getting, council is directing us to do the work, but the actual approvals of the expenditures themselves will be done through civic administration, and then we will be reporting back with that amount. So it buys us a little bit of time in terms of finalizing the information and reporting back to council, given the ability to move forward with this, knowing in advance that council knows what civic administration will be finalizing. I don't think that is, I don't think that's clear for where the, where the councilor is trying to ask. Go ahead. So through your worship, based on that, that would allow this to occur and that direction can be given and civic administration will be able to take that back and finalize based on the direction. Okay, so that's the answer. So yes, possible. I'll go back to uh, Councillor Stevenson because you're looking to make an amendment. Yes, so it could be something like at the end uh, put in funding for such or be directed to include in the contracts funding for those things?
So, Councillor Stevenson, you, you want to change this to a mail out because currently the basis of the motion is that it's, it's, it's canvassing that's being done. So uh, we're interpreting, interpreting you as saying, adding the cost is like, say, we're paying for the cost of the cards, but you're saying you want to change it so that it's now a mail out from civic administration or from the city of London to wherever, to the area. Is, is, is it easier to say, vote this down and do yes, a mail out by civic administration? Easier. Then yeah. I'll do that. So um, I, I'll save us this trouble. We have a long night. Yeah. Um, my request is that we vote this down and then redo it if Councillor Frere wants this information to be a mail out done by civic administration so that we're not asking our, uh, they need to hire a hundred people and train them and I really think we get to honor that and set them up to win and take on this responsibility here. Okay, uh, next speaker on this is Councillor Ferreira. Thank you. Um, the report itself did speak to the community engagement component and I'm uh, just going back to Mr. Dickens, that involves a canvassing component as well, correct? Mr. Dickens. Uh, through you, Your Worship, where we've tried our best is to um, mimic or align with the hub's implementation plan. And that's why these are not recommendations. These are options for council because we consider the geographic locations. <clears throat> we've tried it in, in many ways to align ourselves with that. The community engagement for the whole community system response has looked entirely different. It's been community consultation sessions, open houses, drop-in sessions, uh, launching a website, an online portal, all of those types of things. In this regard, we would be looking at um, direct neighborhood engagement in that immediate surrounding area. It's what CMHA and, and the ARC do currently. The ARC canvases the city block that surrounds their property. They, they engage with folks. I, I can't speak to its effectiveness or, or what the response time looks like. But if this motion is to distribute information, um, with contact details, certainly that is uh, a component we can assist with as civic administration, without a doubt. Uh, it would then become clear expectations around should the neighborhood call that contact card, what, are, what is council and or this motion anticipating those expected results or response time would look like from the provider. Thank you for that. Um, that's how I interpreted as well, the direct communication with uh, residents. So that's why I thought we should be a little more prescriptive on exactly how that community engagement piece I exists. I, I figured it's in the report, so let's make it a little more clean and concise because I do understand that other agencies have done uh, canvassing as well, but I would like to know the area that is covered with respect to the radius versus neighborhood streets. I, I am okay with changing uh, a radius component as long as we do capture um, the appropriate amount of houses. The reason I went to the radius part first is because the coffee house, if you look at the street, it's kind of on an angle. So you don't really get that block. It doesn't fit very well. So that's why I did go that route. But like I said, um, just to have that community engagement piece, just so we can be proactive about it, that's really um, what I'm looking for. Originally, I thought the canvassing should be done by us, councillors ourselves. Um, I know that I can canvas that area in less than a day. I know I could do all four locations in a day myself, but I didn't want to put that on us because I didn't think it would be, uh, you know, considering the workload that we have already. So that's why I wanted to bring that into that. But like I said, with the radius component piece, if we do want to change that, uh, we can. And if council is willing, and if council wants to do the community engagement piece ourselves, I'm more than happy to do that as well. Okay, I have Councillor Trosau next. <clears throat> Could I ask the uh, Deputy City Manager who's, who's in charge of Service London whether, whether the appropriate um, buttons could be added to Service London so we could be using the Service London portal to do, to do this work, which has the additional benefit of giving people information about Service London? Go ahead. Uh, through the chair, I will have to bring that information back. I'll have to talk with the service manager of what can be added and how all that would play out. Could you bring that back by the council? Because it just, it, just, it just seems to me that if we can incorporate this into something we're doing anyway, 
part of a program that we're trying to do regular outreach for, especially something that council, counselors are very keen to promote Service London because it does, it does help us when people know how they can use Service London. And it helps the frontline staff in the counselor's office, too, because uh, although those things just get forwarded. So I think by putting some very clear buttons on Service London, maybe a little note, um, we, 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 you know, it's going to end up in someone's mailbox. I don't care if it's, uh, if it's, going, if it's going through uh, Canada Post or whether a volunteer is putting it in the mailbox. Um, the, only, the only thing would be apartment buildings. But let's use Service London if we can use Service London. Councillor Ferrer, you got, you got a tiny bit of time left, but go ahead. Oh, and then I'll go to Councillor Lehman. He's just holding his pen up. No, sir, you got to be careful. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, through you. Um, I do see that there is a will to engage with the community, however the form is. So if, if the councillors who want to do that can just articulate that a little bit more, I, if the seconder is willing, I will pull that as long as there is that community engagement piece. So before I do that, if you would be willing to just speak to that, and I do want to look at the seconder as well to make sure the seconder would be okay with that before anything. Um, so the seconder can agree, but we all have to agree to let you drop the motion because it's in the care and control of the, 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 the committee now that it's been made, moved and seconded. So if you're looking to withdraw that, that's fine. But you had a, what, what did you ask first? Are you looking to do that now? I, before I would do that, I just wanted to know that there is something uh, that is intended to be put on the floor that does uh, does do what it is that we're trying to do, just that community engagement. So if 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 you, if I could, through you, to the councillors who are willing to do this, if they could just describe what idea they have for the community engagement part. Deputy Mayor Lewis, and then I'm adding myself to the speakers list. Yeah, let, let me try and help here. Um, can I suggest that colleagues... We are talking about adding um, some community engagement, some information sharing, uh, but we're trying to wordsmith it on the floor. And we have an opportunity to bring something back at council um, that gives us all an opportunity to just reflect. So I would encourage the committee to allow the withdrawal, not to not to for none of us to put anything else on the floor with this, and to go away and think about it and come back to the council if there is a desire to include a, com a, a communications contact card strategy of some sort, think about that in the runway we have be between tonight and council um, and, and just make the decisions on what we are going to fund tonight in terms of beds. Okay, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna speak. Um, so I'm gonna turn the chair over to Councillor Lehman. Uh, go ahead, Mayor. So I'll just be clear. This um, is part of the reason why we have long meetings. Um, everybody's got the same intent. We're trying to overcomplicate it with a whole bunch of pieces. We have ward budgets. It's very cheap to print cards. Like, I will come and help the councillors who have this, like, drop cards in their neighborhood. Like, I'm, I'm willing to spend some time doing that. Like, we, this is not complicated. We can go help with this. So I support everybody just letting this motion be withdrawn. You've got colleagues who want to support. We all care about this issue. Print some cards. Ask some of us to help. I'm willing to help. So I think that that is a way where we can go out there. I'll go with Councillor Stevenson. I'll go with Councillor McAllister. I'll go with Councillor Barrera. Book some time off. We can work together, get some cards out, information to the public. That's all we're trying to do here so people have a contact card. Design something, I'll help you get it out. Uh, I don't think we need to overcomplicate this and have the meeting go longer than it needs to go. I'll return the chair to Mayor. Councillor Ferreira. Thank you. You said that on the record, so I'll hold it to you. Um, <laughs> I, if that is the case, then I would be more than happy to do that so we can work offline for that. So. As, uh, just looking at the seconder again, we're good to pull that. I'll pull that, and I guess we need to vote on that. Okay, so does everybody agree that the council can withdraw the motion? No? You want? Okay, okay. Okay, so no one objects to the withdrawing of the amendment. So the engagement piece is not going to be extra. Part E is gone. There's already some engagement built in. We've had a discussion. People can be held to their public record statements, and uh, uh, we can move on. So that, that brings us back to the main motion um, that Councillor Stevenson put on the floor, of which I still had people on a list, and Councillor Frank, although I'm not sure if you remember, you're next. I'm here. Um, perfect. So thanks for that debate. 
Uh, I want to start off by saying thank you to Arcade for stepping up um, and showing a lot of leadership, I think, in this area. Uh, I think we would have all loved to see perhaps more services, but again, as everyone has already said, I think this is an indication of a, a very overly burdened, burdened um, system. So appreciate your leadership and stepping up. And you have a couple questions. So just in regards to hiring so many people so quickly and having to train them all, I was just hoping that either staff or um, someone from Arcade would be able to highlight what training people receive, like crisis intervention and uh, Narcan training and that kind of thing. And if, if those um, if those are written out and, and planned to roll out with staff. I'm just gonna look to our staff first before, do you want me to, you, Arcade? Okay, I'll go to Arcade, go ahead. See, okay, we just you need to turn okay. your microphone back on. Sorry. Okay, now you're good. Go okay, ahead. thank you, and through the chair. Um, the standards for training have been set. Like Kevin said, we've been trying to follow the hubs um, criteria. And so right in the contracts that we actually already have signed with the day program that we provide, we have a list of training that we are required uh, under contract to provide. That includes, I may not get all of them because I don't have the contract right in front of me, but you know, it, it is trauma-informed practice. We actually did that this morning at our staff meeting. Uh, we do um, harm reduction. We do uh, Narcan, certainly as part of that. Um, we do uh, Indigenous cultural safety. We do um, training on de-escalation. Sorry? Aggress yeah, managing aggressive behavior. So we do have... Um, NVCI counts with our organization. Everyone has to have first aid and CPR. It's a term of uh, employment. We do provide, and we've actually included in our budget, as I mentioned, that's some of the dollars that, that are going forward. Part of the benefit of partnering with CMHA is actually having some of their wonderful training that they do with their staff and having their training team help us to do even more training. And um, some of that includes assist and mental health first aid and a couple of other things that we're hoping to provide to staff. So we have some required training, we have additional training, and then we actually have our own um, empowerment model that involves our community members uh, participating in creating safe spaces and participating in um, designing our, our services. And so we're really pleased to be able to not only provide training for our staff, but our volunteers, our community members that access services. And so that helps us to provide those safe places for people. Thank you. And through the chair, I did have one other follow-up question. Um, I just wanted to confirm um, that, uh, I assume this is the case, but I wanted to just triple check that everyone is welcome um, to use the shelter as long as there is obviously bed and staff available um, and that my understanding is Arcade um, is like in its roots a uh, religious-based organization, which I think is lovely, um, but that there's no like mandatory religious services that people have to participate in in order to gain access to the services. Go ahead. Again, through the chair, thank you for the opportunity to answer. We may be motivated by God's love, but it is certainly not a requirement of service, um, not even our staff. It's not a requirement for anybody who works with our organization. Uh, what is um, really critical to note is um, even though the location on William Street is called Bishop Cronin, which is a church location, the area of the building that we are actually looking at operating is a non-religious space. It was a daycare uh, a fellowship hall and uh, office spaces, we recognize that there can be some triggering elements. And that's another reason why we don't have one location option. It is really important that there be multiple options and that people can choose where they feel safe and welcome. There's a women's only location at my sister's place. Coffee House has a well-established relationship with the community they serve and that, that will lend itself to welcoming and safe places for people who access that service. Arcade is well known to the community that accesses that space. And we, we are aware of the uh, trauma that can be um, put upon our community members if we, if we push a religious agenda. That is not the intention in any way, shape, or form. Perfect. Thank you so much for those answers. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm, um, given, given that, and um, just that people are able to uh, attend whatever services they need um, and whatever you are able to provide, people are able to to go to. So I appreciate all the information. I'll be supporting all four locations. Um, and I, again, uh, echo everyone's sentiments and saying thank you for, for stepping up to this plate. Next on the list is Councillor Trosau. 
Thank you, through the chair. That's a wonderful segue to what I'm going to say, which is I'm going to be supporting all four of the locations. I don't want to start unraveling this right now. I think they fit together very nicely. There are some problems with some of them, but I, I, I think I think it's nothing we can't meet. One question I have is, if we if we go over budget and spend money now that we would have spent on the hubs, and we now see we have an opportunity for the hubs again, that doesn't preclude us from going back to the source of the hub funding and asking to make up that difference, does it? So, Councillor, I, I want to be clear about the motion on the floor. There is no specific source of financing for this. So, essentially, what the motion is, is spend more than has been allocated, and that would be a challenge for the end of the year and a, a sur surplus option, unless civic administration comes back with some of the options that um, Mr. Dickens suggests. But we have provided no specific direction on the source of financing on this yet. But Mr. Dickens, you can comment. Uh, through you, uh, Your Worship, we, uh, yes, we would look to uh, find a source of funding to allocate to all four options uh, to fully fund them. If we are required to, as part of that investigative work, to reallocate funding that was earmarked for one of the hubs, uh, that is through our HPP funding. And so, yes, it would, it would not be available uh, to its fullest extent should another proposal of any kind come forward for a hub. Um, so just to be clear that the funding we're looking to reallocate was actually through our HPP. Okay, well, um, through the chair, I'm, I'm supporting all four because I think we have a emergency situation on our hands. And I know that the use of the term emergency can be controversial here, but what would it, what would it getting cold and what with people being outside? And um, I'm, looking, I'm looking towards the maximum amount of relief that we can provide um, right now. And I think that these are all issues that, 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 that can be adjusted down the line. So I would be very hesitant to remove one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the prongs of this uh, very well thought out and consolidated um, and coordinated approach. So I'll be supporting uh, the package. I, I appreciate what was said before about the both from Councillor Ferreira and Councillor Stevenson in terms of um, additional, additional community um, uh, outreach, which I think is something that should be done anyway. So um, that, that, that's it. I thought this was a good discussion. And um, I'm looking forward to these coming uh, online and up and running as soon as possible so people can get out of the cold. Thank you very much. Councillor Pribble, and just so people know, then Rahman, Hopkins, and Lehman. Thank you, Sruder Chair. I do have one more question for Ms. Campbell. If you might. Thank, Thank you. you. You can ask. I'll direct it. So you're going through the chair. So Sorry, ask the question and I'll, I'll find you the person to answer. Perfect, thank you. I'm just curious if she could let us know why does she believe uh, the location, the site for 3-2 William would be beneficial for our community? Go ahead. Thank you, through the chair. We have looked at that space very specifically. First of all, we know that the number of spaces that we're recommending or able to provide is not enough for the community um, that we serve in that area. And when we don't have spaces available, it does create uh, an unsafe environment for our community members who are, who are accessing services. People vie for the same spaces. It does create sometimes violence, even at, though we do a referral process, people will try to um, position themselves to be getting space. And it is always a challenge for staff when you're closing a program or turning over space and not having additional uh, resources to offer to people. And so um, the walkability of that location, the actual infrastructure that it's on three separate floors and there's bathrooms on each floor and there's accessibility to the outside that is um, separate but also fenced off is really helpful um, in terms of people management. Um, there's kitchen facilities which allow us to take care of sort of the, the daily needs of people. And um, with it being a short-term intervention, uh, we also wanted to look at the potential for it to be a long-term location, should that be necessary. I talked about the costs involved of not having sort of places that you can extend at. And um, one of the things that came up at looking at the Bob Hayward location is that there was a March 31st um, end date to that. So to staff up, get that working, and, and then have to close it, that would be very difficult. Being able to extend service till the end of May per the encampment table, 
having the opportunity to potentially extend that space if necessary, if it was uh, in service to the community. Um, that location is available for a renewable lease for up to two years. The cost of the lease, we were given a, a list of locations where we could um, seek locations and the cost per square foot is, is about 50 cents at this location as compared to locations that we uh, looked at and were turned down for that were about 12 to 18 to $20 a square foot. Um, so it just seemed like a good fiscally responsible location. It's um, logistically possible since we prepare the meals and we share resources between our, our 696 location and this location. And um, we felt that it supported the need of this winter's response in terms of walkability, getting people out of encampments, enticing them to a location that they're familiar with and um, supporting safety for that community at that space. Uh, additionally, we didn't have all the knowledge that we would have needed to make a, a a stronger plan for other locations that have been discussed tonight. And so this was the location that we knew that we had the relationship and that we could put a, a solid plan together that we felt confident in. That is why it is before you. Okay, Councilor Pro, we got a bit of time left. Because remember, you spoke before, although it was a while ago. One more follow-up. 30 beds in uh, at your current location plus 65 at this potentially this location would be 95. Is it potentially to, if I were to see that we address the 602 Queens, the people that are outside and the people on the parking lot, that potentially these individuals who have no roof over their head, that they could be actually potentially housed and we would resolve this situation? That's the hope, isn't it? <laughs> That's the hope. I mean, the reality is that the number of beds that are being recommended, including the 65, is a far cry from the demand that we know exists. Um, we need to entice some people from encampments that are not at, right behind the ARC location. We need to entice some people who are not doing well health-wise into indoor spaces. Um, the demand is high and that's why we're looking at this whole of community response and that's why you're investing so heavily into these long-term solutions. So I don't want to pretend like this is the difference maker, but this is a difference maker for 65 people. That's the reality. This is the difference maker for those folks. It's the same answer for, is it too late for beds? No, it's not too late for beds because it, there's so many people who need them. And so for the same reasons, these are really important um, considerations that are before you. And I, I appreciate the challenge of it, but that's, that's the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Rahman. Uh, thank you, and through you, thank you for the last set of questions because that was actually really helpful um, in framing some of the conversation and getting some further answers. Um, again, a big thank you to Arcade for your continued support for the cold weather winter response, and I can't remember how many years it's been. I think it was four. This is your fourth year um, of showing leadership in this area, so thank you for that. I think uh, as a city, we're grateful for the fact that you continue to step forward. Thank you to your board for taking this time to be deliberate and intentional in the way that you can provide support. And I understand uh, that, you know, you're, you're saying to us, here's what we can do and here's where we can do it. And here's where we can do it and we're the only ones that can do it. So I think that we have to be very careful as well because right now you are the only group that's uh, able to provide this service uh, like this. And I, and I want to say that um, I think it was really... Um, smart to go to the existing locations that already were offering day spaces to look for that partnership and that opportunity to provide those night spaces. And I, I see, see the value in, in that approach uh, as we move forward. Um, we're talking about the way this is going to be funded. And I know that in the past, there have been times when perhaps you've been waiting for money to come in from the city. And so my thought today is, is there a way that we can make this feel stable for you from now until May 31st? Uh, that it doesn't perhaps feel like there is uh, um, 
there's there's going to be a, a second iteration of where that funding is going to come from. Um, so I want to make sure that whatever arrangement we we are looking at, that it feels uh, as a stable investment for that time period of which you're 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 going to be seeking that funding. Because I can imagine how difficult that work is. Uh, so that's what I'm looking to to do for today. Um, I want to go back to the uh, location and some of the comments in the report about code uh, issues and potential challenges with the, um, the William Street location. And I'm just wondering if our staff could help me to better understand what that looks like and if the January 8th date is attainable. Thank you, and through the chair, I, uh, I will start uh, this conversation, and I'm surrounded by uh, colleagues who may be able to, to, to chime in should they feel necessary. Um, but uh, so th the, the point was made in the report that there is still some work from the organizational perspective. ARC has not reached out to the city uh, planning and development department to kind of have this conversation. So um, that is sort of still needs to occur. Um, I did speak quite uh, briefly with our planning and development folks, and they had identified a few pieces um, that I have uh, have we'll be sharing with, with Ms. Campbell um, as I make the connection to that team. So conversations need to happen. Uh, I can't say exactly what that is going to entail until um, the, the planning development team meet with, uh, with the ARC and understand exactly uh, the proposal. Okay, thank you. And, and I assume because we would be giving, if we were to today and then further on to council, be giving this the full support, we would then and thus be giving the full support to try to work very closely in partnership to be able to make that happen with, within our, our realm of control. Uh, through you, Your Worship, yes, within the realm of our control. So um, pending council approval on this, we would start to negotiate our funding agreement. We, just for clarity on the last comment, we do have a funding schedule for all of our agreements, so the funding is quite stable and predictable for the ARC. Um, the ARC has indicated there are some improvements or changes they need to make to the property. <clears throat> I don't have that extensive list, but it includes changing out toilets or adding security measures, and if there's alterations to the building, yes, there would be steps that the planning and building folks would need to take. Uh, I think there's some more investigative work that needs to be done or clarity sought around any heritage designation to that property and if it applies or not. So uh, we will leave that to the experts when those connections are made by the ARC. Thank you. And I just had a question regarding the security costs. Um, for the 432 William Street location, uh, the security contract is an up to 46000 and change. And I'm just wondering considering um, the number of occupants at that space, if that was considered uh, and deemed enough uh, in terms of security costs. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, through the chair, we've done our best estimate. Um, our agreement with CMHA for security costs at uh, that location, those locations was something that was negotiated as part of using those spaces. And so that's why it's a full cost for a security person at each of those locations. Our um, pattern as an organization has been to use a community safety approach, which is uh, outreach workers that are trained with some safety protocols that support people outside the building, which we find de-escalates a lot of um, concerning behaviors that that can pop up in and around the vicinity of our space. We did still include some costs for the potential of an incident or something taking place that would require us to add security uh, from time to time, but not as a regular intervention. We've also, as I mentioned, through the health and homelessness table, had great conversations with the police services in the area. And there is a foot patrol in that area uh, that is able to provide support particularly around transition times. We have a wonderful relationship with the police in uh, OAV and also uh, down in the Soho area. And they've, uh, they've let us know that setting these services up in spaces where they are already frequenting actually allows them to be much more supportive of the work um, that needs to happen over winter time. Uh, they also were very supportive of the maximum number of beds as they uh, divert people uh, in their own work to these locations throughout the winter months. 
Thank you. And I just wanted to conclude by saying thank you to the ward counselors uh, that are included in this report for their uh, support of the locations in their ward. Councillor Hopkins. That was a, a wonderful way to end, uh, Councillor Rahman, and I, I'll follow up and also thank the councillors. And if you need some help dropping off flyers, uh, please uh, reach out to me. I uh, will be supporting all four uh, uh, areas. And the reason I'm doing that is because we need overnight beds. It's that simple. We need more. And uh, I am supportive. I appreciate the questions around the planning for William Street. I would encourage Arcade to start those conversations sooner than later. And really pleased to see my sister's place keeping the um, uh, CMHA, keeping that alive. Really appreciate that. My thanks to Arcade, the board members here, and staff, Old East. And of course, city staff for all the work. I know it's been, we've all been on tender hooks lately, and it's really good to see this come ahead and uh, very supportive of going forward and uh, keeping my fingers crossed that it all works out. Thank you. Councillor Lehman. Um, thank you. I've got a couple of concerns uh, with this uh, ask before us today. Um, the first is with the cost. Um, when the, we were looking at the cost for our hubs, proposed hubs uh, program, um, Mr. Dickens indicated some comparatives, um, one being half a million dollars for those beds at LHSC, down to those at shelters, which was $40,000 um, per bed. Um, what we're looking at here uh, we're looking at around twenty-two dollars to $27,000 per bed for a period of four to five months. If I take the annualized cost per bed, we're looking at $65,000. So I guess I have to ask, why are these shelter beds 60% more expensive than the shelter beds used in the example we were speaking of when we were talking about the cost of the hubs? Mr. Dickens, you can direct me to where you'd like me to. I don't know if you have that answer, or if that's an answer for those who submitted the proposal. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And again, just as a reminder to community, we're in this, uh, uh, in this report. These are options for council to consider. We are reflecting what the community has brought forward. Uh, these are the detailed budgets, or these are the budget figures, the estimates that have been provided by the organization. So I would direct it to Ms. Campbell to speak to why the cost. Go ahead. Thank you, and through the chair, um, I think that's a great question. Um, the cost of these temporary beds are is expensive because the whole of community uh, has set some standards around what the staffing ratio needs to be when dealing with high acuity individuals. Uh, we don't know who's coming through our door on a night-to-night -night basis. We don't know what they're bringing with them. We don't know what challenges they're facing. And so because of that and the unpredictability of who's coming through the door, uh, it's been recommended by my colleagues in this work, um, and I've been criticized in past for not following these guidelines, um, that a one-to-five ratio is what's necessary when supporting high-acuity people. Um, in these types of tra transitional, temporary, unknown uh, spaces. And so that's the ratio that we've used in the proposal. That's the number that's before you. One of the benefits of having um, repeated night stays for the individuals who use those stays is that they incrementally improve in every way. Their mental health stabilizes. I don't know if you've ever had a sleepless night. Um, how difficult it is to, to be your best self. Uh, these are communal spaces where people are next to each other. And so our, our necessity to sort of be very present and, and monitor that space, um, you don't know who's sleeping beside you. So for people to, to be restful, we have to have people watching and present for that to happen. Uh, these are mattresses on the floor. They're expensive, expensive in my opinion, as well. Um, and that's why this should not be our permanent solution. Uh, what is necessary is permanent supportive housing 
what is necessary is is places where people can be. And we're working towards that. I'm pleased that I'm part of that. But until that happens, this is what people who do this work every day are telling me we need to be working towards is this one to five ratio and supporting these high needs individuals. These are the same people who struggle to be in those very shelters at the, at the ratios that you're talking about because they require ongoing support. They may or may not be able to come back to that shelter space. So they lose that bed. Um, there's lots of reasons why the people that um, use the winter response beds use them as opposed to the services that already exist in the community, not to mention the fact that they are very subscribed to and full, um, which I know you're going to talk about later today. You know, the necessity of, of these spaces and the cost can be reduced. I think an earlier question was how can we reduce costs over time? Part of that is caring for people over time, seeing their mental health, their addictions, and their basic needs be met so that their physical acuity and needs reduce as well. When that happens, we can see ratios go up one to eight, one to 10. Uh, I believe at some of our shelters, it's one to 20 uh, at times for staffing. So I know that that is possible. That's the answer to the, the question of the cost. Thank you. Um, so this leads to my next question. Um, this is supposed to be a cold weather response and we're going now into April and May. And I've heard a number of times this evening references to long-term housing solutions. We already have uh, looked at extensive housing um, potential solutions. We've talked extensively and implemented, started to implement our hub plan which are to address those, and especially those high acuity individuals that was referenced uh, by Ms. Campbell. My concern is, is if we start spending money at this cost, we're going to restrict the funding uh, for those other um, avenues. And if the goal here is to provide long-term housing, is this the best way to go about it? So what I would like to do, Chair, is I would like to put an amendment on the floor to have the end date March 31st as opposed to May 31st. Before I can allow that, Councillor, that, that seems like something I'd owe to staff on because I don't know how that changes the costing or anything like that, and I'm not sure given this, I know this is an emergency RFP kind of procurement, not an RFP, but a procurement process, but I'd like to get some information about what's possible, how that would proceed. Mr. Dickens. Uh, through you, Your Worship, I can speak to uh, a couple aspects with that uh, question. So one would be, uh, it's been made clear to us, both through the encampment table that have done a lot of this heavy lifting since July, to get here that uh, through services through to the end of May were pretty critical. Uh, it was also made very clear by uh, the ARC and CMHA that having services in place through the end of May was was mandatory, that was that was an urgent request, that was something that there was not a lot of flexibility in. So uh, adjusting the dates would absolutely adjust our funding. Uh, we would need to readjust the numbers and look at if there are cost savings and what that looks like, there, there should be. Uh, but it would also be a matter then for the boards and for the organizational leadership to, to determine if they're still providing this service. I would leave it to them to debate the, um, their efforts and their desires. So that, so the, I guess the answer, Councillor, is sure you, you can, but obviously there would be some consequences and uncertainty about it. So I'd like to make that amendment. So I... If, 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 I, if I couldn't amend David's because it was material differently, doesn't this need to be defeated first before that would come forward? Um, so that's not what Mr. Dickens just said. Um, what he outlined is, yes, under the rules we could do that, but there would be significant consequences that we wouldn't know. 
So. But but I'm saying my motion was seconded and is on the floor, and I think it needs to be defeated before one comes forward that goes to March. So I'm going to take that as you're asking me to make a procedural ruling on whether uh, uh, Councillor Layman's amendment is uh, is counter to yours and has to be your yours has to be defeated before his can be put on the floor as an alternative. So give me a second so I can consult before I make a ruling on that. So um, I, I'll make a ruling on this, and then there's always the option to challenge the chair. Um, you know, after consultation, I am going to suggest that the, the the point that Councillor Stevenson has made is valid to me, and I will tell you why. Um, the motion on the floor aligns with uh, the bids and the contracts that were put forward. There is an expectation that the service would be provided. Based on Mr. Dickens' answer, there could be some risk based on um, a change to the date that, um, one, the costs will all be different, uh, that's expected, but that there is a possibility that there would not be service provided in some of these spaces because they may not be willing, the service providers may not be willing to bid or participate under a time frame of that contract. So to me, that is fundamentally different. Uh, it is something that council could propose, but we would have to defeat Councillor Stevenson's uh, motion on the floor and then put uh, a completely uh, different motion, which would be approve all of these, probably with a direction to staff to say, we only want to do this to May 31st. We're willing to approve it, but you need to come back with some costs. It would be it would be something different that we would have to get more information on, but you could do that and provide that direction to staff after Councillor Stevenson's motion is defeated. Up to be challenged, but I'm going to rule um, that that's a good point of order um, ask and that, um, that your motion, Councillor Lama, would be counter to what's on the floor in a fairly fu fundamental way, although it doesn't seem like that, so, okay? All right. No challenges, okay, good. Um, do you have anything else? You still, you're still on the speaker's list. No, um, I understand your reasoning, Mayor, and um, based on Mr. Dickens' uh, uh, answer, yeah, I understand it. Um, probably don't agree with it, but I'm not, not enough to challenge the chair, but, but I, I, under, I'm, I, I get it. Uh, so I find this very difficult for me, quite frankly, because uh, absolutely uh, we need people sheltered in the winter. Um, my concerns are, this is very costly, but this is what happens when you have one person or one organization coming through um, looking to do fairly substantial work. You know, I mentioned hiring 100 people in a very short period of time concerns me. Um, Again, my concerns of uh, overlapping into our other areas of shelter. Um, I, I think this will impact our hub system, quite frankly, um, because we're starting to get into other areas of financing. Um, so I'm concerned of the ramification, of ramifications in other areas of housing that this financing will, uh, will do. And I don't know if it's the most, uh, I, th I think we can get more bang for our buck. That being said, we do need, a need, there is a definite need for uh, for these folks to be housed uh, over the winter. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Councillor, I have another speaker on the speaker's list. But, but what? Are, are, are councillors allowed to say, like say that it's gonna impact the hub system when that's not true? We, have, we don't have that information yet. We don't know how these are gonna be funded. Uh, so That's correct, we don't know how it's gonna be funded. Um, uh, yet, so yes, um, I, I think councillors sometimes say things. I'm, I'm not going to. There are. There's a balance between calling every single thing out that may not be. I think we understand the point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Councillor Ferreira, you're next. You've spoken before. You've got some time left, but you're next on the list. Thank you. Through you. Um, was it the, uh, I, I was trying to speak to my men, but by, I guess I was speaking to my main motion. I do have in my notes as well that uh, from the discussion that if we were to go above and beyond the 1.8 million that we would be possibly putting future funding for our hubs in jeopardy. Um, so that's kind of how I was thinking myself. So I will be clear on this. There is a motion on the floor that has absolutely no direction on source of financing and when you put it in that situation, there's been some answers from staff about how they could cobble together the money. There may be some surpluses of different pieces. They may have to go to the, the HPP funding. Um, but we're not, this, is, this is one of those situations where we're not actually providing the direction. So it's, it's something that we don't know what the answer to that will be yet. So we didn't provide a direction if we overfund this. We're also voting on this separately so we don't even know if that's the case at the end of this or not. So I think there's, um, there's nothing as part of the motion on this, but Ms. Livingston, go ahead. Your Worship, in an effort to be helpful, uh, if this motion passes, we are being directed to figure out the funding, deal with the contracts and report back to you on that. If that requires us having to look into using funding that is currently earmarked for the hub, that would be one thing. If we then received an unsolicited proposal because we have direction for council to move forward, we would be back to you on how we should proceed with trying to do both, looking to other sources of funding. So that's what I would suggest. I don't know that you need to resolve it this evening. I think if, if this passes, it gives us the direction we need to be able to move forward with cold weather tonight. And if we are fortunate to receive an unsolicited proposal early in the new year about a hub, then we'll come back to you on a proposed strategy to address it. Councillor Ferreira. Go ahead. Deputy Mayor Lewis. Uh, thank you. So uh, two quick questions uh, through you to staff because I recognize I have limited time. Um, the first is, uh, this is not providing wraparound services. So where did the five to one staffing ratio uh, that is being recommended for the hubs come for temporary shelter beds? Ms. Livingston. I believe it comes from uh, trying to provide the 24 uh, seven on-site supports, basic needs, those kinds of things. That's what the five to one ratio includes. It does not include the mental health supports and those kinds of things that are provided in a hub through uh, through arrangements with other partners. This is the base level of service, and I, if I understood uh, our representative from the ARC, uh, trying to align with the standards that have been set, both from a standards of care perspective and also from a staffing perspective, recognizing the high acuity population that would likely be accessing the service. So just to follow up on that and, and without uh, belaboring the point uh, with staff, have we actually endorsed a staffing ratio through an encampment strategy? I, I know we endorsed a staffing level through the hubs, but have we actually endorsed that for an encampment stand-up? Your Worship, not to that degree. We have indicated very clearly from the beginning of the discussions around the approach to uh, the encampment strategy and cold weather, both through daytime, evening, and overnight, that we were trying to align with the approach uh, outlined in the hubs implementation plan. But if your point is, is it a hard and fast rule? No, I think the recognition, and I would say certainly from civic administration, we appreciate the effort of the ARC to align to the standards that would be provided in these spaces. Cause I think those are quite important when you're dealing with a high acuity population. So final uh, point of clarification through you chair to our staff. Uh, I've heard a number of colleagues refer to this as the whole package, but in fact, I want to be clear, staff are not recommending uh, any or all of these. They are putting them forward for uh, council's choice, not as a package, but as individual options. Is that correct? Through your worship, that is correct. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, again, I'm going to just very quickly wrap up by saying I'm going to come back to what I said before. I, I'm not going to support William Street. I'm a particularly concerned um, that we don't know what building code uh, upgrades may be necessary and what capital costs may be involved there 
in addition to the cost to simply operate the service. Uh, so I am not prepared to operate outside the budget on this. I don't have any other speakers now, except for Councillor McAllister. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, and through the chair, <clears throat> uh, I just have a few operational questions, um, just so, you know, in terms of clarity for uh, my community. Um, I know how the coffee house currently runs. Um, I'm just curious in terms of um, how that turnover will look. Um, obviously, the coffee house, the CMHA, does the daytime programming. Um, I'm just wondering, um, will those bed spaces be um, first come, first serve? Are they reserved spaces? Just noting that you have you know, a lot of people who come for the daytime program and how that will look. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, through you, uh, given it's an operational plan, uh, it is a shared space. Uh, I'll start this answer and then maybe direct to Ms. Campbell uh, for greater detail. So it is a uh, shared space, you're right, operations, uh, daytime services, drop-in services through the traditional use of the CMHA coffee house. There would be a break in service while the space is changed over, uh, staffing filter out and filter in, uh, the space is clean, beds are set up, all the appropriate uh, uh, essentials are put in place and then the overnight service would begin. Uh, as far as how that plays out and what those logistics look like, I would have to go to Ms. Campbell for those details. Oh, sorry, go ahead. This is what, this is what happens when people are asking me how much time they have left. Um, can, uh, go ahead. Okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> and through the chair. Um, we work with our partners on a uh, referral process. The way that the night beds work is that we do a daytime referral into those spaces. So um, we will work with CMHA to align that their daytime um, service users would have access to nighttime beds. Um, we have worked in the past with other organizations such as um, London Cares and um, the hospital, a couple of other uh, places where we get direct referrals into space. So we hold a number of beds for those high acuity, really emergency folks who would be extremely vulnerable um, out on the streets. And um, as you heard, some of those spaces are actually designated spaces. So for example, at my sister's place, like those beds are for women. And so we would work with, alongside the protocols and um, criteria of who's eligible for those spaces with that organization. We also hold um, some space as part of the 65 beds. There's an anticipated, at the William Street location, there's an anticipated every night stay for some people so that they can have that predictability of coming in day after day and seeing that improvement. And potentially, um, if we're able to stabilize that group, we would be able to reduce staffing at different times so that we would be able to maybe reduce the cost. One thing I would like to share with you is that if and when we are able to reduce staffing because of whether it's uh, stabilized programming or otherwise, we have historically and we would again return any funds that are unspent and, and we're very detailed on that. Councillor McAllister. Um, thank you. And through the chair, uh, as a follow-up, um, I don't mean to get you going up, uh, up and down, um, but I'm curious in terms, I know in, like CMHA daytime, uh, ARC nighttime, um, but in terms of your staff complement, is there any opportunity for crossover, noting that CMHA have that specialized training, or is it a clear-cut arcade in the evening and CMHA during the day? Go ahead. Thank you, through the chair. Um, we are uh, sharing many resources about how operations work for that seamless experience, but there will be a clear cut delineation. Um, it's very important that that happen. Our staffing complements, um, CMHA runs under a, a unionized work environment. Arcade works in a very different uh, way. And uh, that being said, as you've heard, they're sharing uh, some resources around training staff. We're sharing some procedural manuals. We're making sure that this is as good of a um, reflection of the two organizations aligning in terms of service levels and how we serve that community as possible. Um, and so I have great confidence that this partnership will uh, 
feel to the end user, to the people using services, very seamless, but it is two separate organizations working together to deliver that 24-7 access to indoor warmth and care. Um, thank you. Another one, quick follow-up uh, and through the chair. Um, so is there an opportunity then, because obviously CMHA operates in a unionized environment, but in terms of providing some of those mental health supports during the day, um, is that a possibility? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, in fact, we have a long-standing relationship with CMHA. We have worked together um, across the four winters. So this is the fourth that we will be working together um, in various capacities, whether it's sharing like physical resources, such as like, you know, donated items, food, clothing, like the basic needs that are needed in both of these locations, or like you said, the more specialized services. Um, CMHA is a regular partner. They do many of our assessments that are necessary for folks that are looking to go into treatment. They take referrals for folks who are in acute mental health distress. We have their crisis team in our space quite regularly, and uh, they are a wonderful partner. And I believe that that's actually how the trust level has been built to the point that we're willing to operate each other's space and share in this uh, capacity. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, thank you. And uh, through the chair, um, another question in terms of staffing. Um, noting that um, those other two locations, it'll be 15 and then 10, is that still operating on the five to one model or one to five? Yes, through the chair it is, and also uh, part of the agreement in using that space. So uh, to speak to sort of that standards of care component, that was important when we were negotiating space, that we would follow that same standards of care practice uh, for CMHA. And of course, the security component is separate from that. Um, and so I think just, again, thinking about the cost of these beds, there's the, the ratio of caring for people in space, but as you've... Uh, spoken about already, the community engagement piece, the safety components, the exterior work, uh, those all have a cost component built into the budget as well. And I believe that that does impact the bottom line in terms of service delivery. Well, thank you. And through the chair, just a final comment. I do just want to thank both staff, um, CMHA, um, the ARC as well, for all the hard work that's gone into this. It's not an easy task. I really do appreciate um, all the work that's gone into this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ferreira, you have a tiny bit of time left here on the list. Councillor Pribble, you asked to be on. You've got like 20 seconds. Are you still on the list? Okay, so then you're next. Councillor Ferreira, go. Wait, you got, you, you're very limited here. Thank you, through you. Um, so I do like the intent of everyone trying to get as many beds as quick as possible. And I, that is something that I am also for too. But I do say that we need to be measured in our approach on how we do this. And there is there are some good items, but there is one item that I have trouble with, and that is the William Street Church location. It's, it's We don't know how long it's going to take. We have the building um, issues that may come up that may delay. I understand that, you know, the bed's late, late, late is still good than no beds at all. But there's other issues as well. It's the budget piece as well. Are we, we don't know where that money's gonna come from. It's gonna blow us very high, well and above and beyond our budget too. Can but you wrap thing, it up? Yeah, I'll wrap it up. Um, the thing that I really gotta point out is across the street is 601 uh, Queens. It's London Cares. And we have said here on council that we should not be concentrating services near each other because it's not safe to the people that we're serving. It's, it's not good for the residents in the area. We need to be measured with this type of approach. We need to understand Counselor, that. Counselor, your time is pretty much up. I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay. And by pretty much, I mean it is. Um, Councillor uh, Pribble, you got 20 seconds. That's all you got left. Based on being so late, I will support all four, all four locations. And I hope uh, the Orans will as well. Uh, we don't have, uh, we can approve the money if the organization doesn't fulfill, we don't pay, or if they, if they could deliver partially, we will receive a refund or we will not give the entire amount. We have done that before. Thank you. Okay, that exhausts the speakers list that I have. Now this has been asked to be divided up so people can vote on the four options in B separately. Um, which we are going to accommodate. I'm just going to uh, just clarify the order of that vote. And then I am going to ask that we take a short 
recess after this. It's been a few hours uh, through this item. I want to figure out how to approach the rest of the agenda, given there's some substantive portions, and I'm going to have a, a bit of a plan for that for colleagues after. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Roman. Uh, sorry, through you. Um, I just remembered a question I had. It was related to the wording of the William Street location where it says 65 spaces versus the other ones that say overnight spaces. And if you can just provide that clarification on why one says spaces and one says overnight spaces. Mr. Dickens. Um, thank you, and through you, Chair, uh, these are uh, indeed um, 24 cents. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the other uh, sites are overnight spaces because their space is being used for different functions throughout the day. Uh, the church, uh, the 65 spaces are 24-7. That's why there's a distinction. Go ahead, Councillor Rahman. Thank you, and through you. So, so... Um I guess so So where I was struggling with this one is just in terms of how we split out our costing and how we then comparatively cost because when we looked at, you know, our, our day spaces and our drop-in spaces, we had those costs. And then when we had our overnight spaces in the rest of the report, we have our overnight costs. So to me, this looks promising because it's 65 spaces that are both day and like that are 24 seven. So to me, that actually um, strengthens the, 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 the proposal itself with having those as, as 24 seven spaces, especially around the stability piece. And again, part of the reason why I think this is a different proposal than we've even seen in the past is again, that reutilization of some of our spaces as day and night spaces, it allows for some more continuity. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that this continuity allows for more st stabilization. Thank you. Okay. So how we're gonna approach this is we're gonna do B first, um, because uh, depending on what happens uh, in all of B, we still do C the same way, and then D can be done at the end. Um, tying them all together. So I'm gonna do the components of B first and I'm gonna do them in order. So, so Steven, Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Pribble, you were the mover of the original motion. I'm gonna assume you're willing to move all the pieces all the way through, so we'll just use these as the mover and seconder for all these parts, right? Okay, good. Okay, so the first one is um, B uh, I, which is the um, uh, the, the 30 overnight spaces for $826,000 on Dundas Street. So we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, the motion carries 14 to zero, noting Paul Van Meerberg, Councillor Van Meerbergen has left the meeting. The next piece will be BII, which is the 1.4 million for the 432 William Street 65 spaces. And that'll just take a minute to get ready. Closing the vote, the motion carries eight to six. Okay, the next one is part B I I I, um, which is the uh, 15 overnight spaces at CMHA Coffee House, uh, 404,000.
Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to one. Uh, and finally, the final part of B, which is B um, IV, which is the uh, 10 overnight spaces uh, at CMHA, my sister's place, 335,000. Councillor Trossa. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Nobody needs A, C, and D dealt with separately, do they? No, we can do all those together? Okay, we'll put them all together. Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Pribble, Councillor Lehman. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Okay, that item's done. I, I know that there's some people still here, but I, uh, for other items, but I think given the time we had on that and it's been a few hours, I would like to take just a, a 10 minute break because I also wanna to talk to staff about seeing how we can manage the rest of the agenda given there's a lot of items left and I might be some things that we can push off, but I'm gonna to talk to staff about that. So I need 10 minutes. So I'm gonna ask if we can have a 10 minute break, but we'll keep it really, like we're not gonna do the 10 that becomes 15. We're gonna do 10 minutes. So 10 minute sharp break. Moved by Councillor Ferreira, seconded by Councillor Cuddy. All those in favor by hand? Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, that means we're back at nine.
Okay, I'm calling this meeting back to order. I'm going to let um, colleagues know that uh, it's my intent to call a special meeting of SPPC as the chair on December 6th at one o'clock. Um, I'm gonna ask if colleagues are willing to refer 2.1 and all of in camera, which I've conferred with staff, all can be dealt with on that time frame uh, at that meeting and we will attempt to deal with the rest of the agenda items that we have. So we, the 6th, December 6th at one. So we'll deal with 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, um, the 4.3 and 5.1, 5.2, but the rest we'll refer to a specialist BPC. I see nods. At one o'clock. Uh, Councillor Trosau. 5.1, is that the indicator? No. Uh, we will defer it later if we run out of time. Like, I'm just saying, I'm deferring the substantive items. If everything goes really smooth, then that's fine. If we need to refer 5.1 and 5.2, we can still refer those, but we'll do that later. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> We're not talking about this anymore. Unless anybody has a substantive objection, that's what we're gonna do. But I am gonna need a motion to refer those items now because if we move that now, we let some people who are waiting go who, when we probably won't get through their items anyways. So Councillor Stevenson's willing to defer item 2.1 on the public agenda and all of in camera to the special meeting that I've just called on December 6th at one. The seconder for that, Councillor Pribble. We are gonna do that uh, in the system. Is there any debate on that? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna open that for voting. Frank votes yes. Closing the vote and the motion carries 13 to zero, noting that Deputy Mayor Lewis has left the meeting. Okay, so we're still under items for direction. We haven't completed those yet. Um, the next item for direction uh, is on asylum claimants. Um, this is an item um, that I'll, I can go to Councillor Rahman first on the correspondence that was brought forward. Um, and I'll just say to colleagues, um, there is a lot of stuff to, to go. We had a, like a really long debate on something that had very broad agreement um, from council on the last one. So. We could try to keep it like tighter, especially if it seems like everybody's in the same place, we can kind of move along hopefully a little quicker, but um, recognizing that people do need to have the ability to say their words. It's just uh, it, sometimes we are in wider agreement than maybe we realize and we spend a lot of time convincing each other when we may already be convinced. So, but Councillor Rahman, uh, I'll let you go ahead. Uh, thank you, and through you, um, I will be brief with my remarks just in, in to uh, tighten up our time for the meeting. Um, I want to say thank you to colleagues for first taking the time to review the letter before you. Uh, I want to say thank you to Ms. Ayala Ronson and Mr. Marshak Morjako of uh, Mission Services and CCLC. They are on the front lines of doing exceptional work in our community, and it is important that we understand the many pressures on shelters and services in our city. This motion today asks for more information to come to us and our partners to frame what we are seeing or what they are seeing. You'll see in your added package a letter from Mission Services and uh, in the letter it states on November 15th, 40% of their beds at the men's mission and eight of 20 of their family spaces at the Roth home were occupied by refugee claimants. They have a responsibility to provide support on a first come first serve basis. And I continue to support the work they're doing there. What we're seeing is similar to what other big cities are seeing, additional pressures on emergency shelters, transitional beds and services. And this letter suggests unifying our message with the Ontario Big City Mayor's Caucus and AMO to advocate for additional supports. CCLC and Mission Services have already begun some of this work. They're seeking funding through the province of Ontario. And this letter requests the mayor to support the request for resettlement supports to be offered by CCLC at Mission Services to help address the unique needs of asylum claimants in our shelters. 
Thank you. So I'm looking to, thank you. So I'm looking to move the uh, content of my letter uh, signed and I'd like to thank the mayor for his support as well um, and, and for um, also visiting the shelter and, and, and seeing um, and hearing also what's going on at Big City Mayor's Caucus. I know that there's been some good conversations already around what types of supports are needed. Um, so I wanna move the letter that's uh, provided in the package. Okay, moved by Councilor Rahman. I'll look for a seconder. Councilor Cuddy's willing to second. Um, any, uh, any discussion? Go ahead, Councilor Stevenson, and then Councilor Trosso. Thank you, and through the chair, I've got a couple of things. One is um, the data that is here. We're, we're, we're informed that 40% uh, are newcomers and 50% of that are refugees. Um, it wasn't that long ago, it was in the newspaper where Deputy Mayor Lewis was saying that we had X number of people who were coming from outside the city. And I get a lot of requests for data, right? People want to know what is going on in our city and what is going on with the homeless. So I'm wondering, where is this data available and is there a way to have it shared more frequently with staff and with the public, or sorry, with council and with the public? Uh, through you, your worship, uh, thank you. Uh, council has directed staff to report back uh, to a future meeting on a homelessness data report that gives council and the public a significant snapshot of homelessness in London, including uh, stemming from uh, previous council motions around where folks are coming from and what their demographic looks like uh, in London. So that is planned to come forward in January. I would propose that I look to Mr. Cooper's team to include a section in that existing report uh, that has been uh, prepared uh, to include a specific section around the impacts of uh, asylum and refugee, uh, asylum seekers and refugee claimants. Uh, as far as the data goes, uh, we collect data through our HIFAS data system. Uh, that is a shared database through the community. Um, we make that information public through reporting. Uh, it is uh, information that... Um, we, we would really seek council direction on in terms of sharing more of it. We do try to treat it with some sensitivity. Um, we have been pretty forthcoming around uh, the number of individuals experiencing homelessness in London and what those trends look like uh, from years past. I will share on this file, uh, our team was able to pull that from May 1st to November 20th, uh, there was 100, 168 unique people uh, falling under HIFAS categories such as refugee, refugee claimant, undeclared and not reported status that stayed in emergency shelter and transitional beds at shelters during that period. So again, that's from May 1st to November 20th. There was 168 unique individuals under those categories that stayed in emergency shelter for at least one night. Um, and when we look at that, that is broken out across the Center of Hope, Men's Mission, Roth Home, the YLU Shelter, London Cares Resting Spaces, Men's Mission Transitional Beds, and Holly's House Transitional Beds. So just for some context. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. And um, we, uh, Council said that London was a sanctuary city in January of 2017, and then that was removed in 2018, and it was the free of fear services for all city. What, what impact has that had, and is, is this a, a consequence of those decisions? Um, no, this is something that everybody's facing. Go ahead. Uh, your Worship, um, I'll look to others to weigh in here, but I, the, the previous council decisions around those items that are referenced uh, would have no correlation here in terms of an influx of, of those seeking asylum from other parts of the world. Uh, the federal government's been pretty clear with municipalities around the impacts of Roxham Road, uh, and this is a lot of secondary migration. Okay, go ahead. And, and are these, because the asylum seekers aren't coming directly to London and, and according to the report they're coming from Toronto or other cities, are they being picked up as well as people who've come in from other cities? Are we counting them that way as well? Is that what maybe part of the number was in the spring or summer? Mr. Dickens. 
Uh, at this time, your worship uh, and through you, I wouldn't have that level of granular data in terms of, uh, so when folks show up, they're showing up at one of these shelters looking for a space to sleep and they will indicate or they will not report a status or they will indicate their status. Some, while they're there uh, for a space to sleep, will try to file for emergency service uh, or support through uh, the Ontario Works Program and others will not. So, well, we don't have the specificity in terms of you know, people declaring I'm coming straight from London or straight to London from this point of, of uh, border crossing. Um, but we do know that through our conversations with the federal government uh, and through our conversations with other municipalities, there have been a lot of movement between communities. I think that's widely, uh, widely publicized and shared uh, through a number of channels. Go ahead. Thank you. And... Um... I had another question on that, but I've forgotten. The other, the other thing I was looking for was clarity. On here, it's asking that the mayor be requested to write a letter and to undertake ad, uh, advocacy efforts. And I just wondered if I could get clarity as a new councillor as to when the mayor needs direction to do something and when not. Because we've had mayors, uh, the mayor and councillors making a number of statements on a daily basis. And recently, the mayor issued a statement on the Middle East. And I've been getting a lot of emails asking, there seems to be some confusion. Was that a council endorsed statement or was that directly from the mayor? And it was directly just from you specifically. But could you maybe provide clarification there on when you would come to council prior to doing something and just clarity on that statement? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Though um, often, can I, I do will... a point of order, sir, before sure. you go? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, how is this relevant to the matter at hand? I'm answering the part about the direction um, in the piece about directing the mayor um, to do advocacy. And so, sorry, is that related to anything on the agenda, or just a general question? It's related directly to the motion that's on the floor that the mayor be requested to undertake immediate, immediate advocacy efforts with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I will say on the advocacy piece, um, there are many ways that, that advocacy happens. It happens directly from me. Um, it happens uh, through the organizations that we're with. And in this case, uh, advocacy on this has already uh, happened through the Ontario Big City Mayors, initiated by mayors who um, may have first um, had the pressure in their systems, like uh, Mayor Chow and others. Um, and then others, as, uh, as, as that pressure caused um, more movements across other cities, kind of joined in and supported. But often you'll have a group um, start to advocate and we lend our voices to these organizations we're a part of. So I can, I can take positions myself. I can join positions and we support the positions of our organizations. But from time to time, we reinforce that work with statements of council, like in this case. Now, I will say I'm already part of the work that the Ontario Big City Mayors is doing on this. Uh, I will say I'm not aware of any work that the Association of Municipalities of Ontario is doing on this, but certainly this direction would say branch that out a little bit. Um, and I would, I would basically reinforce, but it's always be requested. Um, you can't direct me. Um, so that's why it's worded that way. And in this case, I'm very happy to take the request. It's work that we're already underway on. So much like other members of council too, can make statements on their own, um, uh, so can I, and uh, but this is a this is a request for me to do this, and I'm happy to take the request from councillors. Councillor Trosa. Thank you very much uh, through through the chair. I'll certainly be supporting this. I really want to um, point out that I thought the the letter from Mission Services was was done in a very tasteful, sensitive, and positive um, way. The, this this is this is. Uh, no, no, no claims are being made that people were, uh, anyway, this was done in a very positive um, way. And I was really glad to see a uh, councillor and the mayor um, pick this up in the form of, <clears throat> in the form of a resolution, which really is, uh, is, 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 is geared towards uh, trying to make the situation better for the very people who are staying in these shelters. So this is, um, this is a very positive uh, this is a very positive resolution. I'm happy to um, support it, and uh, I hope uh, I hope that we uh, just 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 do this because this is a situation that is way beyond our control. We we can't we we can't do something about the rent levels as much as we would like. The province is going to have to do that. 
Um, I don't want to get too far off of the agenda, but it is mentioned in the um, it is mentioned in the letter. And um, we've got some agencies that are really stretched and are really going out of their way to do the right thing. So good good for mission services, and uh, thank you, Councillor and Mayor, for putting this on our agenda. Any other speakers? Okay, seeing none, that's moved and seconded. We'll open that for voting. Councillor Hillier. Yes, it's not loading. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Okay, now we're on to the things that we um, have left from the consent. Uh, we've already um, referred to 2.1, so we have 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4. I'll deal with those separately. Uh, the first is 2.2, which is the uh, update to the request for proposal um, hubs implementation plan. You'll see the staff report with some uh, suggested actions there uh, based on um, uh, the request from CMHA. Uh, I'll look for someone who wants to put that on the floor uh, and then I'll um, open it for questions. Uh, Councillor Trosau moves, Councillor Rahman seconds. Any uh, discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Rahman. Uh, thank you, and through you. Um, I have an amendment uh, for 2.2 um, that I wanted to introduce. Um, I did circulate the amendment, uh, but I wanted to um, just make sure that I touched on it and spoke to it here as well. But uh, I'd like to, well, I want to make sure I have, uh, do you want me to read it and then, okay. Yes, I'd like you to read it because um, although you circulated it, uh, yes. people who may be watching um, may not have access to it, so. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is an amendment to 2.2 to include a C, that civic administration be directed to provide municipal council with the option of additional time equal to one committee cycle to consider the results of any future hub requests for proposals, RFPs, prior to requesting a final decision. Okay, I look for a seconder for that. Councillor Stevenson seconds. Uh, discussion. Oh. I did have a seconder. It's Councillor Lehman. Sorry, I took Councillor Lehman, you want to? Sure. Apparently, there was a seconder lined up. Councillor Lehman, you can have it. Um, any discussion? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the amendment in front of us today. Uh, is here to allow us more discussion between administration and council regarding the timing, timing of making a decision about future hub RFPs. What we heard as we considered the proposal for CMHA was that even though it was possible to allow for more time, we were still under, uh, not from staff, staff were very clear that we had more time to, to consider that as we were working through it. However, we defeated a motion to put a 30-day distance between our discussion at SPPC and our decision on that proposal. <laughs> Listening to the debate again last week, I heard colleagues state that time was an important consideration and not supporting the referral to allow more time. And in hindsight, I asked myself, uh, what can we learn from this experience? We need to ask ourselves those questions we need to be a learning organization. We need to build into our process opportunities to course correct, to take more time for careful thought and evaluation. And in this process, what I needed was time to consult with residents of the ward. This amendment supports the addition of time between our decision points to allow for conversations with our constituents, to follow up with questions, and frankly, to learn more before we make a decision. And I think as we're doing something for the first time, all of those things are really important. Um, this doesn't mean that we will always need that time, but it means that when we do, we have it. And I think that it's important to be able to engage in that kind of discussion when we need it. Thank you. 
Any other speakers? Sorry? Uh, yes, just on the amendment right now. Councilor Trosa. Could I, uh, through the chair, could I ask Steph um, if um, th this mandatory language, um, civic administration be directed um, uh, to provide, not to seek to provide, but to, but to do it. Could, could, could there be time scenarios where that creates um, some, some, some issues or problems in terms of being implement, implementing it in a timely way? Or do you see a problem with this? Go ahead. Thank you, through the chair. So the way I understand the motion is, is it, it allows council the option to exercise that cycle. So um, if there was a time urgency, I believe council could choose to waive that. However, from a pro procurement perspective, what we would need to do based on this direction is build in that time with the irrevocable um, timing of the funding or the, the cost of the RFP as part of the RFP process. So with this direction, we can absolutely include that in any future RFP so that time would not be a challenge to allow this to proceed. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Lehman. Thank you, and when we went down this road, um, we said that we would need flexibility as we learn from um, our experiences. And I think, um, well, it was asked for more time, but the RFP went out with those certain parameters that we had to respect. And I think this is a classic example of something that we have learned that we can use in future RFPs, as uh, Ms. Barbone has indicated, a proper way to go. So that's why I'm supporting this motion. Anyone else on the amendment? Councillor uh, McAllister. Uh, thank you, and through the chair, um, just a comment on this. I, I think you know it was a, a lesson learned in terms of uh, that location. Um, I would say one of the things I learned from that, which might be beneficial in the future, is, and I don't know if this <clears throat> necessarily falls into our RFP process, but I do think it would be beneficial for the community to have a better understanding of the organization, which is for putting forward the proposal. I found after um, uh, this fell through that I was fielding a lot of questions in terms of the, the organization itself. And I'm not a, an employee of CMHA. Um, I can't field a lot of those questions. Obviously, I do have um, one of their locations in my ward. Um, but I was doing my best in terms of trying to defend an organization and really had no insight into that. And I think this would give us some time to perhaps have a public engagement session and perhaps have our organization come forward, have that public dialogue. Because um, I do think there is um, uh, just a lack of knowledge in our community necessarily. We might know of the organization, but not necessarily what they do and how they operate. So I do think that this would be a valuable tool for us. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson on the amendment. Yeah, thank you. I will just say that uh, I do support this, although um, for me it wasn't a hub. Safe space was just a, a winter response, but to have it you know, come out through rumors in the neighborhood and have no opportunity for community feedback um, was difficult. So I, I, I do support this. I think the more community engagement we have and time to talk to our communities is a good thing. So I appreciate this amendment. Anyone else? Okay, it's moved and seconded. It's an amendment to the motion to add a C. Uh, everybody's uh, aware of what it is, so we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Okay, I now need to move on to seconder for the as amended uh, report, which is all three pieces. Um, uh, Council Rahman, seconded by Council McAllister. Uh, we will have discussion now on the as amended report. Go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. I just have a quick comment on this one. Um, it bothered me throughout the discussion on this particular hub, the sort of um, dismissive notion about calling everybody NIMBYs, anybody that wasn't in agreement with it, without really listening to the concerns. Um, there's a huge difference between a three-story walk-up or affordable housing in a neighborhood and uh, a site that allows drug use. 
Um, it didn't need to be that way. Um, we could have chosen to have drug-free spaces. And I don't think we should cast aside concerns of illegal drug use. People have a right to voice their concerns, and we don't get to demonize people as NIMBY just because they are saying no. Even here tonight, we've, we've had people say no to certain locations, and that should be allowed. People, people get to express their concerns about changes that are coming to their neighborhood, and I just wanted to be a voice for that, that we get to be careful we don't completely label people right away without listening to their concerns. Any other speakers? This is the full thing. Councilor McAllister, go ahead. Uh, thank you, and through the chair, um, <clears throat> I take issue with what was just said in terms of, um, I, I completely agree, people have absolutely the right to voice their opinion, um, but I take issue when I receive correspondence that essentially says, let's dump it all in the east and be done with it. So I do think that there is space for that dialogue, but I don't agree when people take shots at parts of the city, which I think are unfair and unjust. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councilor Ferreira. Uh, thank you. Um, I, 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 with the sentiments that we just heard, um, you know, I don't stand up for NIMBYism uh, myself, and I wouldn't be calling anyone else uh, NIMBYs with certain issues. <clears throat> I'm, you know, with respect to the downtown, it's just we have a lot going on right now. I have two extra items on my plate after the last couple items ago. Um, I had three service depots as well. I do accept that because I understand that we need to put our all hands on deck forward. Um, but, um, but as I said, I don't stand up for anything like that. So when I do have an opposition, my opposition is for um, reasons that are rational, and I spoke to those. OK. We're going to, so we're kind of getting off the report here. So let's kind of keep it tight to, we've got three items before us. Councillor Rahman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, and through you and on the report. Um, I just want to say, you know, I have the, I have deep respect for CMHA for the willingness they were, they, they expressed in identifying and speaking to the information as they learned it. And I think that as a community, we have to be willing to have those brave conversations. When we learn new information, when we see things going in a direction that we hadn't intended, that we can say it wasn't what we intended and we need to pull back. And I think that I have to take that time to say thank you to CMHA for having that, that look at this and then furthering that conversation with staff. And I want to say thank you to staff for engaging in that dialogue and giving CMHA an opportunity to, to find options. So. Um, I know that for all of us, there was a desire to move forward and a desire to see council's direction fulfilled. So this is something that, again, we all have to learn to, but we also all have to take responsibility for. And one of the things I think that it's important to learn from the work that we're doing here is that we're, we're very knowledgeable knowledgeable about our wards and we were taking the time that's needed to understand those issues and so when we come here and we're speaking from our wards perspective I think it's really important to hear each other even when those conversations are difficult and so um, sharing the experience of residents no matter where they live uh, is important and it, we need to value and honor that at this table and in this room thank you Okay, thanks. Um, any other speakers? No, seeing none? Okay. It's uh, the whole thing, uh, the uh, parts A, B, and the added C. I'm gonna open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. 
Okay, next item is 2.3, which is the November progress report for the Health and Homelessness Whole Community Response. It's got two items associated with it to receive the report and then a one-time allocation approval for Arcade's meal invoice program uh, for a period of time there. Uh, I will look for a mover for the staff uh, report recommendations. Councilor Rahman, seconded by Councilor Trosau. Um, any discussion on this? Councilor Stevenson. Thank you, I have a few questions. Um, on page 20 under strategy and accountability, or I'm assuming that's where it would be, I'm wondering um, if it would be possible to get a financial update with the cost to date, the, those that we've spent and those that we've committed. We've, we've approved consultants, lived experience, payments, encampments, hubs, supportive housing, all kinds of things. And I know as we're, we're coming up on a year to the announcement of the $25 million donation, and a lot of people are asking, have we spent it? How much has been spent? It would be nice to have, um, so I'm wondering if that's coming or if we can make a request for it. Your so, Worship, uh, are we being asked to request from the fund how much has been allocated from the fund? I think there's two questions here. One would be, uh, I guess, a request to the London Community Foundation on the fund, which is not held by the city, if they could provide an update on the expenditures there. And this uh, second part of the question I hear is, um, some sense of uh, our expenditures or uh, I'm not sure. sure what the other piece is. Okay. Sure, so we can undertake to provide uh, what has been spent. In July, council received a report on the allocation of funding to support a communications plan. Uh, and we can, we indicated with respect to the hub proposals, what was being supported out of the fund from a capital perspective, so we can put that all in one uh, place, certainly. So yes. Okay. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Um, as I said, there was a lot. It'd be nice to see what the costs are. On that same page, under sustaining the sector, um, there was talk of addressing funding shortfalls with some of the shelters and some of the low staffing ratios. There was also the talk with Arcade about possibly like doing more long-term um, contracts with them as we build, as we stand up the hubs. It talks about transition funding supports for up to 24 months. So I just wondered if there was some uh, details on what we can anticipate coming for that. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, and through the chair, um, we're meeting with organizations in the coming weeks to, to talk about kind of what, what their needs are for the sustaining of the sector. Um, and we'll be looking to bring something to council early in the new year uh, for any contract amendments or new contracts that are necessary. Thank you, a few more questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, under the hubs implementation, so just in the, most recent audit committee, we we uh, were advised, you know, that there were prob not problems, but areas to improve in terms of the vendor risk management. And with us spending so much money on uh, the hubs right now, I wondered if we were factoring some of those in in terms of vendor risk profiles or um, audits of service to make sure that we were getting the services um, that were contracted for. Your Worship, I just want to be clear with respect to a comment like so much money. So one hub is starting at 1.3, escalating to 1.9 over a two-year period. The second hub is 2.1 million. These are well within the estimated range of what hubs were going to be. We are using our standard contracts to uh, manage that funding relationship with both of those organizations. There are things that came through the vendor management audit that under Ms. Barbone's leadership are being implemented across the organization. And as those things are implemented, certainly they'll be reflected uh, in future contracts. I don't know that they're going to be reflected specifically in these immediate contracts. Okay. Thank you. I 
didn't mean anything by so much money. A lot of people would consider 1.5 million a lot of money. Um, my question is, and I'll just make it a comment, is that we, through especially the cold weather response, we do have contracts with a nonprofit organization that we haven't dealt with before. It was highlighted in the audit committee report about risk vendor risk profiles and you know making sure they're compliant with their taxes and you know all of that kind of thing. It, it is in the report, and I'm just assuming having that information, I'll assume that civic administration is going to, you know not wait for the new changes that are coming, but are gonna take a look at that to ensure that the taxpayers and those in need of service uh, are getting the best possible uh, care. So on page 21 under the encampment response, it says um, that we're winding down these services as they stand up the cold weather response. And I just was looking for a little bit more information on that because uh, the cold weather response, we did drop in and outreach the last SPPC. There was also 100,000 for unsheltered, but I don't recall seeing any details on that. And we are being asked here to fund um, 20, 251,000 for meals. So I'm just wondering how we're providing the meals if we're stand winding down the service depots. Mr. Dickens. Uh, through your worship, I'll uh, start this response and pass it to Mr. Cooper for additional uh, commentary. Uh, so what we're looking to do with the encampment table is uh, understand what council's or committee's decision was tonight and what council's decision will be on the number of indoor spaces that would be provided. Pending council's decision, we will then understand what the gap is in the community for those that we need to support that are going to remain unsheltered. Committee endorses 120 beds in addition to every other bed that's already been uh, tabled to be open this winter. Then we'll have a far less gap to address in terms of unsheltered homelessness. That would indicate that the depots are going to look different and some based on locations and where individuals are being housed and, and brought indoors from uh, would shift, either shift to different locations or shift out and wind down entirely. Uh, we still know, and Ms. Campbell alluded to this as well, um, that there are still going to be individuals that will be experiencing unsheltered homelessness, uh, maybe throughout periods of the winter, uh, maybe throughout the entirety of the winter. And so the last report was to get ahead of that and be proactive as staff to say, we're going to need some money to help these folks that are going to be outdoors until all the spaces come online or as they remain unsheltered for different reasons. What we were saying here is that uh, part of that support is to administratively right size and continue to invoice through an invoicing model uh, the food provision of the ARC. If it's found that we have fewer meals that need to be provided to encampments or to individuals, I'm not saying that's likely, but if that were the case, then the cost of that would go down and there would be unspent funds. So I hope that sort of paints the picture. This is not a... Um, we opened up 120 beds tonight. That's great. There's no more people outdoors. We need to continue to do this. So we've been trying to be as proactive as we can and understanding that unsheltered individuals um, will require different supports and different needs and uh, what that looks like will be determined based on council's decision. Thank you. I appreciate the proactive and yet, uh, but my question was the meals, 120 meals per day is there, are we handing those out through outreach instead, or it may still be service depots? You haven't worked that out yet. Mr. Dickens, go ahead. Thank you. The encampment tables are still uh, actively uh, represented by outreach and frontline workers, and they will still have uh, spaces that, for the time being, will be um, uh, populated in, with groups of encampments and groups of individuals. So we'll continue to administer those meals through those methods. And while we open up new spaces throughout December and January, uh, and as those uh, folks transition, then we would look to reposition those depots to tell you how many people are coming out of Cavendish today or out of Watson Park today to in, in those spaces, I would not know. So we are saying we are going to need to continue to provide meals in those depots until we can wind them down or transition them to other spaces to meet the needs of the vulnerable people. Some of those spaces that people are currently in uh, become uh, very difficult to serve in the winter months. 
Uh, that's not a knock on our snow clearing friends and other departments, uh, but travel paths and foot paths and uh, the ability to set up a table and administer uh, provisions looks very different in June and July than it does in January, February. Thank you. Fair enough. Uh, at the bottom of page 22, it talks about the business reference table and it refers to the um, granting agreement for the 500,000 and the 1.16. It doesn't refer to the 250,000 for Argyle and Hamilton Road, but I'm assuming it's going to be treated the same. Can I get that question repeated? Sorry, we have uh, competing page numbers here. My apologies. Uh, I can, I can, I can just pair. So the councillor saying um, staff um, brought forward a recommendation to give some funds to um, uh, downtown BIA and all these BIA. There's some parameters under which you're going to govern those. Council then, of their choice, added some other BIAs into it. Is is it going to operate generally the same way uh, as the structure here? Uh, yes, Your Worship, we will. One last question then. Under the Indigenous-led response, I know um, we approved 18, I believe, transitional beds um, with the previous winter response because it was going to go for two years. So, And then with the hubs, we've got another 18. So I just, I just wanted to confirm that, that we're going to end up with 36 this winter. And there was no talk about cold weather beds, although there was... Um, in last year's and they weren't able to provide the 10 beds for cold weather, but I wondered if that might be part of this year. Mr. Dickens. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Edlosa is, uh, as approved through the hubs plan, will be bringing on a total of 28 beds, uh, the 10 respite and the 18 transitional. Those 18 transitional beds um, uh, will look different than what is there now. Uh, as those beds now were actually uh, set to, to end uh, this month. So uh, the 18 beds that they are creating through the pallet structures and the 10 respite beds that they're creating in the, in the existing space uh, will look and act uh, quite differently than what has been there at this point and what was there prior to that through previous winter response. So it is 18 uh, transitional beds and 10 respite beds. Go ahead. Um, was last year's winter response, did it not include two years of funding for those beds? Go ahead. Thank you. And through the chair, there was um, a two-year allocation. We have signed a one-year contract with that organization, and we will not be renewing that contract given um, the direction they've, that organization has taken to apply for the RFP for the hubs. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. And will that not mean a lot more money available potentially then? <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Cooper. Thank you through the chair. I'm thinking it's around $600,000. Um, we were waiting for that organization's current contract to, to end and then find, get a final um, accounting of, of the dollars to understand uh, where they're at. And if there's savings in addition to uh, the second year piece, we would look to recoup that and then obviously go into the this Housing Stability Services general budget. Um, I have myself on the list and then Councillor Hopkins. I'm going to hand the chair over to Councillor Rahman. Thank you. I have the chair recognizing the mayor. Go ahead. Um, so I, on this report, um, which is uh, yet another update um, on the work uh, as well as the other item, uh, I just want to say to our staff um, that this is like, this is very helpful, detailed work. And I want to say on the questions and answers that you get from us, not just on this, but many topics related to this field, uh, I am very, always very impressed with your top of mind and quickly accessible, detailed and thoughtful answers to those questions, even your engagements and knowledgeable um, ability to pull up information about uh, service providers who may not be directly uh, under your uh, sphere or your department that you work on. Um, but I, I think you face a lot of questions from us, which is you know, our right to ask, and, and rightly so, as we, um, we provide that oversight. But I just wanted to provide a comment that I find the report very helpful. I continue to find it helpful, but I am always very impressed by how quickly you can answer some very detailed questions off the cuff um, with accurate and helpful information. So I just wanted to add that context, and I'm supportive of the direction that this uh, report brings forward. Returning the chair to you and Councillor Hopkins is on, waiting to speak. Councillor Hopkins, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your comments. I, too, want to give my thanks to, to staff for the work uh, in this report. Um, 
I'm always amazed at how much work is going on um, before these reports come to me. And I, I really do um, appreciate um, this information. It helps me decide uh, on how to proceed. I do have a quick question around the housing implementation, implementation table. Is that going to continue just how, or it's, it's going to continue, I, I would assume. I, I just um, want to make sure. Mr. Dickens. Yeah, through your worship, absolutely, yes. These implementation tables will continue, um, and as they um, work towards various milestones, they will continue to adapt to where they need to focus on next. So. Good to know that that's going to continue. I've met a number of members, and I know we've got a few colleagues here on the uh, on this table, and uh, there is a, a lot of work that's going on around those tables. So I do really appreciate all those individuals that are involved. I'm so forward. Um, I'm so looking forward to the highly supportive housing strategy coming forward uh, with these uh, 100 units, um, with that information uh, coming to us, as well as the um, uh, the other report. I think that's the the only report that's coming back to us uh, on December, but I think that is going to be important information for us to have because for me, the hubs are temporary. Uh, it's, it's going forward and how this is all going to be implemented is what I'm looking at. Um, and I just want to make sure it's just that report that's coming to us in December. Through you, Your Worship, if I could respond to that. Um, Go ahead. Given, uh, through you, given the um, uh, agenda for the December 12th SPPC uh, and through conversations with our strategy and accountability table and with our housing co-chairs, we're going to be actually bringing that housing plan forward in January so that we actually have time to, to have it uh, prepared and then have attention at uh, committee when it comes forward. Good to know that. I know it's going to be a busy month, and we've already got busy agendas uh, happening. So uh, good to, to know that that will be happening in January. And thanks very much. OK, that's all the speakers I had. It's moved and seconded. So we'll open uh, this for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Okay, on to 2.4, which is the 2023 to 2027 London Strategic uh, Plan core area. Um, there is a report as well as uh, an added uh, piece of correspondence. So I'm uh, happy to uh, flip, hold on, I gotta. Okay, so this is um, to be received uh, with an it being noted. Um, so I don't know if someone wants to put that on the floor first before any subsequent action. I need someone to put it on the floor, especially if you want to take some sort of different action with it. Councillor Ferrer willing to put it on the floor. Seconded by Councillor Stevenson. Okay, now I can open up the speakers. As I saw Councillor Ferrer, put your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. To you. Um, Colleagues, it's the Ward 13 councillor representing downtown again, um, just trying to figure out a way uh, to make our downtown more resilient. I, uh, I have a, I'm very overworked when it comes to this ward, especially with downtown. Um, and my resilience will not go away, so I'll keep on coming back. But I would like to see downtown also be resilient as well. I would like to ensure that beyond this term, we are able to know that the direction uh, that's going forward continues on. So um, we've seen many plans and programs created uh, in the past in past councils, and I see that as puzzles towards a grander vision. Uh, but we need to figure out a way to put these pieces of the puzzle together, and we need to figure out how to prioritize uh, which puzzles we do first. So I have a motion that I have circulated um, out to everyone. And that motion is basically trying to, is asking uh, for your support um, so that staff can go through all the reports and programs that we have in the past and look at it through a contemporary lens and prioritize what elements of those reports and programs through that contemporary lens of the issues or of the situation that we see on the ground right now 
um, and how to move forward. And that would be something that I would ideally like to see for a long-term strategy. I am not going as far with this motion as I would like to because I think that I would like to pace myself and I would like staff to be able to pace themselves as well. But I'm just looking for a little bit more of a refinement of our position on how we look uh, to the future. I would like us um, to, when we're done here, uh, like when all of, our, all of our time here on council is done, however many years down the road that will be, we'll be able to go downtown and we'll be able to see um, that momentum that we could start today still continuing on for our enjoyment of the downtown. So I'm looking for your support. I'd like to add uh, my amendment to the, to the motion or to the staff recommendation uh, that was already on the floor. I don't want to take anything off the staff recommendation. I just want to stick that in there. And I'm hoping that I can get your support. So my understanding of your motion that's been circulated, and I'll, I'll say that the clerks took it and uh, um, just kind of changed it into the language that we use at the meetings, is that you don't need to do, you don't, it's not an amendment because it's the basis of this is a referral back with a number of pieces associated with it. So um, given, I know you circulated it, I, it's probably best for me to maybe, even I can just read it out. Um, that way we can make sure you're good with the language that's just been adjusted from what your correspondence was. And then I can look for a seconder and then we can have a discussion. So here's how it reads now. That with respect to the 2023-2027 City of London Strategic Plan, Quarry Action Plan, the following actions be taken. A, the 2023-2027 uh, to 2027 City of London Strategic Plan core area um, report essentially be referred back to civic administration. Uh, B, the civic administration should be directed to undertake a comprehensive review cons uh, considering current conditions and existing plans. This should involve a removal of outdated components from previous work, prioritized essential elements. Additionally, the examination should determine uh, the necessity of a new downtown master plan extending beyond the immediate 2023 to 2027 City of London strategic plan timeframe while aligning with its scope and C, civic administration be directed to report back to a future meeting of the SPPC committee with a prioritized grouping of the next steps including short-term actions, a longer-term plan of actions, uh, draft targets, metrics, and fulfillment requirements to a future meeting of SPPC, that sounds a little bit repetitive, but um, uh, it being noted that uh, that the recent funding approvals by uh, Municipal Council for the downtown and oldies village improvement areas provide some bridge funding to assist with short-term challenges and needs while this work is undertaken. Does that sound like what you submitted? It sounds a little close. Uh, I would like to read it because I do see that there was some extra stuff in there. But if, if the clerks are making it so it fits well. I don't, I, they try not to add stuff in there. They just tried to like take your words and make it into the alignment with our plan. So why don't I put it up on the screen even though there's not a seconder. I want you to make sure you're good with it. Then I will ask for a seconder. And if there's a seconder, then we'll proceed. So we'll put this in eScribe so you can actually see it. Okay, take a look now with the refreshed view. And other colleagues, you can just take a look now to see if you're willing to second this. You should be able to see it if you click current item. Uh, that reads well to me. Is there a seconder for this? A uh, few of them, Councilor Pribble, you were first. Um, okay, now, so this is refer back with these actions. So now this is the only thing on the floor because referral takes precedent. So now we will have a debate on what Councilor Ferreira has put forward with respect to this item. Councilor Stevenson, go ahead. I'd like to propose uh, one small change if the councillor is open to it, or the mover and the seconder, that it instead of saying um, a new downtown master plan, it say a new core area master plan. So the, the councillor can comment on it, but uh, 
It's been moved and seconded now, so it might have to be an amendment. So, go, but go ahead, Councillor. Uh, the language for the downtown, the potential new downtown master plan was uh, specifically put in there, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to remove that one. Yeah, so if you wanted to do that, it would need to be an amendment to the language. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm going to leave it and consult uh, prior to making any changes there. But I would like to say in terms of this core area strategy that um, I, I will support the referral. Um, there was the issue of the oversaturation of the social services in the core area, particularly on the main street of Old East Village, despite the PACT report and the core area action plan, has been avoided. And I understand that it's complex and it's an issue, but we have the whole of community and we have a new core area strategy and that issue has to be addressed. We have continued to fund again two more agencies on the main street in the heart of Old East Village across the street from each other. So the councillor, I hear councillors tonight saying, oh, we can't have things too close to each other. Well, they voted for those two. It seems to be okay in Old East Village, but not okay in other areas. So I will support the, def the referral back. I, this has to be addressed. There's no point continuing to give Band-Aid money to a district if this city is not committed to our core area. Those businesses are hanging on by a thread. They deserve the commitment of this city. And we need to look after both of our unhoused and our housed people to have a core area that they can come down to with businesses that can survive in a city that is growing and wonderful and amazing. And we get to have a heart of the city that is healthy and we get to take care of our vulnerable and there's a way to do it and I want that to be part of this. I may come back with an amendment at council to address that specifically. This cannot continue. I have supported uh, a shelter spaces on the heart of Dundas Street because we already approved the daytime because people are dying, because it's winter, because it matters and I will support that and we need a long-term vision, I agree. Other speakers? Uh, Councillor Lehman, go ahead. Uh, Chair, I'm going to uh, recuse myself as I'm a member of the downtown BIA and there's reference to bridge financing uh, included in the, uh, the amendment. Okay. Councillor Lehman's making that recusal. Other speakers? Councillor Hopkins, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I want to thank the uh, ward councillor for bringing this forward. I, I'm, I, I will be supporting this. I know we've had uh, numerous conversations about our downtown and how it's going to look like and how we move forward. And I think it is an important conversation for this council or an important opportunity to discuss how um, how downtown will look like in the future, and and to have these conversations uh, is is going to be important. And looking forward to having a, a, a more of a comprehensive idea of what all our plans are, and 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 do we need reviews, or how do we move forward looking at our downtown in particular? Because I do uh, support some sort of a, a strategic plan, uh, but. I, I think for now, uh, getting the information coming back is uh, where I think we've got to start and uh, we'll be supporting the direction. Thank you. Okay, Councillor McAllister, go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, through the chair. Um, I wanna thank the councillor for bringing this forward. Um, I know <clears throat> the um, new strategic plan for the quarry is very important and. I understand those challenges as a community that uh, feeds into the core, um, really do understand it. Um, and I just wanna say, um, I would say in the next iteration of this plan, please take that into account. I hear it all the time from my residents that we do feed into the core, Hamilton to Horton, so these are emerging communities. These are some established communities that have been there for a very long time that feed the core. And so we want to be there. We want to collaborate with you. So please don't forget about us. Uh, and we're happy uh, to support you where we can. Thank you. Okay, that's all the speakers I have.
it's uh, the referral. It's moved and seconded. I don't see any others, so I'm going to open it for voting. Closing the vote, the motion carries 11 to 11 with one recused. 11 to one, 11 to zero with one recused. Oh, 11 to one, sorry. We're just going to reread that vote total. Um, I don't know what happened there, but. Just colleagues, it was read recused, but since Councillor Lehman left the meeting, he didn't actually vote to recuse. So we're just fixing that total. So it's 11 to 1 with no recused. Just 11 to 1. Okay. Okay, given Councillor Lehman and Councillor Lehman is on his way to his, I think, his office, um, and Councillor Deputy Mayor Lewis is not here, I'm going to deal with the second one first, which is the uh, diversity, include, um, diversity Inclusion Anti Oppression Committee Advisory Committee report. Sorry? Have, have we dealt with all items on that report? Yeah, when it's referred, everything goes back. Even with the communication, it doesn't have to be received. Okay, thanks. Just want to make sure. Yes, we could have received the communication. So you're going to move receipt of the communication related to that last item, seconded by Councillor Pribble. As soon as that's ready, we're going to open it for voting. Just receiving the communication that was associated with that last vote. Councillor Pelosa votes yes. Closing the vote, a motion passes 12 to 0 with one recuse. Okay, Councillor Lehman, you're, I, I believe you're online now because you just voted. So um, I'm going to go to item 5.1, uh, which is the uh, piece of correspondence that you and Deputy Mayor Lewis wrote. Um, I will look to you to make comments on your correspondence and bring forward any motion that you'd like to bring forward related to it as you've outlined in your uh, communication. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, Basically, I'll be quick, folks. Uh, it came to my attention that uh, the term of our advisory committees were expiring in February. Um, in further consultation with uh, the clerk's office, um, learned that uh, they would ha have to be uh, putting out advertisements to populate our advisory committees uh, in December, which is the holiday period. Given um, the extensive uh, budget, uh, um, 
debates and community engagements, et cetera, that uh, we're facing in January, February. Um, I thought it would be prudent to extend um, the term of the committees and for one year um, to allow us uh, proper time to consider uh, populating those committees uh, at that time. The clerk asked that uh, we change um, the timing of that by uh, into April. And the reason for that is to allow advertisements uh, for those committees to commence in January, February, as opposed to the holiday season, which they felt would be uh, bring forth a better response uh, to those advertisements. So um, I hope you'll support this, uh, this motion uh, so that we can do, um, do a good job uh, populating uh, those advisory committees. Thank you. So you wanna move? The motion as uh, detailed in yes, the correspondence. Please. Okay, I'll look for a seconder for that motion. Count, seconded, Count, Councillor Hopkins seconds. Now we'll have discussion. Councillor Trosau, go ahead. <clears throat> Through the chair, we need to do this, and I'm supportive of it. But I just do not understand why E is in there. I think E is just a poison pill for the advisory committees, and I will not support this. I want E called separately, and I would like someone to explain what the redundancies are. It doesn't say to determine if there are redundancies. It says to review redundancies. And it, and it doesn't say to review opportunities to improve the workings of the committee. It, it says to replace them. So there, there's an agenda here to, uh, to eliminate or, or cut back advisory committees, and I'm not gonna support that. And I just do, I would like somebody who drafted this to explain where subdivision E came from. What is that about? So you can, through the chair, ask through the chair, Councillor like Lehman ask. about yeah. uh, the rationale behind E, uh, which I'm happy to do. So go ahead, Councillor Lehman. And of course, I can call components separate. That's no problem. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, there's no agenda here. Uh, this is, uh, I think, something that should be done on a regular basis um, to always look, just as we do with the Working Governance Group, to look at how we ourselves function uh, as a body uh, I think this is uh, a prudent exercise that we should take on from time to time. So uh, I'll push back a bit on the agenda comment. Um, this is, I think, just proper governance. Councillor Trosau, you still are there. Go ahead. Yes, um, I'm sorry. Through the, through the chair, um, I don't have a problem with E if it says to review the operation to review the operation of the advisory committees. And I would like to ask the maker of the motion, what are the redundancies you're referring to? Because you say to review redundancies. What are the redundancies through the chair? I'd like to know. Uh, Councillor Lehman, I'll go to you uh, again. Um, I'll also say to Councillor Trosau, um, if you don't like the language and you want to adjust it um, to review the operations, um, you can make that amendment. Uh, don't think I'd see that as fundamentally different uh, myself here. Uh, it's a, a, still a review of the operations of the committees, whether you say there's or believe there's redundancies or not, um, their review could be relatively open-ended. So I'll have Hanser Lehman answer your question, but just your option is to also amend um, if you'd like. I think the, um, uh, the request doesn't uh, um, uh, preconceive that there are redundancies. I think that we are looking uh, as to make any operation efficient. You always look at potential. So um, I'm not saying that there are redundancies, but I think that's just uh, the nature of uh, review of any organizational structure. If you want to add potential redundancies, then just amend it. And yeah, that. I'll, like, I'll, I'll uh, move to, to say review potential re re redundancies and also strike the uh, rest of the, uh, the idea that uh, this is leading to a replacement. This okay. is out of nowhere. That okay, we wait, have to... wait, let me just, okay. so you want to do that. You want to say review uh, potential. potential redundancies. And review and, and, and to review opportunities to improve the operation of committees. Okay. Of, of the, of, of so the, that's, I'm going to take that as an amendment. Yes. I'm going to see if there's a second there. Councilor Rahman's willing to second. So we're just amending the language in E um, to be 
um, review for possible uh, redundancies and essentially review the operations. Whatever the language is, it's just getting up here. I'm just going to read it specifically. I just want to make sure the mover and second are good with this. The, uh, it's, it's now going to read. The community advisory committee structure is referred to the governance working group to review potential redundancies and review opportunities to improve operations of advisory committees. I see nods, so we'll put that up. That's the amendment. I, we, I haven't put it up yet, Councillor. I was just reading it for you before I put it up. Now I'll put it up. Moved and seconded. Any debate on just the amendment? Just the amendment. Okay. Seeing none, we're going to open the amendment for voting. Councillor Pelosa votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 12 to 1. Okay, I need a mover um, for the as amended motion now. Councillor Hopkins, as amended, you're willing to move? Uh, yes, I'd like to speak to it. Yeah, you're on the speaker's list, but I need someone to move the as amended motion. So you're moving, seconded by Councillor Stevenson. Okay, uh, Councillor Hopkins, you're next on the list. This is now the motion as amended. The motion as amended, uh, Mr. Chair. So I would like to just remind us all that uh, the review was going to be taking place at the beginning of next year. So I am very supportive of extending it, given that we are going to be having um, an extensive uh, um, budget review. And uh, I think the timing um, is appropriate. I would like to make a friendly amendment, though, to the um, the extension, and I have um, passed on some information to the, the, the clerk, and I'm hoping that the mover is agreeable with the, um, it, it may be another clause, but we do have a number of vacancies already existing on our advisory groups. We will be extending this, these groups for another year. Uh, I think it is going to be important. We may even have further vacancies that we be able to advertise to fill these vacancies through the extension. Uh, that is my amendment to undertake to advertise during the end of, say, January, February of next year uh, to uh, deal with the vacancies that are already existing. Uh, and I'm hoping I can get um, the mover to support that. So the clerk says this is essentially covered by C, and yes, they can advertise in January. Um, so I don't think you need to make any changes if it's covered in C and they're, and they're already, the clerk, the clerk doesn't say that on the record, like happy to do that in January given the extended time frame for any vacancies. I just wanted to make sure that we do advertise. I think that's the key since we do have some vacancies. So whatever the clerk would like uh, to see happen, I, I, I just want to make sure. I'm going to have the clerk comment on the record so that you can hear it. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, certainly uh, we're, we're uh, certainly able to advertise in January uh, throughout uh, February and into March uh, if needed. Okay. Good. Any other speakers on the as amended motion? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to open the as amended motion for voting. Councillor Plaza votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to 0. Okay, next, the Diversity, Inclusion, and Anti-Oppression uh, Community Advisory Committee um, has their report. There's uh, essentially two components to this. One is uh, a, a small budget allocation of $2,500 for the uh, 2023 Diversity, Race, Relations, and Inclusivity Awards, and um, just receive the other clauses. Moved by Councillor Rahman, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting.
The votes yes. Councillor Trusso. Closing the vote, the motion carries 13 to zero. Okay, we've referred the rest of the items. I did say I wanted to say one thing before adjournment. Um, and I remembered, uh, actually someone texted me and reminded me. Um, although uh, I spoke to this when we rescinded uh, his bylaw, uh, today is Mr. Card's last uh, committee meeting that he'll be joining us for um, before his retirement from the Corporation of the City of London. Uh, I know he's tuned in uh, digitally. Um, I know he heard the nice things that were said about him at that committee, but given this is your last time that you'll be with us, I'm, I'm glad we gave you an extended experience tonight so that you can remember us forever uh, fondly. And, uh, but I do wanna say um, we appreciate your service um, over all of the years that you have served the Corporation of the City of London and the residents of London uh, in your various uh, roles here at the city. Uh, and most recently, obviously, as uh, uh, the deputy city manager and um, uh, solicitor. Um, we appreciate uh, everything you've done, Barry, um, and uh, you'll be greatly missed uh, by all of us. I have appreciated not only your um, expert advice uh, as a solicitor, but also the many conversations we've had just to get to know each other over the years. And I know many others uh, feel the same, and I would just ask that you, of course, keep in touch because I would uh, love to know what you're up to next and we wish you all the best in whatever that is for you. So um, I'll, I'll join me in maybe just congratulating uh, Mr. Card now, finally, that he's leaving us on his retirement, so. <laughs> Mr. Card, do you want to say anything before, I, before you go? Of course, it would, be, it would be still subject to solicitor-client privilege, so you can. But go ahead if you'd like uh, to say something. At this hour, Your Worship, I'm very grateful for those comments. It's been a privilege to serve, and I'm uh, grateful for that opportunity. So thank you all. Thank you to Council for your uh, confidence and uh, for giving me the chance to provide you with advice uh, over the last almost seven years. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Card. I'd let you move a motion to adjourn, but you're not allowed to under the procedure bylaw. So I'll look for someone else to move a motion to adjourn. That's Councillor Stevenson, seconded by Councillor McAllister. We'll do this by hand. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you.